Hello, everybody, and welcome to the first Threat Hunt training of the new year. Um, thank you, everybody, for joining us. If you haven't already joined us in our Discord server, please do so now. We're in the Threat Hunter Community Discord server, and if you scroll down towards the bottom, you'll see the ACM section. We are in the live webcast chat that has the little red dot, uh, dot next to it. And then directly below that is the ACM webcast content where you can find the slide deck for today, along with an FAQ um, page as well. Hey, good morning, or uh, well, no, it's happy time zone, right? So oh, happy time zone. yes. Yes, happy time zone, because uh, for all of us, it's like 10.30 in the afternoon, but for some of you guys, um, it could be the middle of the night or early morning. So if you're already with us in Discord, um, I know we've gotten some chatter already, but if you want to let us know where you're joining from, we always love to see that stuff. So Shelby, I think you're revealing just how early you get up in the morning when you're saying it's 10 a.m. in the afternoon. <laughs> oh, did I say that? <laughs> <laughs> like, yes, I've already, you know, it's 10 a.m. and I've already been through half a day. Yeah, yeah. Uh, John Strand is running a training this week that starts at, um, 6 a.m. Eastern time. So. Oh, that's just wrong. And and for him, it's 4 a.m. Mountain. So, wow. Yeah. Ouch. That means mm -hmm. you have to get up at 3 a.m. Oh, are you kidding me? Yeah, or exactly. Or he just doesn't go to sleep. <laughs> that works too, unfortunately. Yeah, like the gift say... that Casey put in Discord that the clock that's just now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. Love it. I know I'm on time for my meeting. It says it's now. We've got Sweden and the UK in the house. Yep. Woo! So. six is in Sweden. I'm not sure how I feel about that. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, is Netware, no, I don't think Netware is really a thing anymore. So, can you even buy it? Wow, I have no idea. I think my first version of Netware was like 2.5 or something like that, and it was, you know, it can be your server, it can be your desktop. You can use it as both. Wow. Yep. Yeah, they didn't get serious until like 3-1. Yep. We've got New York o'clock. Um, Vir <laughs> Virginia. Uh, cool hand. I hope you're doing well in Virginia. I know they had some pretty nasty weather recently. Yeah, really. So hopefully that didn't affect you too much. And I would like to say that uh, anyone that's participating in doing the labs, now's the time to get the VM set up. Yes. Make sure you can log in and everything's working. And now's the time to get good support on that instead of when the class is happening. If you wait until five minutes before the class starts, I can guarantee you one thing. Hey, this download's running really slow. Because you and everybody else will be trying to download that very large file at the last minute. Yeah, yeah if you are uh, new to ACM or our Threat Hunt trainings, then uh, you might not know that this is not the actual training quite yet. This is what we like to call pre-show banter. Um, we like to use this as just a good time for us to get to know you guys better, you to get to know us better. And it's a great time, like Keith and Bill were saying, if you have any questions about the class or the VM, now would be the good time to ask. Um, if you haven't downloaded it yet and you're like, hey, where do I even go to get that? Um, there's a web page on our website that I'm going to share the link to in both Discord, in the ACM webcast content channel, along with the GoToWebinar chat for everybody. And you can find all the download details there, um, along with a copy of the slide deck. And yes, this training is being recorded. And that web page will hold the recording of this class once it is done. Um, it usually takes us about a week to get the recording posted. Someone said, did anybody else get the virtual box error? Yeah, I just uh, tried to, it, it builds prompting. <laughs> I went in and tried to do a uh, pseudo update. And it looks like with 6.1, they have a lot more dependencies than they used to. Um, that's something new, haven't seen that before. Um, I honestly did not try it just because um, if it blows something up, hey, I'm supposed to be teaching, not fixing my VM. <laughs> so, yeah. Uh, yeah, I would let that slide for now. 
and then we'll go in and we'll take a look at that. I've got a rule for myself that if I'm teaching, I don't update anything for about two or three days beforehand. Because <laughs> or install just... viruses at the beginning of class, right, Bill? Now, come on. That was only once, and that was only in front of a classroom full of people who were watching me on the screen as I infected my... Oh, wait, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> it was absolutely true. I, I have no, I have nothing to, uh, I have nobody to blame it on except myself that I hit enter on top of the installer script as I was trying to show people what the files were in this particular package. As I say, as I say, I've, you've never seen anybody pull the power, the power connector and two batteries out of the back of a laptop faster <laughs> in your life. <laughs> <laughs> Can I make it before this gets committed to disk? I don't think so. I'm not that fast. <laughs> oh, yeah. Man. Yeah, but you did a good pivot in that class and changed it too. So this is how we're going to clean up my laptop now. <laughs> That's right. Because <laughs> you certainly don't want a stressful situation to show people in front of a class. No, 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 never. Yes, yes. Yeah. Although I, I think it's worth noting to folks, this is uh, before VMs. So it's not like yeah. Bill had the option to do this in a VM instead and not blow up his host system. Yeah. So. Yep. And, and uh, for anybody who's listening to that and wondering how it came out, it turns out that the uh, installer assumed that it was being run as root. And so all of these things that I saw flying by up on the screen, okay, I just fixed this, I just patched this, I just put myself into 14 different places to make sure I restart on the next restart. None of them worked because I was running it as myself. And that was the only thing that kept me from having a totally hosed laptop right there. Yeah. So we'll start off the day with Bill embarrassing himself, but we're used to that. We're used to that. Yeah. Bill gets the tiny hand for the day. <laughs> oh, oh, awesome! A tiny hand for Bill. <laughs> oh man, and I don't have my fingers fork. Oh, you don't? <laughs> Why not? I don't know where to go. <laughs> okay, I gotta get it. Yeah. I've lost all respect, Keith. All respect. So, so Keith long ago got everyone. I think this was like everybody's Christmas present. They all got a tiny hand. <laughs> We've been all excited about the tiny hand he got for everybody. And I finally found a present to match it, which is what he's going off to get now. So, <laughs> uh, Let's see, you got a question. Did you get another clock? Well, they're not really clocks. Uh, it's kinetic art. And yes, because, you know, one is never enough. So, so I have to show what uh, Chris got me for my birthday is a finger spork. Yes. <laughs> kind of go with the theme of the tiny hand. Yes. So. Yes. Well, you know, then you can eat with it. And yeah. Yeah. You know, it could be a fork. It could be a spoon. It's a spork. I mean, you know, you can't get more useful than that. So. Just perfect for the time you want to tell your coworkers to go spork themselves. Yes. Yeah. Right. <laughs> See, now no, and when I saw this, I was like, wow, this is so awesome. And I was like, you know, I need to get one for all my fingers until I realized, well, wait a minute, my mouth isn't that big. <laughs> and I apologize. I didn't think of that, Keith. I should have gotten you a full set of five. <laughs> It'd be like uh, Edward Spork hands. <laughs> oh. <laughs> oh, terrible. Who was, who's the uh, oh. actor for that? Casey, that I'm sorry you have to live with him. <laughs> I yeah, know, I, I know, but hey, it makes it entertaining. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's that's why I say locked up in this separate room. So. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I there's need four a of those four finger sporks to shovel a ton of food at once. Yes, agreed. Yeah. yeah. The only problem I, is they don't fit on the tiny fingers. Uh, oh, and now we need a tiny finger spork. Yes, he has tiny, tiny finger sporks. <laughs> oh, poor Shelby. She's... She, yeah, I, Shelby, your expression is like, I got up early for this. Yeah, <laughs> she's just, just like shaking her head in disgust. It's like... Yes. <laughs> you can see it in her face. Oh, Appreciate banter didn't go this way earlier today. <laughs> No, I just, I uh, I get enough of you guys already when we hang out, so. 
Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah. Cool. yeah. <laughs> like, why do you make me an organizer of these things? I have to keep showing up. Yeah, really. <laughs> For um for those well I also feel bad for anyone who's just joining us and is like why are they talking about sporks when it's network threat hunting which um <laughs> one more time I'm going to mention if you are new to ACM and don't know how this works uh this is called pre-show banter so we like to show up a little early get to, get to know you guys a little better um it's a good way for you to get to know us a little better too and if you have any questions about the VM or the training you can feel free to post in the live webcast chat. I'm on our Discord server, which if you haven't joined us there already, I am sharing the link in GoToWebinar now. We are in the Threat Hunter community and we are in the live webcast chat. But yeah, for, um, for anyone who also doesn't know this, uh, the ACM company is a little bit of a family too. So uh, Casey, Keith, me and Chris are all family and live together. Um, in the same town in Florida. And then Bill has been like my Uncle Bill for longer than I can remember. So <laughs> always been a very Sorry. close family friend. Yeah. Oh, thank you. I'm the one that they keep under the stairs until the letter from Hogwarts <laughs> arrives. Yeah. 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 We just throw in a can of spam every week, you know. Yeah. <laughs> got 482 cans of spam that I'm sitting on and they would they wouldn't throw in a can opener damn it <laughs> uh, that's why you have teeth <laughs> uh, mesmerized by the kinetic art yes that's the whole idea because otherwise you get to look at me And I, I think next one of these, I'm going to, so you might be able to see it. There's a game table down there. Oh, I'm in front. Yeah, there's a game table underneath it. So uh, I think next time, instead of putting the camera on me, I'm just going to put the game, the camera on the game table and play something while we talk. Ah, there we go. Oh, that's cool. Yeah, I've been getting hooked on Mr. Do lately. Mr. Do. Mr. Do was kind of like Dig Dug. Remember Dig Dug? You like oh, yeah. ran around yeah. with the air pump and like blew things up. <laughs> yeah. You know, back when gameplay was very realistic, uh, Mr. Do is kind of like that, but you have a ball you throw and blow people up. So, but you still yeah. dig little tunnels and stuff like that. Oh, very cool. I was just kind of giggling at myself when you said, can you see the game table down low? And I actually went like this to <laughs> get a different angle. And I caught myself I was like, wait a minute, that doesn't work. You can't. <laughs> oh, hey, it looks like we got some folks from Tampa. So uh, most of us are in Cape Coral, which is just south of you guys. We're just south enough that when you guys get cold, we're still not. Yeah. Well, that's not nice. <laughs> yeah. That's the truth. I, I love yeah. bringing up that it's zero degrees Fahrenheit up here, and Keith's like, oh, yeah, it's 62. We've got to start burning furniture to stay warm. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> yeah. yeah, right. Start with your chair. <laughs> yeah, I know, huh? Yeah, well, it's old enough. It deserves to be burned. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Maybe just should be 90 years revolution. Revolution. Get a new chair. Oh, sorry about that. Yeah, it's colder there. <laughs> Denver's the only place that I've seen uh, 80 degrees, uh, sleet, and a tornado all in the same week. Wow. <laughs> wow. Okay. Yeah. That is crazy. Dr. AYB, hello from Ontario. Beautiful yeah. city, but oh my God. Gosh, does the wind pull through there when it's cold? Oh my. Great and rally driving through there though. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Some of the nighttime kind of off the books rallies, those are fun. One of the best <laughs> parts about driving in Ontario uh, in the middle of January is that if you overshoot a turn, you just use the snow banks to keep you on cell phone. <laughs> Bill, you've been in the car when I've done that. <laughs> I, I'm sure I have. Yes, I, I think uh, we you managed to do a full 360 one day, but uh, we don't talk about that, do we? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You just use the, you just bump the back of the car off the snowbank, and that keeps you on the road. Everything's good. <laughs> 
whenever we get in the car with Chris, we just close our eyes and hang on. Yeah. <laughs> Does the zip file also have VBox or do I need to download that also? I'm not sure where the zip file is. So I, I think I think what the question was, does do I own, also need to pull down VirtualBox itself? That is a separate install. Oh, so yes. you need to install either VirtualBox or VMware. And then the VirtualBox is associated with Oracle and oh my God, that's just not us. <laughs> oh, and thank you, Polar Bill. I was just about to post the page, so thank you. So in yeah. fact, Bill may remember uh, him and I worked for a company together that was purchased by Oracle. And I can remember when it was first purchased, the thought was like, you know, hmm, Oracle, I wonder what they're like. Are they innovative? You know, you know, what's going to be like? And the first person they sent out uh, was their like IT person for the entire East Coast, and they had a flip phone. And, you know, when I'm talking to him and saw the flip phone, I was like, oh, that's kind of retro. That's kind of cool. And his thing was, no, this does everything I need. I have no reason for a smartphone. <laughs> so at that point, I think Bill and I were like, yeah, no, this isn't going to work. <laughs> we need to be a little more innovative than this. This isn't going to work. Yeah. Yeah, I thought thing, it was uh, either a TV show or a movie or something where a guy had one of the old flip phones and somebody was saying, well, you need to get a smartphone. He said, this is a smartphone. I don't need to be smart to use it. Uh -oh. <laughs> That's terrible. If you, had, if you take a look in. Anymore. Yes, you can do that. Oh, very and cool. That was part of the reasons why uh, Bill created that login script. So yep. that rather than pulling down the full VM, uh, you could launch a cloud instance and then run that within that instance. So, yeah. And Carlos, you're exactly right. That's why we encourage you to, to uh, get this going as soon as possible so that you've got enough time. We don't actually start the labs right away. So the nice part is if the install is still going, you've got some time to do this in the background while you're listening to Chris talk. Uh, yeah. Labs labs will be uh, with at least an hour off. So. Yep, you're you're doing just fine. Yep, yep. Just remember to carefully hit people. Be careful to hit people. Okay. Be careful <laughs> to hit people. <laughs> so yeah, you can hit people. Hit just people. do it carefully. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> it's like sometimes you, you forget to hit people. So. If you take a look in the other channel, pound ACM dash webcast dash content, we got a couple of things for you. Shelby, uh, Chris was nice enough to upload the slides for today. So if you have any links in there that you want to click, it's easier to pull it off your own PDF. You can look at the same content that Chris will be presenting all day. The There are two other documents just up above that. There's a fact document. There, there are a number of questions that come up pretty regularly. We try to go and put as many of those into the fact as we can. And the last one is that if you would like to do this, but you're not able to download a large VM or you don't want to run the installer on one of your own systems, DigitalOcean has uh, virtual machines that you can set up cloud systems that you can set up very quickly and you can do the entire lab on those. Um, I, I have to admit there was a, when I set this up, there was a, an offer, hey, we'll give you $100 credit, you can use it for up to six months, and that was enough to pay for everything that you need in this lab. So you may get it for free, but for reasons that I don't understand, you don't always get that offer with DigitalOcean. Maybe they have a certain limit on how many people can do that on a given day, and we just have enough people in this class that we cross that limit. But they may also be doing some A-B testing. How many people who get it for free? become a cohort that joins up, how many don't. Absolutely, right. Because so as you know, we are constantly being analyzed these days, so. <laughs> um, either way, the cloud systems are very inexpensive. Uh, you could easily do this class for 20 bucks or less. And for some people that's, you know, that's worth it for not having the frustration of trying to free up enough disk space to run the VM. So whatever works for you, you pick your approach and, and we're happy with it. All right, and we are about five minutes away from the start of the actual training. So now would be a good time to get that second or third cup of coffee or 
um, take a bio break or whatever it is you need to do to get ready for class. And we had a question in GoToWebinar about the recordings. Um, yes, this entire training is being recorded and the web page we've shared a few times, um, the Threat Hunt training course page, which you can also find on our website by going under the Educationals tab. Um, that will hold the recording from this training. Right now it currently holds the recording from the last session we did before the new year, um, but in about a week that will be replaced with this one. And we have Cybertex from Texas. Howdy. Howdy, y'all over yonder. <laughs> okay, that was that was lame trying to be Texas like. Yeah. <laughs> have you ever lived in Texas, Keith? Uh, yeah, yeah, for quite a few years. So. Mm -hmm. Yep. So yeah, Dallas uh, Fort Worth area. Mm -hmm. So a cowboy hat would not look out of out of place on you. Is that what you're trying to tell me? Yeah, it, uh, it actually looks very out of place. Yeah, it does. Uh, Why? Yeah, it looks like a huge pinata on a scarecrow. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's great. Uh, Proxmax was asking, do we need to update anything in the VM? This is not a system that's going to be presented to the real world. You should not have an internet connection to it. And so we suggest that for a lab like this, and especially one where you'd like to have it just get going and, and be able to do your labs with as little effort as possible, you shouldn't have to update this for the day. You do not need to update this to make any of the labs work. They work just as they are. That said, if at the end of the day you feel like, hey, this is kind of cool, I'd like to keep using it, you're absolutely welcome to. If you feel like you're going to connect it up to the real world in any way, it probably is a good idea to do the updates, but uh, maybe you might pass on uh, on doing the updates right now because there's just no, there's no uh, requirement for it. <laughs> Keith, did you see in chat, visioning a 10 gallon hat on that tiny head? Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. In fact, I had to just reply with an emoji on that one. So, yeah, yeah it's like the slightest gust of wind, I'm gone. <laughs> yeah, but that's what made you so uh, aerodynamic for rotten log racing. Oh, uh, yeah, right. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. So if I wear a cowboy hat, I also need to put a rudder on my backside. That way I can steer my way back home. So. <laughs> then poor Shelby. Casey has to be seen in public with you like that. Yes. Yeah. yeah no. No, I don't. <laughs> I, I can see quotes from the from the webcast, and one of them is "rudder on my backside." Yes. <laughs> oh, good. What does that have to do with <laughs> threat hunting? <laughs> yeah. It's a good yeah. Thing we can Ryan go ahead and tweet that out. Soundboard. Wonder. Yeah. Shelby, do you have anything else to cover before we get going? Yes, we are um, a little under one minute away from the start time of the actual training. So just to cover a couple of housekeeping notes real quick before I have Chris get started. Um, as I mentioned, yes, this mean, training is... This? When did that happen? <laughs> I, I, I'm not sure who else would be able to uh, do quite as good of a job as you as this training. Oh, yeah. So, so diplomatic. But, uh, Casey and Keith's dog. <laughs> oh, no, Probably a little no. cuter to watch with the training. But. That's true. <laughs> so this webcast is being recorded. Um, if you can't stick around for the full six hours of the training, that is okay. Um, you will receive an email tomorrow containing both a certificate of attendance along with a uh, raw copy of the recording. Along with that, the recording will be posted on that web page with all the lab download information within the next week. Um, again, a uh, this class does come with that certificate you'll receive via email tomorrow afternoon, but it will show up at the end of the day tomorrow around 5 p.m. Eastern time. So just be prepared to wait for that amount of time before you receive the email and the certificate. Um, yes, with that, we always get people like five minutes after class, where's my certificate? It's, it's coming. It, it will be there. And if you haven't already joined us on Discord, I would definitely recommend doing so. We are in the Threat Hunter community. Um, it's a whole 
community for threat hunt enthusiasts. There's a lot of different channels in there that I would recommend checking out. Uh, but right now we are in the live webcast chat. It's in the active countermeasures section near the bottom of the server. And right below that is the ACM webcast content channel where you can find all the different things that you will need for class today. And with that, Chris, I will toss it over to you. Awesome. Thanks, Chris. All right. I am going to go off camera because otherwise I know everyone will just stare at the kinetic art. No one will hear me and uh, we'll just kind of go at it from there. So yeah, let's get to it. So a uh, quick thank you out to our sponsors. Um, for those who don't know, there are a number of kind of related sister companies, Black Hills, Anti-Siphon, Wild West, Active Countermeasures. Uh, we, for the most part, are Active Countermeasures, but you know we're all kind of part of a team here. So if you like this class, um, I have two other classes I offer. Uh, if you kind of take this class and feel a little lost in some parts, uh, there's a getting started with packet decoding. That's a great class to kind of get used to tearing apart packets and figuring out what's inside. Um, it's also a pay what you want class, which is kind of nice. If you go through this class and you say, hey, this was cool, tell me more, I want more practice, we've got an advanced threat hunting class for that too. So I've got links in the slides. <clears throat> uh, if you want to go sign up for that, uh, those will be happening over the next couple of months. So you should already, as we've talked about in chat already, uh, you should already have a copy of the VM. Uh, if not, go ahead and download it. If you're having, if the VM is too big or you don't have a platform to run it on, there's also an install script or you can deploy directly to DigitalOcean. Basically go to the threat, threat, threat hunting page. There's a lot of different options. Uh, if you use RVM, meaning you don't run the script on your own system, uh, login is T-Hunt. Password is all your base uh, belong to us. Uh, so that'll be your login to get in and kind of do your thing. Logistics wise, top of each hour, we'll do a 10 minute break. Uh, three hours into the class, we'll do a 20 minute break. That'll give you a little extra time to, uh, you know, do a bio break, feed the kids, feed the pets, whatever it is you need to do, check email, that type of thing. Um, but it'll give us a little bit of a pause at the top of each hour. Now, I, I kind of want to start with a disclaimer, which is a lot of what we talk about in this class is really new. And it's really scary for some folks that have been doing this for a while, uh, both vendor and individual, I've noticed, that there's kind of a pretext to kind of say, what I'm doing must be working. You know, what I'm doing must be the right thing to do. Therefore, I am going to push back on anything new because that's different and it's not what I'm already doing. Um, try to keep an open mind with this. You know, th th this is, you know, I, I mentioned prime cognitive bias fodder. What do I mean by that? I mean, it's really easy to get kind of caught up in what I'm doing must be okay. Uh, Sands did a <laughs> threat hunting <clears throat> uh, thing a couple of months ago. And their keynote speaker was kind of talking about, oh, threat hunting, we've been doing that for years. I've been doing threat hunting for 10, 12 years. You just check alerts and you're good. And no, 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 no. I know folks want to believe that's threat hunting because now they already have the skill set in place and they can claim they've been doing it for 10 plus years. But this is new technology. This is new processes that quite honestly, we haven't had the technology to be able to do before. So like I said, just kind of keep an open mind as we go through this. <clears throat> a lot of where this comes from is the threat model has changed. You know, go back 20 years ago and it was about mass propagation, right? It was typically individuals were writing the malware and trying to get it on as many systems as they could. And we developed technologies to address that model. That model has changed. We've moved on to, these are targeted attacks. They're gonna go after you because they specifically wanna go after you, not just some random IP address. <clears throat> and the malware they use, the infrastructure they use to go after you is going to be unique for their attack against you. And a lot of what motivates it now is money. And anytime you start throwing money in things, you know the number of possibilities goes up infinitesimally. Uh, sunburst. There are some estimates that there were probably hundreds of developers working on that code, 
hundreds of developers working on that network. So again, once you start getting money involved, the model change. So today what we're dealing with is unique targeted attacks. Well, hearing that you had an IP address try and do some bad things against you three months ago doesn't do me any good, because again, the infrastructure has changed. Trying to pattern match on some known malware setup doesn't do any good, because again, they're gonna change that. So we need to change with the times. We can't just keep trying to use the stuff that worked 20 years ago. And part of that is also centralized logging. We try to use centralized logging as a way to catch the bad guys. So how does that work? Well, we go to all the systems that we can think of. We tell it to send their logs to a central location. You know, it could be an elk stack. It could be Splunk. I mean, you know, pick your poison. Well, we have a centralized system that collects all these logs. And then we write signatures, which are patterns that we try to match against within the log entries to tell us when we think something bad has happened. You know, and historically, this is how we've gone about trying to catch the bad guys. The reason we need to use signatures is that <laughs> the, the underlying protocol we use, syslog, doesn't have a security uh, uh, mechanism to it. <clears throat> In other words, there is a facility called security, but that tends to be like a local audit event type of thing. What we really need is a severity level, right? So we have like informational, we have emergency. There needs to be one for security related logs. And we don't have that. <laughs> and it hasn't even been proposed. So because of that, when a log comes in, it may be listed as informational or it, be missed, it might be listed as debug or something like that. And we need to pattern match on the content that's in that log to try and figure out contextually, is this security related or not? So it's basically blind pattern matching. This is how we go in and try and find this stuff. And everything logs differently. You know, different applications generate different types of logs and they even change when you go from platform to platform. So we have this plethora of different types of information coming in and we're trying to do some standard pattern matching and it just doesn't work. Um, the other challenge here is this is a failed close or failed open system. What do I mean by that? I mean, if I take a device, plug it into the network, and it's not centralizing its logs, it's still going to be able to talk on the internet. And I have no direct visibility to figure that out. In other words, as it goes out to the internet, there's no validation check that takes place to say, whoa, before I let this thing talk on the internet and maybe hurt itself, Am I collecting logs? We got no way to go in and kind of check for that. So we get the warm fuzzies that we're collecting logs from everything, and we're typically not. Uh, we had a, a customer we dealt with many years ago that, uh, so we make a threat hunting product. Gee, that's probably a surprise given that we're doing a talk on threat hunting here. But um, they deployed the product and they found three internal IP addresses that were beaconing out to Kwanzu, China. And I'll describe what beaconing is in a little bit. But they looked at that and said, hmm, we don't have a field office, a business partner, or any reason <clears throat> why our system should be in constant communication with a host out in Kwanzu, China. Maybe there's a problem here. And what bit them was they thought they were doing centralized logging. They thought they were collecting logs from everything. The problem was the devices that were beaconing were IP-based cameras that didn't log. There was no way to centralize the logs from that. So they just plugged them on the network and hoped for the best. Well, the best didn't happen. So these things were, we think, taking pictures of the inside of the facility and sending it back to the manufacturer. Oh, isn't that awesome? <clears throat> so again, you, you can think you, you're centralized logging and maybe you're not. <clears throat> and like I said, these signatures are just pattern matching. You know, when we talk about, oh, we're gonna review our logs. Well, we don't sit down and look at every log, do we? we go in and we have signatures that try to identify bad patterns, like, you know, failed login. There's a common one that folks might go looking for, right? If I see failed login a bunch of times, that might be worth going in and paying attention to. Well, what if they don't fail the login? What if they try, you know, <clears throat> winter 2020, and that just happens to be the password on the first try. Well, now you're not, your pattern match system is gonna miss that. It's not gonna see anything. What if it, the, what if the buffer overflow error that gets generated is something you've never, <clears throat> excuse me, is something you've never seen before? 
Well, if you've never seen it before, you're not going to have a signature for it. So again, this we're going to write signatures to match what we've seen attackers do in the past, knowing that attackers are constantly innovating and they're probably not going to use that again, isn't really helpful. You know, again, to kind of refer back to Sunburst, in December of 2020, when FireEye came out and said, hey, there's this thing, Sunburst, that you need to worry about, every vendor jumped in and said, oh, hey, we just wrote a signature for that, we can detect it. I haven't seen anything from anyone saying that signature has been helpful to them. In other words, once Sunburst was out of the bag, whoever was behind it, we think the Russians, stopped using it. So to write a signature against that doesn't matter. But do you think the Russians stopped what they were doing? No. They had a plan B and moved on to that most likely, and your signature isn't going to match on that. So this lack of innovation you know, really can come back to kind of bite you. You know, okay to still wear parachute pants. What do I, where, where am I going with that? That was the fashion trend when centralized logging and pattern matching against known attack patterns was created as a technology to use for, from a security perspective. Besides authentication, this is probably one of the oldest things we've tried to do. And it doesn't work. Just because everybody does it, just because there are attestations like PCI that require it, doesn't mean it actually works. And the, and, and the data makes it very clear that it doesn't work. One of the things you need to separate is advanced persistent threat versus ransomware. What's the difference? With ransomware, I'm gonna go onto your system and I'm gonna encrypt your drive and I'm gonna tell you, pay me Bitcoin and you don't get your drive back. With advanced persistent threat, I'm gonna go in and I'm gonna infect that system and I'm going to extra extract intellectual property or something that has value to me off of your environment and do it in a very stealthy pattern. One of the um, challenges we've run into recently is that the statistics for both of those have been getting conflated together by a lot of folks that go in and kind of pull this type of stuff. And that's a problem. It's a problem because when you look at advanced persistent threat, it's over three months. It's over three months from when the attacker gets a beachhead on your network till it gets detected. And over 50% of the time, it's not going to be you who by that. Okay, let's go back to Sunburst again, right? So solar winds got compromised in like February or March of 2020. We found out about, solar, uh, about Sunburst in December of 2020, more than six months later, and it was FireEye, not Solar Winds, that found that attack, an outside third party. So that's what I'm talking about. That that what happened with Sunburst is a mirror of what we're seeing as a trend. Now, what we're seeing some folks do is conflate together the ransomware data with the advanced persistent threat, and they're coming out with things like saying, "Oh, hey, we're getting better at detecting the bad guys." It used to be three months, but hey, we got it down to like a month now. We're doing really good. Well, here's the problem. With ransomware, I go encrypt your drive, and then what do I do? I tell you I did that, right? <laughs> I'll pop something up on your screen and say, hey, I infected your drive. Send me Bitcoin. Well, they're counting that as a detect. So they're saying, oh, well, you know, the ransomware ran through your whole network within five days, and then announced itself, so yay, you detected that in five days. No, no, that doesn't count. That's like someone stole my television set and then came back to my house the next day and said, hey, just so you know, I'm the one who stole your TV. Can the police claim to have solved that crime within 24 hours? No, they didn't do anything, right? <laughs> the attacker came up to my door and gave themselves away. Well, ransomware is kind of that same thing. So you need to look at the stats differently. We need to handle ransomware differently than we do advanced persistent threat. And like I said, when you, when you separate that out and look at it that way, when they're in trying to steal intellectual property, we're still looking at over six months or more, which is bad. So this is where threat hunting comes from. In other words, this thing we've been doing, centralized logging, that is, now I'm not saying it's useless. It does have some uses from a forensic standpoint at the end of our threat hunt process. I'll talk about that as we go through this. But from a 
what's the best way to figure out our protections have failed and we need to go into the incident response mode, centralized logging isn't working. And we've got tons and tons of data telling us it's not working. And yet we're still getting requirements to look for bad guys that way. And a lot of folks are still falling back on that because, hey, that's the way we've always done it. So it must be the right thing to do. Threat hunting is a new approach on that. Well, what about Intel feeds, right? We've got those, why not use that? Well, same problem, right? What's an Intel feed? An Intel feed is, hey, this IP address attacked these people or this fully qualified domain name attacked this other organization, you should watch out for them. Well, again, attackers are constantly innovating. They're changing their malware, they're changing their infrastructure. So to know that happened three months ago, who cares? <laughs> it isn't applicable to me. I might on the off chance, you know, randomly catch something using a threat intel feed, maybe, but probably not. A majority of the time, like 99% of the time, my matches are going to be false positives, meaning that that IP address in Amazon might have been a C2 server at some point in its life, but that VM has long since gone away. Someone else has grabbed that IP address. They have a legitimate website set up now. And now it's just your user trying to talk to a legitimate website that you're matching against your thread Intel feed. Which means you end up with a ton of false positives. A lot of the problem you run into is a lot of these lists are crowdsourced. Sounds good, right? Crowdsourced. Hey, let's all work on this together. Let's be collaborative. It sounds good. Here's the problem. That list is only as good as the dumbest person <laughs> submitting information. So, you know, if I look at the, if you look at what's on the slide, you know, Bing bot out of control, still set, attempting to hit my site, uh, just block it, uh, runs all JavaScript on page, shows up in Google Analytics and ad reporting as an individual unique, blah, 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 blah. This is a bot. Its job is to go out and parse websites for content that you can then search for using Bing. Google does the same thing. Every search engine does the same thing. Hey, let's go out and see what's on the internet for content, index that, make that searchable. That's what this thing does. And yet, folks are looking at it and not necessarily understanding what that means. So thus, it ends up on a, on a ban, ban list. And age really matters. One of the challenges you'll run into is to find out when was this IP actually detected as malicious is usually not information you can get out of that thread Intel feed. You may be able to see when was the data extracted out of the database, but that doesn't tell you when did that data go into the database. Because if it went into the database eight hours ago, that IP, that IP address has value. Knowing that that IP address was acting maliciously eight hours ago has value. But what if it was acting maliciously eight days ago? A little less value, right? What about eight weeks ago? Then eh, no, <laughs> no real value there anymore, right? Things are changing too quickly. Uh, so not having access to that info, that really doesn't help. Well, but I've got a network-based intrusion detection system, Chris. So I'm using that to go in and detect this type of stuff. Well, again, here's the problem. It's pattern matching. So we're trying to pattern match on what we've seen attackers do in the past and attackers are gonna constantly going to be innovating. So that may not be that helpful. So this is uh, Sericata with the bleeding edge, um, you know, exploit detection. You know, this is supposed to find like the latest and greatest. And I went through and ran this against a particular data set and it came up with some detects. Here it's telling me that it detected somebody plugged in a USB drive. And here it detected that system going back to Microsoft to try and find the drivers for that. All right, if I'm in an environment where people shouldn't be plugging in USB drives, that might have value to me. This is saying, hey, somebody queried a domain that's part of .cc. And sometimes attackers try and hide things there. Like they might try and register Microsoft.cc hoping that when you look at it, you think it's Microsoft.com and then you're fooled into going to some place you shouldn't. Now, they're not saying for certain that's what happened here. They're just saying, eh, it had a .cc extension. That might be bad. We don't know. Here's an alert. You go figure it out. <laughs> we're your security tool. We're not, gonna, we're not supposed to actually tell you if you have a problem. Ours is just to make you chase your tail and occasionally find things that actually matter. Now, buried in this data set was an Empire Command and Control Channel. 
a compromised system calling out to a command and control server saying, hey, I'm here, I'm compromised, do you have anything for me to do? That went undetected. There was also another system that was infected with DNS CAT2. That uses DNS as a mechanism to do a command and control channel to say, hey, I'm here, I'm infected, do you have anything for me to do? Notice neither one of those are detected. So again, NIDS, nice for certain contexts, but from finding a system that's been compromised, this isn't the way it's gonna happen either. So what do we need to do? What should threat hunting be? Threat hunting needs to be a proactive validation of all systems. What do I mean by that? By that I mean it isn't triggered by I got an alert. It isn't triggered by my SIM saw something interesting. Proactive means I'm going to do this every day. I'm going to do this every week. I am going to do this on the first of every month. I'm going to do this at some periodic time frame that you know fits with my environment. Now, in an ideal situation, we're doing this every day. But if there's one of me <laughs> and a thousand users and I'm responsible for all security, doing this every day may not be practical. So I might need to look at doing it every week or every other week or something along those lines. Again, that's gonna be environment specific. But the point is, I'm not doing it because something else happened. And this is the part people miss about threat hunting. I'm going to assume that maybe my systems are good, maybe they're bad, and I'm gonna go in and validate the state of them. That's kind of huge. Because quite honestly, before threat hunting, we never really had that capability. If, you're, if your uh, CEO came to you and said, is our environment secure? Typically your answer would be, well, I haven't seen any alerts telling me otherwise, so I guess so, right? That was kind of the closest we could get. I haven't seen anything telling me otherwise, so I guess we're still okay. Well, that's, that's not a specific answer, right? That's kind of hoping for the best. Threat hunting is an actual validation of those systems. Hey, I went in and monitored the activity involved with every single IP address connected to our network, and I didn't detect anything that looked like it was potentially a command and control channel. If that system was compromised, it's gonna be running a command and control channel so the attacker can, can manage it. Therefore, I'm pretty certain our network is in a secure state. Notice the difference between those two statements. With one, I'm hoping for the best. For the other one, I've got data to show that says, yeah, we're actually still okay. Or, hey, you know what? This one system, it's talking to Kwanzu China. All day long, 24 hours a day. We don't have a business partner there. We don't have a field office there. That is highly suspicious. That's something we need to dig in on further. It didn't generate any alerts. You know, I haven't seen anything in my SIM. But the fact that it feels like it needs to talk to Kwanzu China all day long, that's something that makes it worth going in and investigating further. So our deliverable ends up being a compromise assessment. And again, this is something we've never had before. We've never had a compromise assessment prior to threat hunting. The best we had was, I haven't seen any alerts, so I guess we're okay. Uh, let's see, she, she teached techie, I love that name. Uh, I'm glad he mentioned proactively and wish my previous supervisor should hear the, this word said, if you find nothing, then stop hunting and do something else. <laughs> oh, but I'm sorry. I'm sorry. So yeah, feel free to like take that clip and just, so uh, a Think Geek used to have them. I'm sure you could find them someplace else, but they were these tiny little recorders that you could record something on and then hide it in someone's office, like stick it under their desk or something like that. And it would go off at random time intervals. So just take an audio clip of me driving home that this needs to be, you know, proactive check of every single system and just hide it in their office and drive them nuts with it. That may be one way to get your point across on that. <laughs> That's awesome. So, so again, to come back to the whole threat hunting thing, where does that fit into all of this? Historically, all of our security tools have fallen into one of two different buckets. One bucket is protection. This is how we keep the bad people out. So like firewalls, you know, two-factor authentication, uh, pen testing, VPNs, those were all technologies we leveraged to try and keep the bad people away. The other bucket was response. 
This is the stuff we do once we figure out the bad people in. The gap was here in the middle. How do we figure out when our protections have failed and we need to go into incident response mode? We need to, we need to dive into this bucket and start using those technologies. That's the piece that's been missing. That's why environments tend to be owned for six months or more before they're detected. And again, over 50% of the time, the detection is by some outside third party. And if it happens to you, don't feel bad. There are some big name companies <laughs> that couldn't figure out for themselves they were compromised that the FBI or somebody else has come up to them and let them know, hey, so we found this customer data on Pastebin and it looks like it might belong to you. Uh, maybe you've got some nefarious actors on your network. You might want to check into that. Uh, it happens, you know? And, and again, this is one of the things that threat hunting is there to try and help us solve. So what threat hunting is not, here's your list. You know, this is a list of all the things that if someone tells you that at any one of these things is threat hunting, here's why. They're an old fogey, they've been doing that for years and they want to still be relevant. That's really what it comes down to. All of this stuff is useful in its own little way, but it's not gonna give you that proactive validation. It's not gonna give you that uh, compromise assessment to let you know whether your entire environment is still in a secure state or not. Can someone unblock my other account, please? I'm not sure what the other account is and I'm not sure why it got blocked. Um, typically, we only block people when they earn it. <laughs> They've done a lot of spamming. But I'll let Bill run with that one. He tends to be the one with the heavy hammer. All right, so threat hunting. So what is it? What is it we need to do with threat hunting? Honestly, the description itself is kind of simple. So your job as a threat hunter is to review the integrity of every device on the network, not just desktops, not just servers, not even just the network gear, but industrial Internet of Things devices, if they are, they're hooked up, uh, bring your own device to network stuff if that gets hooked up. Your job is to validate the integrity state of everything on that network that can potentially get internet access. And this says generate one of three dispositions. Really, you want to be able to generate one of two. I'm pretty certain that system is still in pristine shape and it's not compromised. Or I'm pretty certain that system is compromised and we're gonna have a bad day and we need to go in incident response mode. The third state that's listed here, I'm not sure. That simply means I need to set up additional testing to figure that out. For example, let's say I've got an internal system and it's in regular communications with an IP address. Who will I pick on? Uh, DigitalOcean. I'll pick on DigitalOcean. It's, send, it's communicating back to DigitalOcean on a regular basis. And there's no, IP, there's no fully qualified domain name associated with that IP. We don't see a DNS lookup taking place. We have no idea why our system's talking to that. We're unsure. Is it because it's compromised? Is something else going on? We're unsure. Well, we need a validation test to figure that out, right? So maybe we need to run Sysmon on that box and start recording what applications are talking on the network so we can see which application is calling to DigitalOcean and now leverage that to figure it out. So, you know, let's say it was calling back to Amazon, uh, to Amazon EC2. And then we go look at that system when we see it's Slack.exe that's, that's generating that session. And we know we're a Slack shop. Oh, okay, it's just Slack. That's okay. We can check this one off. We're, we're okay from an integrity state. And now I can create an exception for that type of traffic knowing that there's a business need behind it. Or maybe it's communicating back and it's using some binary name we've never heard of that looks like it's an odd uh, you know, hexadecimal name and it's in the Windows directory, and it's not normally a Windows-based file, well, now we can look at that and say, yeah, well, we're going to have a bad day, right? <laughs> we're going to have a really bad day. So this third disposition that's listed here isn't a final disposition. It's a disposition that says additional testing is required. We may need to do additional things to come back to one of these first two. So as threat hunters, that's our job. Check every system and make a determination. I think I'm pretty certain it's still secure. I'm pretty certain it's been compromised. That's it. Now, it sounds simple and it's very brief and to the point description, 
how we get there, there's a lot of technology behind that that we're going to talk about. So where do you start, right? You get all these devices hooked up to the network. Where do you start? Well, the logical place to start for me is the network itself. And if you kind of stop and think about it, it makes a lot of sense. We, we've tried to do host-based a lot in the past, right? And one of the challenges with host-based is it's host-specific. So I might have um, anti-malware software that runs on Windows, but now my Linux systems, my Macs, my network hardware, my industrial Internet of Things devices, my cameras, my temperature sensors, none of those are protected. It's only my desktop systems running Windows. Well, that's just a small portion of my network, right? How do I protect everything? The network is the great equalizer. One of the nice things about starting on the network is the techniques I'm going to show you is independent of the host operating system, meaning that if it's a Windows system, a Linux system, or a thermostat that gets compromised, and yeah, thermostats do get compromised. Uh, you may remember about five years back, six years back, uh, the East Coast of the United States went offline. And it was because this company named Dyn that ran DNS um, <laughs> dropped offline because they got hit with a very large distributed denial of service attack. Uh, to their credit, I will say the attack that hit them was about 20 times larger than anything they had ever seen in the past. But going through the fingerprints of the traffic that was generating it, an awful lot of it was Nest thermostats. Yeah, so thermostats can be compromised. Thermostats can be turned into a command and control channel. And if it can happen to a thermostat, it can be happen, it can happen to any device plugged into your network. You know, your controller board, your industrial internet of things device, it doesn't matter. So starting on the network, the same way I would evaluate a thermal probe to see if it's been compromised or a you know temperature sensor or thermostat is the same way I would a server or a desktop. The process is exactly the same. That's kind of cool because when we go host-based, you know, some of us are really good with Windows and we're still trying to come up to speed on Linux. So we might understand Linux, but we've never worked with NetWare. I'm going to pull that one out because that came up during the during the pre-show banter. You know, maybe there's an old NetWare 6 system sitting out there and you've never worked with it before. Well, that's okay. By starting on the network, the same way you'll evaluate that system is the same way you're going to evaluate everything else. So what do I mean by start on the network? Don't worry too much about what this tool is right now. What I want you to kind of focus in on is the graph. So I have an internal IP address. Here's my private address. And it's talking to a host out on the internet. And I'm analyzing this specific time range here. So this is looking at a 24 hour period of time. This graph on the bottom is graphing how often does this system create a connection to that host out on the internet. So my X axis is time. Each one of these bars represents one hour. My Y axis is quantity. Notice the little red line here. What's the red line telling me? The red line is telling me that this system is connecting out to that host at a pretty much the exact same time interval all day long. It's connecting about 120 times an hour, so that would be every 30 seconds. So every 30 seconds, this host is communicating out to the internet, and it's communicating with this one specific host. Why? There needs to be a business need for this, right? There needs to be some business justification for this. In other words, if the system's checking its time, if it's trying to patch, if we're running some third-party software that it needs to report information up to, all of those are fine because there's a business need for it. But if we can't identify a business need, this is a problem because th if, you, if there's no business need associated with it, the most likely candidate is the system has been compromised. This is a command and control server being run by the attacker. And our system is checking in every 30 seconds to see, hey, are there any commands you want me to run? Like, do you want me to scan the network? Do you want me to start password guessing against all the accounts? Do you want me to go through and map all the net login shares? What do you want me to do? How do you want me to go about attacking this internal environment? This is the type of stuff that we need to detect. Now, what is this system? Is it Windows? Is it Mac? 
Who cares? Right? We don't, at this point, we don't know. And quite honestly, we don't care. <laughs> All we know is there's connection persistency and we, there's no immediate business need associated with that. That is enough to send us down the rabbit hole. Now, I talked about that third option where we may need, may need to collect additional data. And one of the options they gave was that you may want to go in and see what applications are talking on the network on that host. We actually run an open source project called Beaker. Beaker does that with Windows. It's soon to support Linux. It uses Microsoft's Sysmon tool to just record what applications are talking on the network on your host. And that's kind of cool because if you try to record everything, you end up with like this ton of data that um, <laughs> basically saturates your network with traffic, fills up your drives and makes your queries run slower. In other words, you know, when, if you talk to like a SIM, SIM vendor and say, hey, what should we keep track of? What are they gonna tell you? Everything, right? Log everything. You wanna log everything. You want maximum visibility. Why do they tell you that? Usually they tell you that because the, there's an upcharge <laughs> trying to collect all that additional information, right? But let's pull back and think about what do we really need to know about? What is a, is a common denominator until we know that system is actually compromised and we need to go into forensics mode? When we're talking about a common denominator on every system, whether it's compromised or not, what's actually worth taking a look at? And it's what applications are talking on the network. Because if that system gets compromised, it's probably going to be over the network. If that system starts reaching out to try and compromise other systems, you guessed it, it's going to be over the network. If it tries to call home to a command and control server, Guess what? It's going to be over the network. So if that's the common denominator we go with, that gives us some huge visibility with a minimal amount of data being collected. Uh, we'll be given a link to where to get Zeek, Rita, Beaker, etc. Yeah, um, Bill's going to jump in and help you out. <laughs> so thank you, Bill, dude. So let's say we see this. I've got an internal system connecting out, and let's say I'm collecting that Sysmon data through a tool like Beaker. Beaker will go through and show me what application is running that. Now, in this case here, it's PowerShell. And a lot of us have a SIM rule that says, hey, anybody running PowerShell, I want to get an alert. I want to take a look at that, right? Because if someone in HR is running PowerShell, eh, we got a problem, right? PowerShell is a tool that's usually used by like the security team, the IT team, that type of thing. Uh, if, if we see, you know, if Jean-Luc Picard works in human resources or sales, and they're directly executing PowerShell, yeah, no, it's probably not them, it's probably some malware running on their system, right? Now, what if that didn't say PowerShell? What if that said X0195FF378? Well, we're not going to have a signature to look for that binary executing, right? That's just a random name. And if we ran across that, you know, if we ran across that random name in a system, how much attention would we really pay to it? Well, here we have context, right? Here we get to see, hey, that binary is what's causing the connection to that IP address, and it's doing it consistently all day long. That context helps us figure out, this is something I really need to go to pay, pay attention to. So notice, you know, I, 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 I slammed SIM logging and trying to find bad guys that way at the beginning, right? I'm backing up a little bit. I'm saying that's not the right way to find the bad guys in the first place, but it is excellent support data to help you run down if there's a bad guy on that system or not once you have context. And specifically the context we're working with is my system is connecting to an IP address I don't understand and it's doing it all day long. That context really helps us figure out is this a binary I need to worry about or So let's talk some detection techniques. <clears throat> so we talked about monitoring the network. What do we mean by that? By that, I mean, we wanna be able to see all the traffic on the network that's going to and from the internet, right? Because our attacker is typically gonna be outside on the internet someplace. So if they compromise an internal system, let's say they send something in an email that somebody shouldn't have clicked <laughs> and they clicked it, and that system becomes compromised, the attacker can't get to it directly because there's a firewall in the way. So that system's going to need to call out to a command and control server. And I get some drawings that will show this in a little bit more detail later. But when it connects out to that command and control server on the internet, 
traffic flow is going to be to and from the internet. Therefore, if we want to go look for C2, traffic to and from the internet, that's where we want to monitor. If you want to try and monitor, you know, like the backbone switch and all your internal traffic as well, that's up to you. You're going to deal with a lot of false positives. What's nice about monitoring internet traffic, it's a known quantity. It's a known entity, meaning you should really understand all the protocols that are leaving your network and what their intent is. You should really understand where they're going. And this helps to highlight that stuff for you, right? So like you see your Windows system going back to Microsoft. Yeah, okay, that's just, you know, it's patching or it's, you know, Windows notification service or it's something like that. But if it's reaching out to EC2, eh, why? So it kind of forces you to learn what's normal for your systems and what's not. How much data do you need to look at? Sunburst is my lowest common denominator, right? Because today we deal with nation state going after commercial entities. They're not just going after other governments now, they're going after commercial entities too. So that kind of becomes our bar. That becomes the, what do we need to go in and, you know, and use for our detection? And it matters. When Sunburst happened, most commercial tools, most commercial threat hunting tools completely missed it. They had no ability to detect it until a signature got written in December. And as we said, as of December, Sunburst stopped getting used anyway, so it didn't help. The free tool that we're going to use in our labs, Rita, was one of the few tools that I'm aware of that was capable of detecting Sunburst. Rita and its related commercial tool, AC Hunter, was detecting Sunburst in August, long before FireEye said anything. And at that point, those folks you know, didn't call it Sunburst. They didn't know what it was. All they knew was their solar wind server, after the last update, started reaching out to an IP address that didn't appear to have anything to do with solar winds. That was enough for them to say, eh, we got to throw some firewall rules in here. We got to mitigate this. What's actually going on? That's what threat hunting should be, right? Brand new attack, no known signature. You need to be able to detect that type of stuff. So why were all the commercial tools missing it? Why didn't any commercial tools, you know, except for one, actually detect sunburst? And the answer is the period of time they analyze was way too small. One of the things sunburst did is it really kind of backed off how often it was checking into a command and control server, right? A lot of C2 channels will check in like every 30 seconds to a minute, just like we were looking at a few moments ago. Sunburst only checked in every 15 minutes. And to try and make it even harder to detect, it would vary its timing. So sometimes it would check in as, uh, as frequently as every 13 and a half minutes. Sometimes it was as long as 15 and a half, uh, 16 and a half minutes, and it would vary the dwell time in between that window. So it's changing up its timing. Well, if I have a tool that's only looking at 20 minutes of network context to try and identify a C2 channel, what happens when I try to detect something like Sunburst? Well, that means I'm only going to have one, maybe two connections to analyze to figure out if it's a command and control channel. Well, that's not enough, right? <laughs> yeah, I, I easy, you know, easily connect to Google a couple of times at a time randomly throughout the day as part of doing searches. So to like tell me it connected twice, that doesn't help. But when you look at 24 hours and it's connecting in every 15 minutes, you know, with some variance in there, well, that's four times an hour. That's 100 times in that course of the day. So you've got about 100 data points to look at to be able to say this connection persistency here. So I man mentioned here you want to analyze large time blocks. 12 hours is my bare minimum. 24 hours is my recommended. Well, Chris, we're a three-letter government agency that has very high level other, you know, eight similar agencies and foreign nations coming after us. Um, is 24 hours enough? Maybe not. Maybe you want to look at a week's worth of data. It's going to take you longer to process. It's going to be a lot more involved. But if you're worried about like a command and control channel that's only going to call in like twice a day, yeah, you might need to look at a full week. You know, 24 hours might not be enough. So I think, I think for most of us, 24 hours is plenty. There may be situations where you may actually want to try and analyze larger data sets than that. 
Now, one of the things I've seen happen to folks, right? So our goal is to figure out, is that system compromised, yes or no? And one of the things you can kind of get yourself into is <laughs> you, you kind of go back and forth. You know, you get what I refer to as wrapped around the axle. So you, you go in and you say, oh, hey, that looks suspicious about the system. Oh, but that looks okay. Oh, but that looks suspicious. Oh, but that looks okay. But that looks suspicious, but that looks okay. And now we've got one IP address we're trying to analyze, spending tons and tons of time, and we can't figure out if it's something we actually need to worry about or not. So one of the things I like to do is I like to create a point scoring system. There is no standard for this. I always have folks ask, hey, so how many points should you assign for a persistent connection or something like that? I think I'm probably about six months away from being confident enough with this to publish something. But for today, I'm going to have to say you kind of need to make this up as you go. There are boundaries I'll give you. Like if I see connection persistency, if I see something's in commu constant communication with the host out on the internet, you know, if I'm using a scale of like zero to 100, I'm going to assign 70 points for that easily. The connection persistency is the most important thing to go in and look for. Now, if it's, um, if it's calling out to that system on a very strict time interval, I'm going to leave it at 70 points. Because when I've seen false positive conditions, what's a false positive? A false positive is there's a business need for it and you just haven't figured that out yet. So a great example is network time protocol, NTP. So any system running NTP is going to call out to an NTP server and depending upon the operating system, it's going to go anywhere from every 15 minutes to every 30 minutes. Different OSs use different time intervals. Um, but it's going to call out on an exact time interval, and it's going to ask the same question each time. What time is it? And the answer it's going to get it back is going to be exactly the same length each time. So you've got this repetitive pattern that goes off consistently. If that's what I'm looking at, I'll leave it at 70 points, and that's it. Because when I've run into false positives, 99% of the time, they have a fixed interval like that. If, however, I analyze that time interval and I notice it's varying it. Remember I said with Sunburst, it was varying the time, plus or minus 10%. So it was every 15 minutes, plus or minus 10%. So the delta between connections might be as short as 13 and a half minutes. It might be as long as 16 and a half minutes. That's a technique to try and avoid detection. A lot of detection tools uh, still try to use k-means clustering. I'll explain this more later in another slide. They still try to use k-means clustering, and k-means clustering gets fooled once you start jittering the connection. So they'll jitter it. Well, I've only run into one minor instance where jitter was being used legitimately. So if I see it, my system's calling out to a host on the internet, and I notice it's changing the timing, it's jittering the timing, I'm going to add another 10 points on for that, another 15 points on for that, whatever the case may be. In other words, that makes it even more suspicious to me. Now, there are some minor modifiers. A minor modifier might be something like, hey, the user agent string that system is using doesn't match all the other hosts on my network. Or the way that system is negotiating TLS sessions is different versus the other systems on my network. That's up to me as a minor modifier. It's minor because, hey, we've all got one-offs, right? We've all got situations where things are gonna be a little different. So that might just be that. So I might assign a small number of points, three points, five points for a user agent string that's unique and that's it. And if that's the only thing unique about that system, that is a small enough number of points that I'm not gonna bother doing any, doing any further investigation. Now there are exceptions to that. What if I analyze the user agent strings being used by a particular IP address, and I notice that the user agent string consistently identifies itself as running Chrome on Windows 10, but in one instance, with one IP address that it talks to on the internet, it's identifying itself as being uh, a Windows 7 system running Internet Explorer 7. Whoa, whoa, wait. <laughs> Are you Windows 10? Are you Windows 7? Now, it could be a system running a VM. That's a possibility. But it's also a possibility that it's a compromised system and that command and control channel uniquely identifies itself that way. So the fact that sometimes it claims to be Windows 10 and sometimes it claims to be Windows 7, that might add more points in for me as well. So again, major minor, minor modifiers. 
Uh, what, what would be a negative modifier? A negative modifier would be a business need. So let's say I see an internal system and it's in constant communication with an IP address out on the internet. Up oh, 70 points, there's persistency of connection. But then when I look at the fully qualified domain name that they looked up, it's a Windows notification server within Microsoft.com. And then when I analyze the digital certificate handed out by the server, it matches that fully qualified domain name, which is a Windows notification server within Microsoft.com. And that digital certificate's valid. Oh, okay. Now that would be, I would subtract 70, 80 points for that, right? It's a Windows system calling home to Microsoft using a fully qualified domain name within Microsoft and receiving a digital certificate that was issued to Microsoft, subtract 70 points. Now we're back down in the uh, we're down back down in the weeds. And typically what I'll do is for scores between like zero and 30, that's where I say I'm pretty certain that system's safe. Doesn't have to be exactly zero. We're close enough. For systems that score, you know, like 80 or higher, those are the ones where I say yeah, this might be compromised. We need to go in and do a further evaluation. Uh, let's see. Is it safe to say that every compromised system will eventually try to call out? Good question. No. <laughs> and I've got a slide on the one exception I've run into in the past. Uh, that'll be coming up in a little bit. So some examples of major or minor modifiers to work through. Like I said, I, I really want to publish something that will kind of help people go through this and kind of come up with their own scoring systems. Um, you know, I'll obviously open source it. Uh, that'll kind of help give some folks some boundaries. But, you know, I've only been working with this stuff for like six years now. I'm just getting to the point where I feel like, you know, confident enough to do something like that. So our goal is to identify what systems have been compromised, right? What's the, from a high level view, right? From, so from like a 50,000 foot view, what are the general steps for doing that? These steps in this order is what I have found will help eliminate the largest amount of systems very quickly. In other words, if you look at this list, check for persistency of connection. Actually, I would uh, check for abnormal protocol behavior, do a reputational check on the external IP, investigate the internal IP. That's all, those are four steps right there. Now, what if I do reputational check first? What if I start there? Well, here's the problem. Let's say I've got 100,000 connections that went out to the internet yesterday to unique IP addresses. I'm gonna have to evaluate 100,000 external IPs to figure out if there's a business need associated with that or not, right? That's gonna be a lot of work. So instead, what we do is we start with connection persistency. Unless we see a regular connection going out on a repetitive basis, don't bother doing a reputational check. And what you'll find is a very small percentage of traffic leaving your network matches that pattern. So out of the 100,000 connections that left your network, there's probably like 100 that actually match this parameter. So now we're down to only 100 sessions that we need to look at. And then we'll go in and we'll look at, you know, how is the protocol being used? You know, and then we'll go in and we'll look at how is the, uh, what's the reputation on the external system? These two to me are interchangeable. The last two, what I have found is that most people <laughs> can learn more about the external IP than they can about their internal systems. And if you're not sure if you're in that boat or not, try this check. Go to your IT people and say, hey, you know, this, uh, this IP, desktop IP address, you know, 192.168.1.37. You know, pick an IP, uh, is sending some suspicious traffic out to the internet. Who's using that IP address? If they can respond to you right away and say, oh, this is the user logged into that system and they're currently online now or, you know, whatever the case may be, great. If they come back to you two days later and say, well, I went through the DHCP server and at that point, this was the MAC address that got that IP address and that MAC address is made by this manufacturer, which I think is a Dell system. Yeah, no, your host, right? That's when investigate the internal IP needs to come last because you can learn a lot more much quickly about the external IP. So again, these four steps, check for persistency of connection, check for abnormal protocol behavior, reputational check of the external IP, 
and then investigate the internal system. That order is specifically to help eliminate as much work as quickly as possible. Does targeting C2 have its blind spots? So somebody just asked this question in Discord. Yes, it is possible to have malware get dumped on your system and it doesn't create a C2 channel. It's very rare, but we have actually seen it in the past. And a good example is NotPetya. NotPetya is yet another attack that we think was generated by the Russians. And it was an attack, one of their many, against Ukraine. So what they did is they did a, uh, they did a vendor side attack. They went in and they compromised a tax system that anybody who did business in the Ukraine used and had that system as part of his next patch set cycle deliver out some malware. So I think what they wanted to do was shut down as many computers within the Ukraine that they possibly could. And from a simplistic standpoint, this attack mechanism kind of makes sense, right? Because what if you're doing business in the Ukraine, you need to pay taxes within the Ukraine. This was the system you needed to talk to as part of doing those taxes. So everybody in the Ukraine will be connecting to the system, or at least one system within their environment would be connecting to the system. So to use this as the malicious delivery mechanism made a lot of sense. And what this malware did is once it got on a system, it tried a couple of uh, Windows-based exploits, you know, because now it's running on a system inside the firewall. It would try to infect a number of other systems, and then it would encrypt the local drive and it would pop up something that said, hey, your drive has been encrypted. If you want it back, pay Bitcoin to this account. And it was a black hole, meaning if you paid or not paid, either way, there was no way for you to get your data back. And they tried to hit as many systems within the internal environment as they could. This was the cyber equivalent of a bomb, meaning that it was very indiscriminate. That's one of the reasons why it got out. Our first global shipping crisis was because of NotPetya, because there were shipping companies that did business in the Ukraine, but also did business all over the world. So even though it was Ukraine that was targeted, that still meant there were miles of 18-wheelers backed up in New Jersey trying to get things on and off of boats because the software they needed to use to load those boats. You know, if you've ever seen a shipping boat, it's a balancing act when they pack it. There is software that tells them how much does everything weigh and what can be placed where on the boat at what time, just to make sure they don't capsize the boat when they're trying to load it up. Without that software, you can't load or unload the boat. That software got encrypted and locked up. They couldn't use it anymore. Thus, we had miles of backup. This was an exception to the rule, meaning that this was designed to be a cyberbomb. But if a cyber bomb hits your environment, going and looking for C2 channels isn't going to detect it. Now you're back to following on your uh, anti-malware software and hoping it will detect it, even though it probably will not. Um, there's not a whole lot of options with something like that, unfortunately. I hate to say it that way, but that's kind of where it's at. And last thing before we take a break, technique versus methodology. What do I mean by that? I mean, we're going to do a lot of manual stuff in this lab in these labs. I'm going to have you using open source tools because everybody has access to them and anybody can use them. And some of the techniques I'm going to teach you don't necessarily scale well. In other words, you might look at the technique and say, oh, hey, I've got a 10 gig pipe to the internet. I'd never have time to go through and do this. That's fine. What I'm trying to teach you is how these processes should work. In other words, if you're on a 10 gig pipe, great. Go buy a commercial tool to do this for you but now you understand what that tool should be doing under the hood. Now you'll understand how you can test that tool to make sure it's working properly. You know, one of the tools we make available is a very simple C2 testing tool. Uh, if someone could throw that into the Discord channel, that would be awesome. And it just allows you to identify an external IP, the transport and port number that you want to use and what you want to use for time interval and how you want to go in and vary that timing. So it won't actually, you can't use it to exfiltrate data. We wouldn't create something like that. But it does allow you to emulate a command and control channel. And does that commercial tool detect it? That's part of what we're going to be teaching you in this class. So if you need to scale large, don't worry about it. This is going to need you, give you the 
rather than deploying everything yourself, this is at least going to give you the foundation you need to evaluate tools to be able to do it right. And with that said, let's take a break. So it's now the top of the hour. At 10 minutes after the top of the hour, we'll pick up from here and keep going. All right, we are back. So we had a couple of good questions come in. Uh, one of them was, um, C2 would use DNS in most cases, so then is not DNS one of the most crucial protocols to monitor? Uh, I do see a lot of C2 running over DNS, and I've got some slides on it, um, so if you're not familiar with it, I'll describe it in more detail later. But suffice, yeah, one of the benefits to the attacker of running their command and control channel over DNS is that you never actually see the compromised system reaching out directly to the internet. You see your DNS servers talking to the internet, which, hey, they do all day long anyway. So yeah, that makes it one of the things that, or, or one of the protocols that are definitely worth monitoring. And I'll get into that more as we go through. Uh, we had another question, C2 in C and C is the same thing. Yeah, I've seen it expressed both ways. So command and control, sometimes I'll see folks write that as C2, sometimes I'll see them write it as C and C. So I kind of use the two interchangeably in the slides just so you get used to seeing it one way or the other. Uh, let's see, what else we got here? Oh yeah, uh, another thing about DNS, over C, uh, uh, DNS monitoring, uh, we'll get into it with Zeke, but one of the cool things about doing your DNS monitoring with Zeek versus trying to do logging on your DNS server itself is one, it doesn't add that additional load, but number two, you get to see the answers. You don't you see just the queries that people are sending out, you get to see the answer that came back, and that can be super useful because it, re, it helps you see are these queries that are going out, one of the side effects of C2 over DNS is you look up a lot of fully qualified domain names that no one ever tries to connect to. That's usually one of your clear indicators that, yeah, this is a C2 channel. I'll talk about that more as we go through. Uh, the final question I saw in there that looked kind of cool was DNS over HTTPS. How does that work? So <clears throat> this is the, there are very few protocols that really kind of tick me off, and this is one of the protocols that tick me off because it's sold as a privacy thing and it's not. DNS over HTTPS was a bunch of browser vendors saying, hey, ISPs are making a lot of money selling information on where what sites people visit. How do we get in on that? And that's where DNS over HTTPS came from. And they bill it as a privacy thing, right? They bill it as, oh, well, this hides the query that they sent. So the attack, you know, so if it's a nation state that monitors their people, they won't know where they're going. Oh, BS. Because once they do the lookup, what's that, what's that system going to do? It's going to connect to the IP address that it got back as an answer. So all you got to do is look at what they're connecting to and, hey, you know what they're visiting. So that doesn't solve any privacy problems. Well, they could run that through a VPN, Chris. Yeah, they could. And they could run the DNS traffic through a VPN as well and you know, privacy that way. So DNS over uh, HTTPS doesn't actually solve any problems we have today. All it does is it puts money in the pockets of the browser vendors who've implemented it like Chrome. Here's why it ticks me off. It ticks me off because, and a few folks have mentioned this in, in the channel, one of the critical protocols for us to monitor is DNS. What are users trying to get to? What fully qualified domain names are they looking up? What IP addresses are coming back as, as that? That is critical data we need to be able to implement security in our environment. And if we go blind to that, our job becomes a whole lot harder. So DNS over HTTPS, I'm one of those people that will tell you, don't let it happen. <laughs> you, know, t t you know, registry key changes, whatever you need to do within your environment, you know, block the IP addresses of the known DNS over HTTP servers, uh, don't let it happen. Because if it starts happening in your environment, you're gonna lose a lot of the critical visibility that you need. All right. Um, let's see. I understand it's more advanced use case, but maybe at some point 
uh, some pointers on how one can approach it. Uh, let's see. Oh, so the question is, are, there go are you going to cover cases with uh, pivoted C2 traffic, i.e. where there's a small number of systems communicating with the public C2 server, and there's other internal systems going through the pivoted system and not directly? <clears throat> so I typically don't see that. So I, and we'll cover this more detail in the slides, but I want to hit this now just so everybody's kind of, you know, not worried about the question. What I typically see is the attacker will come up with some delivery method to go after the target site. So that might be typically it's email and typically it's an attachment or a link. You know, either way, somebody clicks something they shouldn't have. They've studied that environment. So maybe they've gone to like LinkedIn or they've gone to like job posting sites to see what type of endpoint security software. And I, I do either the folks that currently work there say they're trained in or that that environment has tried to hire for. And once they know what endpoint software you're running, now they know how to create their malware in a way to try and get around what it, whatever it is you're running. So that will help them customize the malware specifically for your environment. That gets them their beachhead. They now own one system. Typically, the next thing they're going to do, lateral movement. Because if that beachhead goes away, they lose connectivity to that network. Right? What if it's a laptop and somebody takes it home at night? What if they get a new system? What if the hard drive crashes? You know, all of those would cause them to lose access. They don't want to lose access. So very quickly, they will now start trying to move to other systems in your environment. Typically, what I'll see is rather than trying to funnel everything through that one system, which now will make that one system look like it's generating a ton more traffic versus everybody else, is those systems will start reaching out to the same command and control server, but they'll do it at a much slower interval. So for example, some of the analyses I've been involved with, the beachhead system, the one they're using to get in and out of your environment, that might call out once per minute. But those backup systems, those secondaries that compromised, those may only call home every six to eight hours. So now what happens is, let's say you figure out the beachhead's infected and you clean that system, you take it offline or whatever, but that now that goes away as a potential command and control channel for the attacker. The next time one of those secondary systems calls in at that six to eight hour interval and says, hey, do you have anything for me to do? It's issued a command that tells it, you're now the primary channel into that environment. I want you to drop your dwell time to one minute. You know, so instead of calling home, instead of waiting six to eight hours to call back again, start calling home once per minute. And now that's that prime. Now that's the new primary channel that the attacker uses. We've all heard the horror stories of environments where they figure out a system got compromised, they clean it, and somehow the attackers magically get back in a couple of hours later, and they can't figure out how. The answer is there's no magic. <laughs> they didn't get back in. They were always there, they just didn't get detected. Because those secondary compromised systems, and typically I'll see 12 to 15 or something, you know, somewhere in that range there. They're gonna set up a number of different secondaries. Depends on how much, how valuable your environment is to them. The more valuable it is, the more secondaries they're probably gonna have. But it's, you know, it's gonna, they, uh, it'll call out every six to eight hours until it's turned into the primary channel. So when they clean that first system, the secondary now comes online. So it wasn't that they got back in, you never made them go away. I talked about that 24 hour period of time, you know, monitoring that. Let's say we find a compromised system. One of the first things I always do is once I've identified, yes, that system's compromised and it's calling out to a command and control server, the next thing I always do is anybody else talking to that same C2 server. And typically when you do that, that's when you'll find 12, 14 other systems are calling out on like a six to eight hour basis to that same IP. Now we know we need to go in incident response mode and our scope is all 14, 15 of those systems. We can't address just one. We've got to hit them all at the same time to make sure that we get the attacker out. So good question. Awesome. Let's get back into what we were doing. 
So I talked about technique versus methodology. You know, I talked about what I, what I want you to understand is what should be happening inside the black box if you buy it from a vendor so you can evaluate that black box for yourself. Bad guys versus red teams. One of the, one of the good things here is I found that detecting red teams is actually harder than detecting the bad guys because they have a different business model, right? At, at red teamers are supposed to emulate the attackers, but really they don't because their goals are different, right? What's a red teamer do? A red teamer signs a contract with the customer, breaches a system, shows evidence of that, and cashes their paycheck. That's it, right? They don't need to exfiltrate data or any of that other stuff. They, they don't need to worry about any of that. They just need to see, can they get away with setting up a C2 channel and will it get detected? The actual bad guys have a much fuller business model to worry about. And quite honestly, C2 is at the bottom of the run for them. That's one of the reasons why I like to pick on it. In other words, writing malware that will get around whatever endpoint protection software is on that system, that's one of the harder things for them to do. So if I, they have, let's say, 100 engineers working to solve the software problems of infecting systems and stealing data, a majority of them are going to be working on that malware problem because that's the hardest nut to crack, getting that initial beachhead. The C2 uh, channel, most people have no way to detect that. So that's something that's almost like an afterthought for them. In fact, one of the things we'll talk about is most, uh, most C2 channels are simply cobalt strike. Cobalt strike is a vendor, makes a commercial product that not only red teamers license and use, but the bad guys use it, for, you know, steal it and use it. Hey, they're bad guys, that's what they do, right? <laughs> um, Sunburst used Cobalt Strike. As advanced as it was, as many engineers were working on that problem as there was, when it came to the C2 channel, they said F it and just grabbed a copy of Cobalt Strike and went ahead and used that. So finding that C2 channel is usually the easiest part of their process to go through and break. And red teamers sometimes get a little bit more creative than that, but, some, but usually not always. So if you can catch red teamers, you're actually in really good shape to catch the bad guys because it's one of the few occurrences where the red teamers are usually better at it than the bad guys are. All right, so we talked about connection persistency. What does connection persistency mean? Connection persistency simply means constant communication between the two systems. That can take on a number of different attributes. The first one is long connections. What's a long connection? A long connection is simply when I compromise that system, I have it call out to the command and control server, and I have it hold open that connection all the time. So it calls out to the C2 server, creates that session, holds it open, never shuts that connection. You know, life is good. One of the neat things about doing it that way is that we, you know, we're going to work with Zeek today. And I will say Zeek is one of my favorite tools for catching bad guys and catching command and control channels. But Zeek has a weakness, it actually has a couple of weaknesses that need to get tweaked. <laughs> but one of its weaknesses is that it doesn't write out log entries until the connection closes. So imagine I compromise your system. I have that system call out to a command and control server and you're using Zeek to monitor all the traffic going in and out of your internet link. When that initial compromise takes place and that command and control session gets established, Zeek will not generate a log entry for you for you to be able to see that C2 channel. Now let's say I leave that connection running for three months. Over that three month period of time, if you check your Zeek logs every day, you still see nothing to show you my C2 channel that's been running. So now I've been in your environment for three months, stealing intellectual property, and I'm done. I've gotten everything that I came in to get. I start cleaning up the network, you know, cleaning up behind myself so that you won't find any of this stuff, and that causes the C2 channel to shut down. When the C2 channel closes, that's when Zeek will record it. So you'll now get a log entry that says, hey, this internal system was talking to this IP address out of the internet for three months. And you say, whoa, whoa, wait a minute. <laughs> What happened to yesterday or the day before when I looked at the logs and you showed me nothing about this connection? So it's what I like to refer to as the three-month surprise. 
because that's usually about how long an attacker will hold it open for before they close it and they've gotten everything they want from you. And that's when you will get an evidence that, hey, my system was compromised, but oops, it's too late. One of the uh, tools we're going to work with is a tool called Rita. One of the things Rita does to fix this weakness with Zeek is when Rita collects its log entries from Zeek every hour, it grabs a copy of Zeek's state table. Zeek's state table is where Zeek tracks all of the connections that it's monitoring. And it compares the log entries to the state table. Anything that is in the state table that's not in the log, Zeek, uh, Rita will make a recording of that as well. So if you use Rita as part of your analysis process for looking at your Zeek logs, it will show you things that you wouldn't be able to get if only if you just looked at the Zeek logs only. So that's kind of cool. But a long connection, like I said, that's just a connection that's held open all the time. Another way to look at this is also cumulative communication time. So for example, Metasploit. The default uh, C2 channel that Metasploit sets up calls out to the command and control server, holds it open for 30 minutes, closes it, and then immediately reestablishes the connection again. And it does that every 30 minutes. And the reason it works that way is it's actually pretty stealthy. Most tools are going to miss it because if you're looking for long duration connections on your network, well, the duration is never more than 30 minutes. So that's probably going to fall under your radar. In other words, if you look at a 24-hour blocks of information looking for long connections, you're probably going to analyze connections that are like, you know, five hours or more. You know, that way any C2 that's running under business hours, you're going to be able to detect that. Once you get under five hours, yeah, that could be, you know, a large data transfer. You don't necessarily want to pay attention to that. So again, you're going to look at like five hours or more. Well, Metasploit is only running for 30 minutes and then closing. So that would fall below your radar. If you want to look for beacons, that repetitive calling out to the internet, what a lot of folks will do is they'll look at, okay, who's connecting to a system on the internet thousands of times per day? Because if they're connecting thousands of times per day, that's probably a beacon and something I should pay attention to. Well, this is only beaconing every 30 minutes or less than 50 times in a day. So if you're looking for thousands of connections per day, this is only 50. Again, it falls underneath your radar. One of the ways to detect this is to look at cumulative communication time. In other words, over this 24-hour period of time, how long were these two systems in, in communication with each other? And in the case of Metasploit, it's still 24 hours of communication time over a 24-hour period of time, right? That makes it worth paying attention to. This also brings us to the second weakness with Zeek. Zeek, by default, times out sessions after five minutes, and then we'll write them out. So if a session goes dormant for more than five minutes, it'll kill it. And any new data that transfers over that session, it'll label that as being a new session. Here's the problem. You can have a connection that's running 24 hours a day. And if it's only transmitting data across it every hour, it's going to look like those connections are only lasting five minutes each time. And it's going to look like, you know, they only communicated with each other for maybe, you know, an hour in the course of the day, when in fact they were in communication with each other in the, you know, the full time. And there's a TCP timeout value you can go in and tweak in order to go in and kind of change that setting. And again, that's something else that Reader will take care of for you. So we'll be talking more about Reader as we go through. But here is an example of what our Zeek logs look like. So Zeek is probably, you know, despite those limitations, Zeek is probably one of our best ways to go through and identify how long were these sessions running for. Because most devices don't record this, our firewalls don't. You know, firewalls, if you go into the state table, there may be a timer that you see, but that timer is simply expressing how much time has gone by since the last time a packet was seen, not when that session actually first started. So there's actually very few places you can go to to figure out long connection information, and Zeek is one of them. So this is a copy of the con.log file. The con.log file is the primary file that Zeek records everything into. So all TCP connections, UDP connections, you name it, get recorded there. Zeek will also generate additional logs based on the type of traffic that it sees. So for example, let's say in the con log it records that an HTTP session went by, It'll also create an HTTP.log file, 
and record HTTP specific information about that connection there as well. It's kind of nice. So if I want to see everything, I go to con.log. If I want to look at just my HTTP connections, I go to HTTP.log. If I want to look at all my HTTPS traffic, that's going to be an SSL.log. So here's an example. Um, if you've never used this command before, it's kind of helpful. Less space dash capital S tries to restore the columns. Here, notice we, get, we were line wrapping everything. So it makes it kind of hard to follow. Like the fact that this lines up with duration is kind of hard to tell because everything's all kind of convoluted. If I do a less space dash capital S and then the name of the file, you can add the, the dash X20 is optional. Um, but if you do a less space dash capital S and then the name of the file, it'll line everything up into easy to read columns. Now, everything is offset by one, meaning this is my timestamp. This is my unique ID. This ORIG underscore H is how Zeek expresses source IP address. That shows up here. ID dot ORIG underscore P is how it expresses source port. This would be ID dot RESP underscore H. That label will be off to the right here. Uh, that means destination IP address. Well, what about all the stuff that's off to the right, Chris? Well, with less, I can use my arrow keys to navigate around. So if I hit the right arrow once, I'll navigate over one and look at it that way. In fact, let's just show you that real quick. So if I go into the lab one directory, there's a con.log file. If I say less con.log, everything kind of gets pulled together. See, everything's kind of line wrapping and it makes it really hard to read. So now if I hit up arrow, bring my command back, and just say dash capital S, now everything's in nice, easy to read columns. And if I hit my right arrow key, you'll see I can navigate over through the rest of these columns and see what they are. And like I said, everything gets offset by one, but at least everything's all nicely lined up so it's a whole lot easier to go through and read. So that's that command. Cool. Oh, there's been a couple of questions about a GUI. We did not include a GUI in this tool. And the reason for that is we wanted to keep the VM as small as possible. So everything's going to be on the command line. You can do it through an SSH session. There's, uh, if you go to the FAQ for this class, there's steps on how to set this system up so you can SSH to it uh, using VirtualBox or VMware workstation or whatever it is you happen to actually be using. So I mentioned cumulative talk time. There's ways to go through and kind of pull that data together as well. Zeek is giving me my duration connection information. So let's, uh, let's take a breath for a second and let's talk about this very long command here because there's attributes in this command that we're gonna be using later. So I wanna make sure this is something that everybody understands. And by the way, if, you, if like you ever see a command like this and you're not sure what it's doing, one of the easiest ways to break it down is to type out the entire command like you see here, verify you're seeing the same information, and now hit up arrow to get the command back and just start working backwards. So in other words, I'd run it a second time removing the head command to see what does that data look like. I'd go through and run it a third time, removing the sort command to see what that data looks like. So we're kind of working backwards through how is the data getting formatted, because that may help us understand what each of these commands are doing for us. So let's start at the beginning and I'll kind of just work through in a forward fashion because most of us tend to think linearly. So I'm saying cat con.log. If I just run that command, it's just gonna take the data that's in con.log and just spew it out all on the screen. Well, I don't want to look at everything. I want to look at cumulative talk time. So that means there's only specific fields that I'm interested in. There's a tool that goes along with Zeek called Zeek Cut that allows me to go in and specify certain fields. So remember we had all these titles up here, ID dot org underscore H, ID org P. Those column titles, if we specify those in Zeek Cut, it'll print out only the data that appears in that column. <clears throat> so I'm telling Zcut 
I want to see the source IP address, the destination IP address, and the duration of that connection. Now, if I just hit enter on that, it will show me all my unique connections, and it'll show me how long each of those unique connections went for. Mm -hmm. Then I'm sorting the data. When I sort the data, anytime the source IP address and the destination IP address are the same, it's going to put those one line after another. And there's a reason I'm doing that that we'll talk about more later. But it's important that I collect together anytime two IP addresses were talking to each other. Okay, what's going on here? <laughs> grep is a command that allows me to search for patterns. So if I say grep space password space the name of some file, grep will search that file and any lines that have the character string password on it, it'll print out the contents of that entire line. So if I'm looking for specific information within a file, grep is a great way to go through and find that. I can also use the dash V switch to say everything but. So if I say grep space password space some file name, every line that does not include the character string password will get printed out to the screen. We're going to be using this tool here called Data Mesh. Data Mesh is a great statistical analytic tool. You, I can go in and I can feed it data sets and tell me, show me the min, show me the max, show me the mean. But one of its cool features is I can actually add up lines. So I can go in and I can say, hey, anytime the source IP address and the destination IP address are the same, that duration column, add all those numbers up for me. That's kind of cool because if I want to look at cumulative communication time, I need to be able to add up the duration of each of those individual connections, right? Well, I don't want to have to do that manually, and I don't want to have to like download it and put it in a spreadsheet or something like that. That's just too cumbersome. Data Mash will let me do it directly at the command line. Now, the one weakness with Data Mash is it expects each of those values to be a numeric value, meaning when I say, hey, I want you to add up all the durations, it wants all the durations to be a number. If one of the duration values is Bob, it doesn't know how to add Bob in with the rest of the numbers, so it will puke and stop at that point. Two of the common things you run into is blank lines and a duration value of zero, meaning, hey, the system tried to connect to that system, but no connection actually took place. Dash E and the caret with the dollar sign in quotes, this is how I do a regular expression match on a blank line. So I'm about to give the data to data mash to add it up. I know if there's any blank lines in there, that's gonna cause data mash to fail. So my grep command is simply saying, remove any blank lines that happen to be there. When a duration is zero, a lot of times what Zeek will do, if no connection actually completed, it prints it out as a dash. So dash simply means this system tried to talk to that system, but that connection failed. So, <clears throat> excuse me, that connection failed. So the duration is like almost less than zero, if you want to think of it that way, because the connection never actually completed. So it'll express that as a dash value. Well, a dash is not a numeric value. So again, data mesh won't be able to process that. So grep dash V will remove any lines where the duration is dash. And quite honestly, we don't care about those anyway, right? Because that, that means they didn't communicate, they didn't transfer any data. The duration was zero. Get those out of the way. We don't need to see those. That's what that grep command does for us. So then we pass the data to data mesh. And what we're telling data mesh, dash G is short for group. Anytime the value in column one and column two are the same. So anytime the source IP address and the destination IP address match each other, I want you to sum or add up the value in the third column, which is the duration. So if I have five entries of these two IP addresses talking to each other, what data match is going to do is it's going to collapse it down to a single line and just print out what all of those durations add up to. It's kind of a cool feature. So now I've got a single line showing me total communication time between those two systems. Here I'm using sort again, right? We Kind of like we use sort up here, only notice I've got a dash K3. What does that mean? Well, normally sort is going to start on the sorting on the very first character. 
And when we wanted to pull together anytime the source and destination IP address was the same, it made sense to start sorting at the beginning of the line, right? With that very first character. So that's why we didn't have any switches with sort the first time. But this time what we want to do is we want to print out the longest duration connections first. Those are the ones we're most interested in, right? We don't want to have to like flip through all the data to try and figure out which ones were long and which ones were short. We want it to sort it for us and make the sort, uh, make the most, uh, the longest connections most predominant, have those show up first. So sort dash K3 says, don't sort starting with the very first character. These are columns. I want you to jump to the third column and sort based on the third column. So now we're skipping this information here and only sorting on duration. Dash N says, handle this as a numeric value, not alphanumeric. If you've ever used sort before and you ran into situations where like, you know, eight shows up uh, uh, before, excuse me, eight shows up before like, you know, 77, or excuse me, eight shows up after 77. It's because sort is normally going in and doing it as an alphanumeric sort. Well, if I tell it this is a number, it, which is what the dash N is for, it'll sort it as numbers instead of alphanumeric. Now we'll actually print the data out the way we want to see it. Dash R means reverse sort. Instead of printing from lowest to highest, print from highest to lowest. Because the longest durations, those are the ones we care about most, right? So why not have those appear at the top? And then I'm pumping it through this command head. Head, without any switches, prints out the first 10 lines of output and then stops. I can say head dash 15, dash, uh, head space dash 15, and print out 15 lines if I want to see that instead. I could say head space dash three and only print out three lines if I want to see that instead. But I wanted to see my top 10 here. And here's what my output came out as. So here is my longest duration connection that took place. Now, if one of the things you need to understand when you're doing a long connection analysis is how much data do I have to work with? In other words, if I'm only analyzing 3,600 seconds, well, that's only an hour. That's not really enough to go in and look for long connections because anything longer than an hour all looks the same at that point, right? If I'm using 24 hours, 86,400 seconds, that's a 24 hour period of time. So let's assume we're working with 24 hours worth of data here. Well, this first line is showing me that out of the 86,400 seconds, this was running for a little, for that entire time, shy 10 seconds of that. Okay, that to me sounds like it just didn't see a couple of packets at the beginning or the end, right? This, that first connection was running the full 24 hours over this 24 hour period of time being analyzed. So this one is definitely worth paying attention to. Okay, the second one was running for a little over 4,000 seconds. Is that worth taking a look at? The cutoff for me personally is about 20,000 seconds. That's about five and a half hours. That's long enough that anything that's, any malware that's trying to run business hours, you know, it only wants to run when, you know, the office is busy, um, it's going to show up for you. So that's something you can go in and tag. Um, so 20,000 tends to be my threshold. Anything less than that, I don't bother paying attention to. So for me, if I was doing a threat hunt, I would pay attention to the first line here. I would ignore everything else after that because it's shorter. <clears throat> and I mentioned, you can't get this information out of our firewalls. They, they don't record this. They record, when's the last time I saw a packet go by in a session? They don't keep track of when the session actually started. There are a couple of exceptions, you know, these tools here, but these are the exception, not the rule. So we need something else to figure out duration. Z tends to be the best tool for doing that. Okay, so that's a long connection, and that is cumulative communication time. I keep mentioning beacons. What's a beacon? A beacon is simply calling out to a system, creating a connection, tearing the session down, waiting some period of time, and doing it again. I mentioned network time protocol. Network time protocol is a beacon. Every 15 to 30 minutes, depending upon the operating system, let's pick 20 minutes just so we have a fixed number that we can work with here. 
So for a particular operating system, I think Red Hat uses 20 minutes. So every 20 minutes, a network time protocol is gonna reach out to a net time, network time protocol server and say, hey, what time is it? And then it'll get its answer and then it'll sleep for 20 minutes and then it'll do it again and then it'll sleep for 20 minutes and do it again. That is a beacon, repetitive pattern of communication between two different systems. So here's an example of how it works with command and control. So our attacker delivers some malware to the system, gets the malware installed, the user clicks something they shouldn't have. They can't connect to it directly because there's a firewall in the way, this has a private address associated with it, so they need some other way to send commands to that system. And what they do is they use effectively a proxy. So a proxy is just a system that sits in the middle and communicates between the two ends. So in this case here, the compromised system calls out to the command and control server and does it on some repetitive basis. In this case here, we're just using 10 minutes as an example. So every 10 minutes, it'll connect up to the command and control server and say, hey, is there any work for me in my queue? And if there's no work in the queue, the command and control server says, nope, go back to sleep. And now it'll just wait another 10 minutes and call in again. Hey, any work in my work queue? No, go back to sleep. Okay. Any work in my work queue? No, go back to sleep. Now, let's say the attacker wants to execute a command. Let's say they want to look at all processes that are running in memory. What they will do is they will uh, submit a command to the work queue for that system that says, list all running processes. The next time this system checks in and says, do you have anything for me to do? The command and control server says, yes, execute this command that will list out all the running processes. And now the malware on this system executes that command. Any data that results from that command, like a list of all the running processes on that system, gets exfiltrated out as part of that same session. So now my list of processes running on that box gets sent out to the command and control server. And now my attacker, as part of their session with that command and control server, can see that data. So they queue up a command, the system comes in, grabs that command, runs it, they get to see the results. And that just happens over and over and over again. So at its basis, this is how all command and control servers work. Now, there was some mention of, um, oh, so I see a question in the, um, in the Discord. Uh, I was trying to understand why do we need the first sort? Let me just back up to that again really quickly. So why did we need this first sort? When data mesh matches the source and destination IP address to then add all the durations together, if, those, if the source or the destination IP address changes, it assumes it's seen all the durations and it'll write that data out. So if I have two IP addresses that talk to each other and they're on lines one and 10 and 100 and 137 and 175 and they're all spread out through, Data Mash isn't gonna search all those lines looking for matches. It's gonna assume all the lines are one right after the other. So I would get inaccurate data if I didn't have that first sort. So the job of that first sort is to make sure when source and destination IP address match, those show up one line after another so that Data Mash can create the correct total duration time between those two systems. That's what that first sort was doing for us. All right, so C2 over DNS. We talked about this a little bit in Discord. Um, so I wanna make sure we go through and cover this one. This is a very common technique that attackers use. And like I said, one of the benefits of that is the compromised system is never seen communicating to the C2 server out on the internet. It funnels all of its queries through the local DNS resolver. How does this work? Okay, as an attacker, here's what I do. The first thing I do is I register some domain name, like evil.com, you know, use that as a placeholder. I register some domain name. And then what I do is I define my command and control server as being the authoritative DNS server for my domain. So now anybody on the internet who wants to resolve something with an evil.com, they're gonna come to my command and control server. And for most people out on the internet, any queries that come in, this will act like a normal DNS server. You won't see any difference. 
What makes it different is it looks for specific types of queries. And if it sees those, it handles those as if it's a, com a compromised system trying to call home. So here's how it works. So the system gets compromised. It wants to talk to the command and control server. So what it does is it sends a query to the local DNS server that says, hey, look up this information for me. My local resolver checks its cache to see, have I looked that question up before? No, I haven't. Okay, I got to go out to the internet and find an answer to that. So to go out to the authoritative name servers, find out where the .com servers are, go talk to the .com servers, and the .com servers will tell it, hey, for evil.com, this is the authoritative system you need to talk to. Now our DNS resolver talks to that command and control server and asks this question. This question is coded to basically tell the command and control server, this system is checking in to see if there's any commands in the queue for it. The answer that comes back is either going to be, nope, go back to sleep, there's no commands in your queue, or execute this particular command. That's what's going to get encoded on what comes back. In this case here, it's saying, hey, what's the text record for this? One of the things I see folks do is they'll go in and they'll, um, <laughs> they'll go in and they'll look for text queries against remote domains, thinking they'll catch all C2 that way. It, you'll catch some, not all. I have seen, uh, in fact, the advanced class, one of the things we do is I have them go through and do an analysis on a C2 channel to see what type of queries were being done. And I almost evenly break out, you know, one third of them were text, but one third of them were MX records and one third of them were C names. Like they could use any one of the three equally, no problem for this particular tool. Um, but yeah, I've seen MX in the wild, I've seen C names, um, I've seen DKIM used. DKIM is the one that kind of caught my attention because DKIM is a security protocol. It's designed to let our server validate that this system is actually authoritative for evil.com. That's what DKIM was designed for. You know, let's make for a secure DNS query. And the attackers leverage that to be able to use it as a command and control channel. In other words, what comes back is not a private key, it's actually an encoded command and control channel telling the compromised system what it needs to do. Um, I thought that was kind of inventive. Um, I've seen quad A queries used. The 128 bits of a IPv6 address is enough information to hide a covert communication channel in. So you can't just, I use text records here as an example, but you can't just look for text records. These could, like I said, there could be a number of other different query types. And we'll talk about how to go in and find these in just a little bit. But the end result is I'm effectively tunneling all of my traffic through DNS over to the command and control server. Now, one of the side effects of C2 over DNS is this query has to change each time. What if the system was told go back to sleep, so it sleeps for 10 seconds, and now it wants to check into its work queue again, and it asks exactly the same question? Well, now when that question get, query gets to the resolver, the resolver says, oh, hey, I've got that answer in cache. Here you go. And the connection never makes it all the way out to the command and control server. So there might be a command in the queue and it'll never see it because it's now the resolver responding. Well, Chris, couldn't they just set a, a very low TTL on all of their answers? Yeah, they could. And then this resolver could override that. One of the, you know, back when I used to manage DNS, I used to set a minimum TTL time of 10 minutes. Rather than having lots of DNS queries pass over my link all the time, I just say, yeah, regardless of what the TTL is set for within this uh, DNS query, minimum minimum time we're going to save that information is 10 minutes, maximum is five days. Anything it wants to set inside of that window, that's fine. But if it tries to set it lower or higher than that window, pull it into the window. And attackers know that could potentially happen. So the only way to consistently make sure they don't get caught in cache, change the query each time. Well, that creates an interesting quandary. How many fully qualified domain names does it make sense for a domain to expose to people on the internet and make resolvable? In other words, how many resolvable hosts are you gonna have? For most environments, that number is pretty small. Think about your environment, what are you gonna have? You're gonna have a web server, a mail server, some DNS servers, maybe a customer portal, and you know, hey look, we're still counting on one tiny hand. <laughs> you know? In other words, that's like less than five. 
So you can say for most environments, 10 or less is going to be common. All right, what if you're an Amazon or an Akamai or something like that? Some well-known name that everybody will recognize. I'm sure when I say Microsoft or Akamai, you don't have to ask me what that company does. You know, they're big internet service companies. They might have a couple hundred, right? You might resolve a couple hundred hosts within that domain. Once you get into a thousand though, that's when it gets kind of weird. So if I see a domain I don't recognize, and I see dozens of different host names being queried, that's kind of suspicious. If I see a big service provider I do recognize, and I see thousands of different names being queried, that's when that becomes suspicious to me. So we do have some methodologies for tagging this, and I will actually dig into this more as we go through. Another possibility, is rather than having the compromise system connect to the C2 server directly, you take the C2 server and you put it behind a content delivery network like Akamai. Akamai, that's their primary job, content delivery, and they do it for a lot of big companies. So the concept is when this system wants, to, let's call this a web server for now, just to use a normal example. So let's say someone has a web server and they put it behind a CDN network. When this system wants to connect to that web server, when they do the DNS lookup, the IP address that comes back is not the actual web server itself. It is an IP address within the content delivery network that is logically close to them on the internet and hopefully may already have that information in cache. So that means that it only needs to connect here and get that data back and it runs a whole lot faster. This is why most of us use CDN networks for our websites, right? Faster delivery, it hides our IP, there's a lot of different benefits. Well, many of those benefits are also applicable if I'm running a C2 server. So I've got a C2 server here. You only see these IP addresses of the CDN network. You'd never see the IP address of the actual command and control server itself. That's problem number one. Problem number two, this content delivery network is probably servicing legitimate uh, domains like Microsoft. So sometimes the connection coming into here is, hang on just a second. Sorry, I got to take a break for just a sec. I'll be right back. I apologize about that, folks, sorry. Okay, so I take my command and control server and I put it behind a CDN network. What benefit is that to that? And like I said, one of the benefits is if this militia, if this syst compromised system gets detected, you never actually see the real IP address of the C2 server. The other benefit is that the CDN network is going to offer up multiple hosts to connect to when anybody tries to get to this system. So rather than having a beacon signal going from one IP address to another, that beacon signal is actually running across multiple IPs. So I need a way to kind of collapse them down to do a real analysis of that session. The other problem is, like I said, legitimate sites like Microsoft are going to use the CDN network as well. That's going to get mixed in with this. So Sometimes this traffic going to this CDN server is going to Microsoft. Sometimes it's going to the C2 server itself. If I'm only analyzing IP addresses, yeah, I can't tell the difference between the two. This is a great way to stealth the C2 server. And this methodology, from what I've seen, most commercial tools cannot deal with. Meaning that if an attacker does this in your environment, they have no methodology for being able to detect this. How do you detect this? What you need to do is to look at what domain was the user trying to get to in that IP address. In other words, you get a, it goes back to those DNS queries we talked about that are really important. 
So, <laughs> oh, Jess, <laughs> some of your comments are a riot. <laughs> so it comes back to that fully qualified domain name. We need to analyze that. That's going to tell us what, you know, in other words, if they're trying to get to foo.evil.com, let's say that's the name of our C2 server, that's getting broken up over multiple IPs. Well, if we do our beacon analysis, not to each of the three individual IPs, but to that fully qualified domain name, well, that effectively collapses those three IPs down into one, right? Now we're back to being able to analyze that beacon signal. Well, what about the Microsoft traffic that mixed in, mixed in here as well, Chris? Well, for the Microsoft traffic, it's trying to get to Microsoft, so we would ignore that session. We'd only look at the session when it's trying to get to foo.evil.com. So, in order to detect beacons that are hiding on the other side of a C2, uh, excuse me, that are hiding on the other side of a CDN network, I need to look at source IP to fully qualified domain name instead of IP address. If I do that analysis, that strips out the legitimate traffic, that collapses down the multiple IPs and back to being able to do a decent analysis again. Uh, I mentioned there's not many commercial servers that do that, that I'm aware of. Uh, Rita, <laughs> uh, actually Rita, I don't think does yet. We're about to add that in there. The code is there, we just haven't turned it on yet. Um, so that will be available in our free open source tool soon. It's already in our commercial product. Now, when we talk about detecting beacons, there's actually a couple, two different ways we can detect beacons or we can do an analysis to figure out if something is acting like a beacon. And the one I've been using has been talking about time, based on timing, right? I've been saying every 30 seconds it calls home and does this, because that's kind of the easiest one to understand. Most commercial tools use an algorithm called k-means clustering to detect beacon activity. What's k-means? Well, you can do a search on it, there's a wiki on it, but effectively what K means as far is it's a math algorithm that's, de uh, that's designed to find repetitive patterns within a large data set. So for example, we had a million connections go out to the internet yesterday, but buried in all of those connections is one internal IP talking to one external IP every 30 seconds, and it's doing it 24 hours a day. Well, k-means will look at that and say, hey, that's a repetitive pattern. That's something you need to pay attention to. So that's why they'll go in and they'll use k-means. They go in and do beacon detection. So again, if you're looking at a commercial product, look to you know, ask if they don't say, do you use k-means? And if they say yes, be afraid. Because here's the problem. If you're relying on k-means to detect beacons, that fails as soon as you jitter the connection. So let's say instead of calling home once per minute, let's say I call home once per minute plus or minus 50%. So my dwell time might be as short as 30 seconds, it might be as long as 90 seconds. K-means will look at that and say, well, that's not a repetitive pattern, it's changing. Therefore, I'm going to ignore that and not detect it. So any threat hunting tool that's relying on K-means to try and detect things, needs to fall back on a signature to detect it at that point. We already talked about signatures. Sometimes they get stealthy. Sometimes they say, oh, our AI goes and looks for it. Yeah, what's their AI? Their AI is just friggin' signature matching and that's it. But they give it a spiffier name that sounds better and it's, you know, and if I tell you I'm Pat, I'm signature matching, how much money will you give me versus if I say, oh, it's AI going in and looking for it. Ooh, AI, yeah, that's worth more money, right? Let me open up my pocketbook for that one. But if they're relying on k-means, they got to fall back on signature matching anytime jitter's being used. And for me personally, at least the last two, probably the last three years, every attack that I've been brought in on, the C2 channel has been jittered. So anything trying to use k-means to detect it would not be able to detect it. You know, again, that you work maybe, you know, five, 10 years ago. It doesn't work anymore. You can't use k-means. So jittering bad, you know, or jittering bad if you're trying to combine it with k-means. They need to be doing something better than that. So again, that repetitive dwell time. What, one of the nice things about looking at large data sets is that you can then go in and start combining things. You know, so we've got like 30 different patterns on the way you can go in and do beacon detection. And part of the reason why we did so many patterns 
was to make sure that we could continue to, uh, they continue to be uh, implemented in open source tools. Not just ours, if other folks want to do it and theirs too, that's fine, we have no problem with that. What we didn't want to have happen was to have these advanced detection techniques rolled into a commercial tool and then put behind a paywall and now most people can't get access to it. So our, our 30 different patents, yeah, you can go in and use it and so long as you're not trying to put it in your commercial product, if you want to make it available to everybody on the internet, hey, we're totally good with that. Now, one of the ways, uh, one of the nice things about large data sets is even with jitter, you can still go in and normalize that jitter out if you have a large enough data center, it's a data size. So for example, I mentioned going off once per minute plus or minus 50%. So now my dwell time might be as short as 30 seconds as long as 90 seconds. Well, because random isn't as random as you think, and we're gonna go off more towards the middle than we are either extreme, it's still gonna go off about 60 times every hour, right? Once per minute, plus or minus, for, you know, so for every time I get a 30 second, I'll probably get a 90 second, that's gonna normalize out to that 60 second period of time. So I'll still see about 60 beacons every hour. I'll still see about 120 beacons every two hours. So if I've got 24 hours worth of data, I can, I can go through and um, average out my data in two hour blocks, and now if I still get a flat line, yeah, even with jitter, that means I get a beacon. I got persistency of connection. That's something I need to go in and pay attention to. And I tell you what, um, I ran us a little bit over. I apologize for that. Um, but let's go in and take a break. So it is, uh, let's see, we'll see, we're looking at six minutes past the top of the hour. So I'm going to pick an odd number and say it's 16 minutes after the top of the hour. We'll pick up from here and keep going. Uh, there's a couple of questions in the Discord. I'll go through and, uh, and jump on those once we come back. So I'll see everybody in about 10 minutes. All right, you're back. So I had a couple of questions around um, C2 over DNS, or actually C2 over uh, fully qualified domain name. Uh, one of them was, you know, have, we, have I seen folks using multiple C2 servers to try and reduce down, you know, the visibility? Um, in theory, it's possible. In practice, I have not personally seen it. Um, I've seen folks kind of toss that out as a, oh, hey, this will make it harder to detect C2. And yeah, they're right. But I haven't seen attackers bother to do that. You know, it, it's kind of like um, if what you're doing is working, why bother upping your game, right? You know, why bother trying harder? Why bother investing in that? Especially since time is not infinite. If the problem they're having is getting malware on your system and not getting detected by your endpoint software, spending time on the C2 makes no sense, right? Hey, Chris. Yes. Hey, I'm sitting in and listening because sometimes I've got to go to school as well. Um, <laughs> <laughs> hey, folks, I'm John Strand. Um, uh, Chris actually kind of got me into security, but I, I, I hate to do this to you, Chris, but you're wrong. Okay, that. go for it. What have you seen, dude? Um, um, Mubix. Remember Mubix in Egypt? Uh, they were on a pen test and they actually set up a uh, kind of domain fronting that was rotating the C2 through multiple IP addresses. Um, and uh, as Chris has mentioned, BHI, my cat comes down as soon as I start talking. Yes, go outside. Um, as soon as our testers are on an engagement where they're running against AC Hunter or Rita, they actually take a lot of pride in trying to bypass it. So Mubix and Egypt did because they were doing domain fronting where the IP addresses were shifting. So it's kind of like your, your fast flux technique. And what we added in was beaconing by fully qualified domain. So like I said, I called out Chris and said he's wrong. He's not really. But what yeah. they do is you have a domain that basically is fronted with multiple IP addresses. And almost any product that's out there loses the plot as soon as you start rotating through multiple different IP addresses. So we modified the tool and that's why we do the beaconing by fully qualified domain name. So sorry for interrupting Chris, but um, but yeah, you actually added, you're the one that added that into the tool, Chris. <laughs> learned it from you, man. <laughs> Hey, so uh, since you're here, John, um, something I learned recently, which I kind of got a kick out of, Shoot. is I am not the first author in my family. 
So this is Edward Pelham Brenton wrote this back in 1820 to cover the great historical British <laughs> naval battles that took place at the time. Oh my God. Did you, like, where did you find that? Uh, this came out of Harvard's library. So, uh, not only that, but you got family published in Harvard. So yeah, that's, that's, yeah, that's yeah, that's it. yeah, my family that was in the wrong side of the Revolutionary War, but we won't go there right now. Hey, but they're published, so that's what matters. <laughs> yeah, okay. All right. Well, like I said, uh, for all of you that are here listening, I, I, I like I learned from Chris. I'm still learning from Chris, and yeah, I still come into these sessions as well. So okay. take it away, sir. I'm going to go back to eating lunch while you talk. Awesome. Thanks, dude. So yeah, as, as John said, you know, we talked about um, by fully qualified domain name, but as far as like a, a completely different set of C2 servers, yeah, it's possible, but um, it's not something that I've ever actually seen take place in the wild. So, uh, so luckily you should not have to worry about that unless you're like a three letter government agency and have the worst of the worst coming after you. Uh, let's see, and I think that was it for the big questions that I saw. Um, how does the attacker break up the commands against a CDN? So they don't have to. So the CDN actually takes care of changing up the, the IP address that the compromised system would be talking to as part of their hunting algorithm. So the attacker doesn't need to do anything. All they need to do is register for the service and the CDN helps hide them. Uh, but again, if we go targeting source IP to fully qualified domain name, that helps to neutralize that type of thing. Cool. So we were talking about beacons based on timing. And I was talking about, you know, jitter and how uh, that defeats k-means and things of that nature. There's a couple of different ways we can kind of carve the timing up. You looked at a chart earlier where we were kind of plotting out over the course of the day, how many times was, was the connection taking place each hour. Another way you could look at it is you could say, let me look at the deltas between each connection and how often am I seeing each delta time frame? So that's what this chart is showing here. So this says a connection time deltas with no jitter. What does that mean? This means that all of my connections are taking place at one second intervals. So there's exactly one second between them. If it was jittering, I might see them spread out over multiple time intervals like you see here. So here what we're saying is most of the time the connection was 28, uh, there was a 28 or a 29 second delay between connections. But sometimes there was 27 and 30, and every now and then there was a 31 second delay. This is jitter. So to recap, no jitter in a connection. This is a constant beacon going off at a fixed time interval. This is jitter. Let's vary the delta time between those connections a bit. And again, the reason for doing this is to go through and defeat anything trying to use k-means. So if I'm relying on k-means to find beacons and there's jitter involved, now I am have to fall back on pattern matching. And if I'm smart, I will call it artificial intelligence because you'll pay more money than that than you would if I just said, hey, we'll go in and do some simple pattern matching. What about this one? This one is probably one of the most coolest C2 channels I've seen. Because notice it's jittering, but it's not the classic bell curve that you get anytime somebody uses cobalt strike. Somebody put some real time into trying to randomize this as much as possible. But if you think about this, my shortest time is five seconds. My longest time is uh, 45 seconds. Well, that means I've got a middle somewhere around the 30 second time interval. If I bucket these in a one hour, two hour buckets like we talked about, it's still going to normalize that out to about a 30 second interval. So the fact that sometimes it's low, sometimes it's high will normalize the outcome in towards the middle. And now it becomes very clear if I plot this over time that, yeah, this looks like it's a beacon. It's jittering, which means it's more likely to be suspicious, but it's definitely something I need to go in and pay attention to. Now that's timing. I can also go in and look for beacons based on session size. You know, if you think about like most things that might talk on a repetitive basis, like email, right? So your mail client is going to go connect to a mail server on a regular basis. So how do I tell the difference between something using uh, Gmail as a command and control server 
versus someone that's just checking their Gmail to see if they have any mail? And the answer is session size analysis. In other words, you can't check the timing, right? So GCAT is a tool that will use Gmail as a command and control server. And the concept is G, uh, GCAT will check into a specific email um, address on Google servers to see, is there any mail for me? And if there's any mail, that mail is executed as command and control orders. It's a pretty inventive idea. Because if I've got other people checking into Gmail and this thing's checking into Gmail, well, that's all mixed together. So how do I tell the difference? And the answer is it comes down to session size. When you look at your average business account, they're going to get about, a, they're going to send and receive about 113 messages a day. You know, if you go through your sent <laughs> and you received, you'll see, yeah, you're probably in about that range. You know, somewhere between 100, 130, it averages out to about 113. Um, but most folks are sending and receiving about that many messages a day, either directly or because they're part of a certain group or whatever the case may be. All of those messages tend to be different sizes because sometimes we'll send like one or two words, sometimes there's an attachment, each email will be a different size. When something is command and control, it's always the same size unless it gets activated. So if I see something talking to Gmail, and there may be days where nothing goes back and forth. That's either someone no one ever wants to talk to who's not part of any of our business groups, or that's a potential command and control channel. So analyzing that session size can help me figure that out. The other cool thing about doing a session size analysis is you can actually identify beacon activation. So, <laughs> So one of the things we're starting to see folks push, and by folks, I mean vendors. Um, one of the things we're starting to see vendors push are proxies. So they've sold you all this network gear and made hundreds of thousands of dollars off of you, but that's not enough. The latest thing they want to sell you is a box that all of your clients TLS connect to that strips off the TLS, analyzes the data stream, and then re-encrypts it in TLS and sends it off to where it wanted to go. So it basically, it's acting as an intercept proxy. And in theory, it sounds good, right? Oh, hey, strip it off and we'll look inside and look to see if there's any command and control. Well, read between the lines. <laughs> what are they saying? We're gonna strip away the TLS so we can pattern match and look for attacks that have taken place in the past. Well, as we already talked about, threat hunting needs to innovate. We can't rely on five, 10 years ago, whatever. Those attacks don't come back. You know, we haven't seen sunburst pop up again. They're off doing something else and different today, right? So pattern matching doesn't work. Problem number two, at least for the last two years that I've seen, attackers have gotten savvy enough to encrypt their data and then wrap a TLS tunnel around it. Well, if you're running an intercept proxy and the intercept proxy strips off the TLS, what does it say? It sees ciphertext. Go ahead and try and pattern match on ciphertext. What are you going to find? Nothing, right? It's still ciphertext. So that in theory, it sounds like it really is worth spending the $75,000 or whatever the vendor wants to charge you for that intercept proxy. But when you look at it from the application of reality, it isn't going to do anything for you except put a bigger hole in your pocket. Now, with that said, there are some things we can do for free that'll help us analyze what goes on with that session. Notice this chart. So this chart has a heartbeat identified. What's the heartbeat? The heartbeat is that checking in to say, hey, do you have anything for me to do? No, go back to sleep. So if I'm calling home, let's say once per minute to a C2 server, a majority of the time when it checks in, there's not gonna be any commands in the queue. So this is the amount of data well, let's call that 89 bytes based on the scale that we have here. We'll call it 90. That's a nice round number. So 90 bytes of data goes back and forth when the compromised system checks in to say, is there anything in my work queue? No, there's not. I will go back to sleep. Notice I've got three other data points here. What does that mean? That means the system checked in and said, is there something for me to do? And the answer was not, no, go back to sleep. The answer was something different. Whatever that difference was, that resulted in a larger amount of data getting transferred. In other words, by analyzing session size, 
we can identify when was when and if the C2 server was activated. Let's go down that rabbit hole a little bit here. So we see three instances of activation here. If I look at this scale, my largest data transfer, let's just call it around number 300 bytes, was 300 bytes of data. And let's say this is a server that has all of our customer information sitting inside of a you know, one gig database. And our boss comes to us and says, did our customer data leak out? What do we tell them? To me, I would feel very confident telling them no, they didn't get our customer data yet. It, we kicked them out before that happened. How do I know that? I know that because 300 bytes of data was the maximum data transfer that took place. I have a one gig database. If we zip it up, maybe it just compresses down to 500 meg. Unless I see a 500 meg data transfer, I know they didn't get the database yet. 300 bytes, what can you do with that? You can password guess against accounts. You can go off and maybe do some minor probing around the environment to see what's going on. In other words, what this is telling me without seeing the data, because it's a double encrypted, I don't need to. What this is telling me is this is an attacker that's still in exploratory mode. They haven't found what they're looking for. Kick them out now, we're in good shape. So session size analysis does two things for us. One is it helps us identify beacons by looking for that consistency of session size being transferred over and over again. But it also helps us identify activation. And we can even enumerate what the attacker may be doing. Now, we don't know exactly. I don't know exactly what probing was being done on that system at that time. But you know what? If I'm, if I'm using Sysmon to record application execution, I can now go back to that tool and see what did the attacker run on the command line during that time? And that will tell me what probing they were going in and doing. Even though their command and control session is double encrypted, we can still tear into it enough to get a good idea of what's going on in the network. This to me is kind of awesome stuff. Uh, Geek Oil, awesome name by the way, added in. And sometimes SSL interception breaks things. Yeah, totally, totally. It adds in maintenance, it adds in overhead, and it isn't gonna help you. There's other processes you can do that, you know, bad for the vendor, it doesn't give them more money, but good for you, it can give you better visibility into what's going on in the environment. So can we do that type of session size analysis with Zeek? Yeah, actually we can. So here I'm catting con.log. So remember con.log is that log that records all the sessions that go back and forth. And then I'm using, in this case here, I'm using BroCut. Bro, so Bro and Zeek are the same tool. It used to be called Bro, it's now called Zeek. This simply means I haven't updated this slide yet. I need to make a note of that so that I go through and update that. But there's a note. So uh, Bro cut, Z cut, do the same thing. Grab the source IP, the destination IP. Original bytes is how much data did the client send to the server? How much data did my internal system send to this host out on the internet? And you can see here, it was consistently 546 bytes. I have one line entry here. Notice we've got a dash. Remember what dash means? Dash means it tried to connect and it couldn't. The, what happened there? Maybe this command and control server is managing multiple compromised systems and it couldn't accept a connection at this point. So one of the times that our compromised system tried to call home, it just couldn't connect. That's what that means. But when it could connect, it sent the same amount of data each time. That tells me they haven't actually activated this yet. Kick them out now, and we've got them out before they've actually done anything bad. There seems to be some disturbance with the audio. Yes, just like there's a disturbance in the force. Um, I don't know, they may be kind of cut in, cut out. I don't know if it's on my end, if it's on the go to meeting side or whatever. Uh, yeah, it's gone uh, secret robot in the basement. <laughs> it could be. Uh, it was my game machine a little bit earlier, but I did shut that off. That does put like a little bit of a hum in the background. So detecting beacons with jitter, I talked about this. Large data sets is your key. Large data sets, normalize out that data, look at it in like one hour blocks, that's gonna normalize out a lot of that jitter and make it a whole lot easier to find. Once we do that, once we identify connection persistency, 
like I said, one of the next things we may want to go in and take a look at is business need, right? And this needs a person. I saw somebody make this comment in Discord where you're never going to automate all of this. And I 100% agree with that, con that comment because sometimes context matters. And this one is a great example of that. So here I have an internal system that's talking to a host out on the internet that looked up client.teamviewer.com before it made each of these connections. So this is probably an internal server running TeamViewer, which means it can be remotely managed across the internet. Is that good or bad? Well, it depends, right? Do we know TeamViewer is there? Did we put it there on purpose? If we did, that's okay. If we didn't, warning Will Robinson, this is something we need to go in and pay attention to. Uh, one of the things I get a kick up is when we go in and we do a compromise assessment, you know, one of the things we'll usually ask is, are you running TeamViewer? And typically what'll happen is they'll come back and say, yes, we're running TeamViewer on these two servers. And what we will find is about 14 different systems that are taught that have TeamViewer running on them. Well, in that context, in two instances, TeamViewer good, right? But 12 instances, TeamViewer bad, even though it's the exact same traffic on the network. It all comes down to business need. So at the end of the day, that's a lot of what we really need to go down and run down on this. Potential false positives. So what I mean by false positives is there is connection persistency, but there's a business need behind it. We talked about network time protocol, right? Any of your computers should be doing some form of time sync. They're going to be talking to what hopefully is a known time sync server. So any persistent connections you see going to that time sync server, those are going to be okay, right? So I, I labeled it here as a false positive, but that's a little bit of a misnomer. It is in fact persistency of connection. You know, that's not a false positive. What makes it a false positive is there is actually a business need there for it. So we'd want to create an exception for that so that that doesn't appear in later hunts. Part of our threat hunt process is to go through and validate these connections. And when we validate it, when we say, yes, there's a business need for it, we want to have a way to remove that from future hunts. So if I go in and let's say I've got all my Windows systems call home to Windows notification servers, well, I don't want to see that every time I do a threat hunt, right? So the first time I find that, I create a way to create an exception for that that basically says, hey, anytime you see my Windows systems talking to a Windows notification server, pull that information out of the data. I don't need to see that again. And now my threat hunt report that I need to review becomes shorter and shorter each time. Each time I tag persistency and I'm able to apply a business need to it, I can go through and make that process take less and less time each time. So the first time you threat hunt your network, it might take you four or five days to go through one day's worth of data. But the next time, it'll probably only take you two days. And the next time after that, it'll probably only take you four to six hours. And then after that, you may only be uh, paying attention when something changes its behavior. There's a new persistency set up that you've never actually seen in the past. That makes it, uh, that means our first threat hunt might be kind of time consuming, but it takes less and less time as it goes along. All right. So talked about connection persistency. Now what we want to get into is other things to kind of go in and look for. Like we find that connection persistency, what are some of the other things we may want to pay attention to? And one of the most obvious is remote desktop, right? If we see an internal system using a remote desktop protocol and we don't expect that to be there, that's something that's certainly worth going in and paying attention to. Um, unknown app on a standard port. What do I mean by that? I mean that if it's, TC, if it's traffic going to TCP port 80, I expect that to be HTTP traffic. If it's anything else but, that may be somebody trying to tunnel data out of my environment. The most common one you see is TCP 443, what's normally used for HTTPS traffic and you know, secured HTTP. And what attackers will do is they will just go through and obfuscate their data and shovel it through their port, that port. 
their thought process is, well, that port is normally used by SSL TLS to encrypt data. And since it's encrypted, you can't read it anyway. So nobody's going to pattern match on it. So if I've just scrambled up my data, it kind of looks encrypted. Nobody will be able to tell the difference. Well, and when you get into the ciphertext portion of it, that may be so. But when you talk about SSL TLS, there's a formal handshake that takes place. Right, the client should send its SSL hello packet. The server should send its SSL hello packet. The server should send its digital certificate. And then we go into our encrypted session. So if you don't see those hello packets going by on the digital certificate at the beginning of the session, that's not a secure HTTP session. That's something else. That's worth paying attention to. Because again, it may be an indicator of somebody trying to tunnel traffic. What I'm not talking about is a well-known application running on a non-standard port. For example, you decide you want to run SSH on port 2222. A lot of folks do stuff like that. I do. You know, it's not, it, and the reason for that is so many script kitties are banging away at port TCP 22 all the time, the well-known port for SSH. You move it to a non-standard port, then you don't have to look at all the people coming by knocking at the door. You still have to secure SSH. You still want to lock it down, root can't get in remotely, use public private keys, all that stuff still matters. The only thing this does for you is now you don't have all that script kitty data filling up your logs and getting in the way. The only stuff that shows up is the stuff you need to pay attention to, which is, hey, they found my SSH server on port 2222 and then tried to log in. I need to pay attention to that one now. Now, what's kind of cool about Zeek is Zeek recognizes about 55 different applications. So I talked about, you know, hey, if it's going out TCP 443, it should be HTTPS traffic. Zeek will label that as an SSL session. And it doesn't matter if it's using SSL or TLS, it just uses that SSL label consistently. So if I see traffic going out TCP 443 and Zeek does not label it as SSL, that's something I need to go in and pay attention to. This is one of the things I really love about Zeek, is that when Zeek labels a connection, it's not because it was just using that well-known port. In other words, most firewalls will tell you, oh, hey, this user used HTTP to get to this server. And the web server isn't actually looking at it to see, well, was that HTTP traffic? It's just saying, well, they went to TCP 80, and most things used in TCP 80 is HTTP, so that must have been HTTP traffic. Well, no, I could be tunneling SSH sessions through that. You wouldn't be able to tell the difference, right? So most firewalls do not do their homework. They just, you know, assume you're using whatever is the well-known protocol for that port. Zeek is different. Zeek will go in and say, I don't care that it went to TCP 80. I am going to start going through each of my analyzers to see if I can recognize that protocol. And if it if the HTTP analyzer matches, great, I'll label it as HTTP. But if the SSH analyzer matches, I'm going to tell you, hey, that traffic going to TCP port 80 is actually SSH traffic. Again, what we're looking for here is potential cases of tunneling. I see less tunneling today than I saw a number of years ago. Because now what they do is they ciphertext it and then they go through and they wrap another TLS session around it anyway, just to make it that much harder for you to be able to pull it apart and try and figure out what's going on inside. So you don't see as much tunneling today. I'm less worried about this, but it's not a bad idea to keep a lookout for it. The other thing you can run into is bending of the protocol rules, meaning that they're not actually breaking anything, they're not breaking any rules, but they're bending them in a way that allows them to, you know, do whatever their potential nefarious activity is. Tunneling C2 traffic over DNS is a great example of that. All of those DNS packets are fully DNS compliant. They're not breaking any RFCs but they're bending the rules in a way that allows them to go through and tunnel traffic through it. How do you identify HTTP traffic? Do you just look for headers or something? Yes, to would. Absolutely. HTTP has a very standard way of going in and starting its communication session. You can simply go in and just pattern match on that. Now, as a, an example of bending the rules, I talked about this one already too many fully qualified domain names, 
right? That's not breaking any RFCs. There's no RFCs identifying what's the most number of hosts you can have. So we, we're not breaking anything, but logic kind of dictates that most unknown domains are probably gonna have like a dozen host names they expose to the internet or less. For these well-known ones listed here, they might have a couple hundred. Anything above those thresholds, that now becomes something worth going in and paying attention to. So one of our uh, first possibilities of going in and trying to detect C2 over DNS is just simply looking at how many unique queries are we sending to each domain? And if the number of unique, now not individual queries, right? If we look up www.google.com a thousand times in a day, who cares? That we don't count that as a thousand. We only count that as one. It's one unique query. We just happen to make it multiple times. What would make it multiple queries is if we looked up www.google.com and then www.one.google.com and www.two.com and so on and so on. We're looking at unique queries. That's what we want to go in and pay attention to. Because anything that's C2 running over DNS is going to have an excessively high number of unique queries that take place. So how can we count them? I'm gonna high level cover this script because there's actually some better ways to do this that we're gonna go through and cover. But I wanted this command in here just for in case folks wanted to go and play around with it. Basically what this command does is we're using T Shark in this case here to read a PCAP file. Now I could also do the same thing with Zeek logs if I wanted to go in and do that. But what I'm using is T Shark's ability to carve out specific fields to pull out the DNS query name that somebody looked up. Hey, what was the user trying to get to? Then what I do is, I, and actually this shows it a little bit better, I take the query that they, they tried and then I reverse it. I turn it backwards. And then I go in and I define a period as being a column delimiter. And I say, I'm only interested in the first two columns because that's gonna give me what domain was it they were trying to get to. And then I go back and I switch it back around. And then I go in and simply add up how many times did we send each of those queries to that domain. So this is kind of a command line way to go through and add this up. But to be honest, it's a whole lot easier to do this with Rita because Rita goes in and does all of this work for you. So when we get into doing the actual labs, we're gonna go in and do this using Rita. But one of the other things I can do is I can look at this from a utilization perspective. Think about how DNS normally works right? User types a name in the browser. Browser um, uses DNS to resolve that to an IP address. And then that system connects up to that IP address, right? That's what we expect to say. Well, we already said those resource records that are being queried as part of C2 over DNS, that isn't the system trying to connect to an IP. It's trying to use DNS as just a simple covert communication channel. So one of the side effects is you end up in a situation where no one actually ends up using that data. Let me give you an example. So here we're seeing that in this particular environment, over a 24-hour period of time, we queried 125 unique resources within AkaDNS.net. AkaDNS.net is part of Akamai. We did almost 14,000 queries total, but we don't care about that. What we care about is this one here, 125. 125 unique queries, uh, uh, resources were queried. Now it's Akamai. Akamai is the global CDN provider. So the fact that we needed to look up 125 unique fully qualified domain names, that's not really a surprise. Now over on the right, what this is telling us is that we had three internal systems that did all of these DNS queries. Well, if these three DNS servers are our internal resolvers, that makes perfect sense, right? And then we had 13 systems that then connected to one or more of those 125 systems. So remember what I said normal was, you type a name in the browser, your DNS server resolves it to an IP address, you connect to that IP address. That's what we're looking at here. We looked up a record, got back an IP, and each of my 13 systems connected to each of those IP addresses as they went through. This is what normal DNS traffic behavior looks like. 
If it's C2 over DNS, this changes. What you'll notice is that your DNS servers are the only thing that ever connects to that domain. In other words, they'll do, <laughs> they'll look up 62,468 unique resource records, but none of your desktops ever go to that domain. Oh, wait a minute. If none of my users actually needed to access any resources in that domain, why did I need to look up 62,468 unique resource records? And the only logical conclusion, because it's a C2 channel. This is abnormal behavior. So this is the other thing we can go in and look for. So remember I said that Zeek is really good for logging DNS stuff. And this is one of the things I love about it. Because if you go into a DNS server and turn on logging, you'll a lot of times you get the queries that the users are sending out. You don't get to get the answers back. Sometimes it's helpful to have those answers because then you can go and match the answers to say, okay, this user got back this IP address. Did they connect to it? Because if they didn't and nobody is, yeah, that could be C2 over DNS. That could be something that's worth going in and paying attention to. Some of the other things we can do is look for unique user agent strings. You know, if it's unique, that may be software running on that one system versus, you know, your standardized build. That may make it worth paying attention to. I mentioned this is a minor for me. What's more interesting to me is does this system sometimes identify itself as being like a Windows 10 system, but in one unique case with one IP address on the internet and that's it, it calls itself a Windows NT system. That would make it interesting to me. Now, it could be somebody running a VM, but more than likely, it's just malware calling home to its command and control server. <laughs> you can also look at the unique way TLS or SSL is negotiated. Because again, if everybody's running Chrome and they're running the same version of the desktop software, the way they connect out and generate a TLS or an SSL session should always be the same. Actually, let's say they, they should be creating a TLS2 session, right? Or 1.2. That's what we want to see them do. We don't want to see them using SSL. That would be bad. But everybody should be negotiating TLS the same way. If I have a system that's different, that's an indicator of potentially software running on that system that isn't running on anybody else. That may be worth paying attention to. And again, this one is a minor modifier for me as well. You know, unique happens. So I'm more likely to get a false positive. I'm not going to freak out over this. Um, but it's worth, you know, at least making a note of it if you see it. So we've gone in and we've identified persistency of connection. And maybe we've seen something weird with the protocol. Maybe we haven't. What would we do next? The next thing is to go off and do some research, right? So like I said, if my Windows system is connecting out to an IP address and it's doing it all day long, and it tried to look up a Windows notification server within Microsoft.com before it connected to the IP address that came back as that answer. And that IP address has a digital valid digital certificate for a Windows notification server within Microsoft.com. I know I'm good. This is expected business behavior, create an exception for it. We don't need to look at it again. So this investigation work of that external IP helps me figure out, is there an actual business need here? Now, we can use Threat Intel to see if we get any matches across that. Like I said, I'm not a big Threat Intel fan. Uh, I'm not one to go through and, and like freak out anytime I get a match on a Threat Intel. One of the things you can do is if you get a Threat Intel match, go in and look at how much data did the client actually send to that system. That's important. Because think about the classic false positive, right? So somebody had a server, they spun up an EC2 and it was a command and control server, and then they shut it down and some legitimate website now starts using that IP address. So when you get a threat Intel match, it's actually a false positive. It's a user trying to connect to a new server that's now there, a legitimate website, not the old C2 server that has long since gone away. How can you tell the difference? And the answer is the amount of data the client sending to the server. Let's take worst case scenario, HTTPS. What data does a client send to a server as part of an HTTPS session? Well, I already talked about some of this, right? The client sends its SSL hello packet. And then once that commu secure communication channel is established, it sends its user agent string. 
and it sends any URIs for the data that it wants to request off of that system. That's it. That's not much data. So if I get a threat intel match and I look and see that that client sent, I don't know, 200 bytes of data to that server, don't worry about that. <laughs> That's a false positive. Don't go any further down the rabbit hole. It's not even worth it. Now, what if I do that analysis and I see the client sent 50 megabytes to that server? Well, uh, my SSL hello packet and my URIs and user agent strings should not add up to 50 megabytes. You know, they're going to be way, way smaller than that. In that case, yeah, that now becomes something that worth paying attention to. So if you're using Threat Intel, it's worth it to go through and spend a little extra time. Now, once we kind of look at the external system and learn what we can, we then want to turn to the internal system and look at that. We were looking at examples of mapping what all of our applications are doing on the network. How easy, hard this is depends on your environment. Some sites are really good at logging what their internal systems are doing. Some have almost no visibility at all. Like I said, a great test is contact the IT team and say, hey, I'm seeing some suspicious traffic from dot .137, who's using it? And if they can't answer that question for you very quickly, you've got poor internal visibility. That's one of the reasons why I have the external validation before the internal validation, because most sites fall into that bucket where they don't have a whole lot of visibility on what's going on with their internal systems. That's why you save this one for last. Again, part of our threat hunt process is to try to expedite a resolution as quickly as possible. That's why we have the four steps in the order they're in. Persistency of connection, abnormal protocol activity, validate the external system, validate the internal system. And like I said, you know, you heard me pick on SIM and you heard me pick on centralized logging. But when we get to this point here, we're almost ready to like go into forensics mode. That's where that host information can actually be helpful to you. So that host info may not help you find the bad guys in the first place. But once you've identified a system as being compromised, it is going to help you run down what were they actually doing on that system. So a SIM to me is more of a forensics tool than it is a threat hunting tool, if you will. And I talked about Sysmon. You know, this is a Microsoft tool. Uh, they just modified this and made it available on Linux as well, which is kind of cool. And Sysmon will record anything and everything you want to know about your Windows systems. You know, if you want to monitor registry key changes, file permission changes, it will monitor all of that if you want to. You can generate a ton of data off of each of your hosts. But all of that data is going to have to get transmitted over the network, meaning it'll use up bandwidth. It's going to have use up disk storage. It's going to go through and slow down your queries, which means the more data you collect, the less you can scale. And I said the one thing that we found that really does a good job of helping you identify, um, you know, it, is the system in a compromised state is event ID threes. Event ID threes are applications talking on the network. So if it's reaching out to a remote system or a remote system is connecting to a local listening socket, that will get logged. This is the one you really want to go through and record for all of your systems if possible. And like I said, this can go through and really help you kind of run things down. So the first time I showed you Beaker, the application creating the connection was <clears throat> PowerShell. And we said, ooh, PowerShell bad. We know that's something we need to worry about. Well, look at this one. So here, my internal system is connecting to this IP address out on the internet, and it's Notepad making that connection. Well, hey, so long as that's Microsoft, that's probably okay, right? No, wait. Notepad doesn't talk on the network. Notepad is a simple text editor. Not as simple as it used to be, but it is still a simple text editor. It should not be connecting on the network ever. You know, we would never write a SIM rule to pattern match on someone running Notepad, right? We'd get tons of false positives. But here, it matters because we've got context. We're seeing a connection going from this system to that system, and we're seeing that this is the binary creating that connection. We know Notepad should not be talking on the network. That tells us we've got a big problem here. We've got something we really got to worry about. Again, rather than trying to signature match on old attacks, 
we're using the context of the network activity. That makes our SIM logs far more valuable, far more useful to us, because we'd never pattern match on NOPAP. We'd get tons of false positives. But in this context here, where we're seeing that is the application talking on the network, we know this is something we really need to worry about. One of the things I absolutely love about Beaker is that it makes it trivial to find hidden processes. Think about what does it take to find a process that an attacker has hidden on your system. So they've dropped some malware on your box and they're smart enough to hide from proc or whatever to be able to say, you can't log this process. So now when you go in and you run, you try and list out what processes are running in memory, since this thing isn't properly registered, it doesn't show up in that list. And effectively, it's running as a hidden process. So we can do whatever it wants on that system and you're not gonna get any log entries off of that. Beaker makes finding those trivial. What do I mean by that? Okay, follow along with this. So imagine we're analyzing our network and we see this host is connecting to that host on a very repetitive basis, just like we're seeing here. We jump into Beaker and we say, hey Beaker, show me what application is making this connection. And let's say Beaker shows nothing. Beaker says, I didn't see an application making that connection. It's one of two possibilities. Either Sysmon's not running on that box collecting that data. Since we don't have the data, we have no way to refer to it. That's possibility number one. Possibility number two is it's a hidden process and we can't see it. How do I tell the difference between the two? Oh, that's easy. What I do is over the same time frame, I change my query to say, show me what applications running on this system, talk to anybody not just this one IP address, any IP address at all. And then I run that query. One of two things are gonna come back. Either I will still see nothing, which confirms for me that Sysmon is not running on that box, or now I'll see Windows Update going out to Microsoft.com. Now I'll see Chrome connecting out to Google. Well, think of this logically. Why can you see those applications making those network connections? but you can't see the application that made this network connection. The only logical answer, it's a hidden process. Whoa, that's cool, right? Because So I used to do forensics like 20 years ago and finding hidden process basically involved, you take the system offline, you make an image of RAM, you hope the attacker who's smart enough to hide their processes is not also smart enough to monitor for sequential memory reads to figure out that you're imaging RAM and that you're gonna try and catch them, in which case they just simply take their malicious code, swap it to disk, wait until your, your imaging finishes and then swap the malicious code back up into RAM again. And now you've imaged memory and you haven't gotten any of the malicious code. You gotta hope they're not that smart. You know, smart enough to hide the process, but not smart enough to actually figure out when you're onto them. Yeah, good luck with that one. Those always scared me, because you never really know, right? You image memory, you don't find anything, you don't really know. You don't really know if that just meant they swapped it out to disk at the time. Here, doesn't matter. I don't need to take anything offline. I can find hidden processes at scale. If I've got three different systems spread out over my environment, all running hidden processes, I can find all three without taking any of those boxes offline to begin with, simply by looking at what application is connecting. And if I don't see anything, verifying Sysmon's running on the box. And if I can see Sysmon, but I can't see the application doing this, there's a hidden process there that's doing it. And again, this is open source. Anybody can use it for free. But I have no system logs. Oh, guess what, Sparky? Time to get some. <laughs> you need system logs. So what's next? Assign points. Go through and evaluate, you know, what you think the state of that system is. Are you seeing a lot of evidence pointing to it's potentially compromised and you're looking at a command and control server? If so, we need to go in incident response mode. Are you seeing evidence that this is probably just a normal connection that has a regular business need associated with it? In which case, we'll create an exception for it. So if it's okay, create an exception, then you don't review it again later. If it's not, we need to go in incident response mode. Be careful you don't cross into forensics. I've seen people kind of get hot and heavy on this and say, well, I can't really run things down, so I'm gonna log into that system and start running commands. To me, threat hunting stops 
when you're going to do something the attacker could detect. So if you're going to jump on the terminal of that system and start typing commands, they're going to potentially detect that. Threat hunting stopped right before that line. In other words, threat hunting should always lead to incident response. If you're mixing forensics into it, you've already stepped over the line and you're going to take the chance of shooting yourself in the foot. Because if that det attacker detects you there, they may go scorched earth and start blowing systems up. So that's why I always say, you know, it, if you're not sure, incident response mode and follow your incident response manual. What does that say? Like we found a bad system. Do we immediately take that offline or do we take the time to do a full scope analysis to see if other systems might be compromised too? Your IR needs to go through and define that. So don't step over that line. <clears throat> All right, and with that said, let's take a break. So it's now five minutes after the top of the hour. This is our midpoint in the class. So we're actually gonna take a 20 minute break. So at 25 minutes after the top of the hour for whatever time zone you're in right now, that's when we're gonna start back up again. I uh, One quick note is that sometimes when you uh, we pause the go to meeting session for a period of time, the audio doesn't come back for people. If you see in Discord, we've started back up and you can, and I'll type something in Discord when we start back up and you can't hear me on audio, just hit control R to reload the page. And when you reload the page, the audio and all that should come back for you. So we will take a break till 25 minutes after the top of the hour. I will see folks then. Hey folks, so we are back. Um, noticed we had a question in Discord about AC Hunter and the pricing. Um, folks listed a, uh, a URL to get there. That's awesome. And some comments about it. Uh, I will say it's a site license. By that I mean there's no upcharges. So if you have one connection to the internet, if you have 10, it's the same price. If you've got you know, a half a gig connection or a 50 gig connection to the internet, it's the same price. Uh, so the price you see, the reason it's quoted is because that's all you're ever gonna pay. And um, yeah, so there's that. And then there's been other uh, awesomes in there too. Um, do you still get security updates? Yeah, you do. Absolutely you do. And you get uh, feature updates, which uh, one of the features we're about to add in is something uh, called cyber deception, which uh, if we get some time at the end, I'll toss that in and I'll talk about that. But first, let's talk about C2 detection tools. <clears throat> so these are tools that we can use to go through and kind of um, either capture or analyze our network traffic as it goes by on the wire. So typically this setup, is going to be, we're going to want to plug into our network right by the internal interface of the firewall. So think a network tap, a span port off the switch, whatever the concept may be. Any traffic going in and out of that interface on our firewall, we're going to want to make a copy off to the side so that we can go through and we can do an analysis on that. And there's a number of different tools for that. Uh, one of the oldest is TCP dump. TCP dump is great in that it's a very lightweight tool. It's very fast. It's very efficient. It's not very flexible. You know, I can't go in and only carve out certain fields and stuff like that. What I like TCP dump for more than anything else is just going in and creating my captures in the first place. And we have a wonderful Bill Stearns uh, script at the bottom here that if you run this script, it'll go off and it will capture your traffic as it goes by, write it into PCAP uh, files that are one hour each, and then compress them down and give them a name that identifies the date and the time that that capture was created. So now I can go back through each one of these one hour captures to go through and see what was taking place on my network. The only, um, the only problem with PCAPs is they do take up quite a bit of space, but some networks do need that level of visibility. Now, I can also do captures with T-Shark, and T-Shark has some uh, additional tools that allow you to manipulate what you want to do for captures. But the biggest benefit to T-Shark that I see, now this is part of Wireshark. If you have Wireshark installed, you probably have T-Shark as well and just maybe didn't know it was there. But one of the cool things about T-Shark is you can tell it only print out these, this specific piece of information. So with like TCP dump, I might want to see the TTLs and the packets that go by but I'm gonna get a lot of information printed out and I'm gonna to have to search through that information to find the TTL values. With T-Shark, I can go in and I can specify dash capital T fields and then identify 
only the fields that I actually want to see. So for example, here I'm saying I want to see the DNS query that went by. Now what's kind of cool about this <clears throat> is that automatically kind of acts like a filter. In other words, any packet going by that doesn't have a DNS query field, it's going to ignore it. Now the problem with that is it'll print out a blank line. So what you'll end up with is, you know, let's say a packet goes by, it'll print that out, and then you'll get a ton of blank lines, and then you'll get it, you'll see it again. Uh, it can make it kind of difficult to read. So by going in and giving it a filter that says, yeah, only analyze traffic going to the DNS port, that allows you to make sure that every line is going to have the information you want in there. <laughs> but I could also go in and add fields for like the source IP address, the destination IP address, if I want to see that info too. I can pick and choose exactly what I want to see. That makes T-sharp pretty powerful. Here I'm going in and I'm saying I want to see the HTTP user agent string. I'm also going in and I'm saying I want to sort those values and then pump it through Unique C. What does Unique C do? Unique C says, for all of these values that are listed one line after another, only print out one line. But dash C means go in and print out the number of lines that were truncated down. So for example, to pick one, this Microsoft Crypto API slash 6.1, there were 12 lines of output that contained this string. When that went through Unique C, Unique C says, okay, I'm gonna take those 12 lines, compact it down to one, and then I'll print the number 12 at the beginning so you know how many lines were there originally. Then I'm going in and I'm sorting it. And then I'm going in and I'm saying, just show me the first 10 lines worth of output. What I'm looking for is unique user agent strings. Because again, if only one or two systems is using something, that could make it interesting to me. So that's what I'm going through and I'm using uh, T-Shark for here. Wireshark is the packet analysis tool that most of us are familiar with. Um, Wireshark is an awesome tool. In fact, the Packet Decode class, we spend a lot of time using Wireshark. It's a great tool when you have like a session or a small amount of data you want to analyze. It's not necessarily a good tool for, hey, I want to look at a 24-hour chunk worth of my data that went by on the network. Why? Why not? One of the limitations of Wireshark is that it wants to load the entire PCAP into RAM. Well, what if I have a 50 gig PCAP, which is entirely easily possible if we're monitoring all the traffic going in and out of our internet link? Well, if I have a 50 gig PCAP and I don't have 50 gigs of RAM, guess what? I'm going to be doing an awful lot of disk swapping. So when I run Wireshark and I tell it to load up this PCAP file, first I got to wait for the whole thing to load. And then anytime I go in and parse data, some of that might actually have been restored in disk within that image because the whole thing couldn't fit in RAM to begin with. So for an analyzing large files, you're better off with something like T-Shark. But once you've carved that down to like a couple of sessions you want to look at, that's when Wireshark becomes a really powerful tool. And then there's BroZeek. I mentioned that this used to be named Bro, it's now named Zeek. And we've been looking at what some of this output looks like. And you could use this instead of generating PCAP files. It doesn't record all of the information you get in a PCAP. Like Zeke won't tell you what was the IP ID set within the IP header on all the packets that went by. It won't show you that. You need PCAPs for that. But do you care about that? If you don't, well, you don't need that level of detail that you'd get out of a PCAP. One of the things I really love about Zeke is that it takes up about 1 20th the storage of a PCAP, and that can be hugely important. Imagine I have enough disk space to save five days worth of PCAP files, and something goes weird on my network. Well, if something goes weird on my network and I only have five days to work with, guess what? I can only go back five days worth of history to try and figure out what might have initially triggered this event. If I'm using Zeek, I could easily, easily save at least 20 days worth of data, maybe more like 90. You know, now I actually, yeah, it's about 20 times uh, less storage. So actually, if I can five days worth of PCAPs, I could have 100 days worth of Zeek data. So now I've got 100 days worth of data to go through instead of five days. That's going to make it that much easier to kind of run things back. 
So Zeek is a great tool for just kind of keeping track of all the different communication sessions that are going on your network. And I mentioned that there's con.log, that's my primary file, but anytime it recognizes the application, it throws it into an application specific file. So for here, I'm looking at the SSL.log file and I'm looking at things like the source IP address, the destination IP address, the destination port, and the validation status of the digital certificate. And then I'm piping this through grep. Remember, grep is our tool that will go in and do a text search, looking for anything labeled as self-signed. And what this is showing me is all the different systems are all the different connections that took place where the uh, digital certificate on that server was a self-signed server. So if this is something I was interested in seeing in my environment, here's a very quick, easy way to go through and do that at the command line. Oh, Jesse had a great note, which is um, the resource issue I mentioned with Wireshark is also true for T-Shark, and that's absolutely true. The difference is um, with Wireshark, I need to run a GUI. So I'll probably have X Windows running, and then I'll have Wireshark running on top of that, and Wireshark's a fairly big application. T-Shark is smaller, so I'll have more RAM available to load that PCAP into with T-Shark, than I would with Wireshark because I don't have the overhead of the graphical interface and I don't have the overhead of, of you know the Wireshark graphical interface as well. But yes, you can run, still run into that same problem. So to go back to the example I gave, if I have a system with eight gigs of RAM and I've got a 50 gig PCAP file that I want to go through and analyze, okay, it'll be a little bit better with T-Shark because I don't have like the two or three gigs worth of overhead of having a GUI, but you know, it's two or three gigs versus a 50 gig file. Yeah, I'm still going to run into problems for that. So thank you for uh, pulling that out. Paul K. asked, how does Z compare to NetFlow? Oh, so, so much better. So much better. So Rita, our open source tool that goes in and looks for command and control channels. We're going to be playing with that in the lab in just a little while. Um, we supported Zeek and we decided let's go in and support NetFlow. NetFlow was just a horrible nightmare. Um, for a number of reasons. One is you don't get the same level of detail. So you lose things like anything that's going on at the application layer. The other thing is that NetFlow isn't clear in how it defines things. So one of the things we found was, you know, when you timestamp a session, what do you timestamp? Zeek is very clear. Zeek always timestamps, this is when I saw the first packet in the session, and I'm going to label the duration to tell you how long that session went for. And it does it for everything. NetFlow, the spec is general enough that that timestamp means different things to different vendors. So we've actually seen vendors that will do the same thing. They'll timestamp it based on when the session started, although you don't get duration information, which means that you can't go through and actually figure out if it's a long connection. We've seen some that for a TCP session, set the timer to take place after the three packet handshake takes place. And their thought process is, well, that's overhead in the session. The data doesn't actually transfer until after the three packet handshake. So we'll go through and we'll trigger timing based on that. We find other NetFlow implementations where the timestamp is when that entry got written to logs. It wasn't when the session actually started, it was when that session got recorded. When you're going in and doing a beacon analysis, especially if you're looking at beacons with jitter, that having an accurate, consistent time interval or, or time definition is crucial. And with NetFlow, you just don't get that. So if I had to pick one or the other, Zeek or NetFlow, I would like pay, you pick Zeek even if I had to pay out of pocket to get that because it would make my life so much easier. NetFlow is great when eh, we just don't have anything else, right? You know, it's a field office. There's nobody there who can set up any type of monitoring. We got nothing, but hey, there's a router there that'll at least spit out some NetFlow data. All right, fine. It's better than having absolutely nothing at all, but not by much. And it doesn't come close to the level of granularity you can get out of Zeek. Good question. All right, another useful tool, ngrep. Ngrep is like grep, except with network packets. So with ngrep, I can go in and say, hey, look for this pattern inside of a packet. Now it has to be a clear text packet. 
you know, this doesn't work with like TLS once the ciphertext kicks in type of thing. But it, it can be a useful tool to go in and look for particular signatures if that's something you need to go in and do for some reason. Couple of useful switches. The first one is dash capital I to read a PCAP file. For most tools, dash lowercase r reads that file, right? So anytime you want to read in a file, usually dash lowercase r is the, tool, is the switch you want to use. NGREP is different. They use dash capital I for input and dash capital O to output to another PCAP file. The dash Q, NGREP, when you tell it, hey, go look for this pattern, anytime it checks a packet that doesn't have that pattern, it prints out a pound sign. So what you kind of end up with is a screen full of pound signs and not much else. Um, dash Q tells it, don't print that pound sign out. Only print out when you see a match to what, I, what it is I want to go in and look for. And you'll see something kind of similar to this. So for example, my ngrep command says dash Q, don't print out those pound signs. Dash I, I want to read in this PCAP file. And I want to look for this character string, capital A D M I N. So short for admin or administrator with a capital A. And then I'm saying, hey, just print out 15 lines and that's it. And then Grep is saying, okay, I'm gonna read the PCAP file you told me about, and here's what I'm going in and pattern matching on, just to make sure, you know, just to kind of sanity check so you know it's being checked. And here it found a match. So this was a TCP packet coming from this IP address, this upper port, going to this IP address, that port, the act flag and the push flag was set in the, in the TCP session, and it's a get request for the start stop HTML file within the administrator directory, ADMIN, which matches my pattern. So again, this is just going in and doing a pattern match. Here is the 404, that file was not found because the 404 includes the requested URL, which also included that character string. So again, it's just a simple way to go in and do pattern matching on packets if I want to. Data mash, we already played around with this one a little bit. So data mash is an awesome tool for going in and doing a statistical analysis. So if I wanna go in and you know take a list of numbers and go in and look at like, you know what's the delta mean between them or whatever it is I wanna do, I can do that with this tool. The, the feature I use predominantly is that sum feature that we talked about before. So here's an example. So here I'm catting con.log, I'm pulling out the source IP address, the destination IP address, and the duration. And then I'm saying sort that based on the third column, reverse sort, so large is first, and those are numeric values print out the first five lines. And notice when I did that, I have an instance here of where the same two IP addresses are talking to each other. They just had a different duration for each of those two connections. Well, if I want to look at cumulative communication time, I want to combine those together. That's what data mash does for me. So here, I pull the same data out of that Zeek log. I remove the blank lines. I remove any lines where the duration is a dash value. And then I go through and sort it so that source IP address and destination IP address, when they're the same, are one line after the other. And then I tell data mash when the source IP address and the destination IP address are the same, add up the values in that third column, which is the duration time. And then I did the same sort dash K, highest value of duration first, pump it through five, you know, show me the first five line entries like we did here. And notice this time, instead of seeing two separate sessions, it's just gone through and it's added them together for me. So that's kind of cool. Makes this a whole lot easier to process. Also notice that after the 104s before, I had a 105 talking to dot 10. Well, that isn't my next line entry here. This one is, because here we saw four seconds, but there was actually some more, you know, at least one other connection that took place that made that duration a little bit longer and made it pop up on the list. <clears throat> so data mash, great tool. And then we get read up. And I've mentioned this on and off during the course of the class. We're going to work with this in the labs in just a little bit. Rita is our tool for identifying command and control channels. So Rita will take in Zeek or NetFlow. You heard my spiel. <laughs> it's going to do a much better job with Zeek data than it will with NetFlow data. So Zeek is the way to go if at all possible. But what Rita does is it reads in those Zeek logs and then it parses those Zeek logs for you 
to look for indications of beacon activity or indications of long connection activity. So it does all of that work for you. Here's an example of it going in and looking for beacons. So first thing I would have done is I would have gone in and I would have told Rita to import in my Zeek logs. There's a command for that. And Rita will just take in those Zeek logs and it'll process them. And then it'll create a database using Mongo that we can now go in and uh, process to go in and see, okay, what was that data and what was there? Here I'm saying, Rita, show any beacons that showed up in this particular data set. And head only print out the first 10 lines. Now, there's a lot of data here. The stuff that matters to you as an end user is number one, this very first column. This very first column is our persistency score. This is on a scale of zero to one. So if you want to move the decimal places to places, you can call it a percentage. How, what is the percentage chance that we're sure that this is a persistent connection? Meaning that you need to identify if there's a business need associated with it in order to see if this is something that makes sense for your environment or not. Anytime you see a one, that means we're 100% certain there's persistency of connection here. Uh, this is 0.838, so we're 83.8% .8 certain there's persistency of connection here. So the first thing that gets printed out is the score. That's the thing that matters most. And then we show you what was the internal IP address, what was the external IP address, how many connections took place over the time frame being analyzed. So that's typically going to be 24 hours. So in this case here, there was over 20,000 connections in a 24-hour period of time. And then we show you what was the average amount of data being sent by the client up to the server. Everything else after that, honestly, doesn't really matter from us as threat hunters perspective. What the rest of that data is good for is let's say um, you run into a command and control channel in your environment that you feel like reader didn't score properly, right? Like reader assigns a score of like 0.6 to it. And you say, yeah, but it was a real C2 channel. Reader should have scored it higher to make sure I pay attention to it. You could go come back to us, come back to the developers, show us this entire line, and we'll be able to analyze that to say, okay, what did Rita see and why did it score it the way it did? What can we tweak to make sure that works better in the past? So it's more debug information for the developers if you ever have a problem versus anything else. For us as users, score, source destination IP, number of connections, how much data was transferred in each session, that's the data we care about the most. Reed has also got a, um, a output specifically to look for C2 over DNS because it's so popular and because it's so hard to tag. You know, we'll go in and look for that directly. So in this case here, it's telling us for seamru.com, I always say that wrong. We did, we looked up 227 unique fully qualified domain names. Okay, that's kind of hot until you realize that this is a tool that actually allows you to go in and validate, is this a known to be malicious site? In other words, you can use their site to go in and check other sites to see if there's any malicious activity that's been associated with it in the past. So if we know we're using this service, this becomes a false positive that we can now ignore going forward because we know there's a business need associated with that. And then there's passer. Uh, Bill, you and I need to chat because I want to find out how the progress has been going on Passer because we're going in and doing some modifications on this now. We brought in an outside developer to kind of help with it. Passer is a really good tool when you have an environment, especially one that you just don't know what's going on, right? You don't necessarily have visibility of all your endpoints. You don't necessarily know how many systems are connected, who's talking to who or what's going on. Passer will show you all that. So for example, here, first line, Passer is telling us, hey, this system has TCP port 43 open. And the way it knows that is Passer saw someone connect to that port on that system and saw it complete the three packet handshake and do a data transfer. So now I know I've got this internal system that has this port open. Should that port be open? Should that be something anybody should talk to? I mean, may need to go and pay attention to that. Um, it'll also do things like try and identify what is the client. What is that system? You know, here we've got a TCP device that's identifying itself. You know, oh, hey, so that looks like it's a smart TV. 
you know, or actually it looks like it's an Apple uh, device calling in. So again, um, this is a great tool to kind of evaluate what's on your environment. So if you're in that position of, hey, I found a C2 channel and I don't know what that system is, Passer may be able to kind of help you nail down what's going on with that system. Uh, we're adding in some new features to this. The one I'm most excited about is passive fingerprinting. The ability for Passer to see that system connect to somebody else and based on the way that system created its TCP SYN packet, identify what is the host operating system on that. So you don't have to guess based on maybe some string, it'll actually tell you that's what this system is. Uh, so this, this tool we're continuing to support and build out the capability on. It's got some other thing, cool things coming with it too. Uh, that's a cool tool. And again, it's open source. Anybody can use it. And with that said, let's do some labs, right? Because that's really what this is all about is, hey, let's go in and have some fun. Let's go in and kind of play around with some of this stuff. So here's my dilemma as the author. My dilemma as the author is some of you are here for the first time and you haven't done a whole lot on the command line before and a lot of this stuff is really new to you. So how do I create a lab that's not going to be so hard that you can't ever achieve it? Some of the folks, as you've probably seen, I've seen a couple of folks say, yeah, I've taken this class three times already. <laughs> you know, I'm back in for a refresher. Uh, some folks have done this multiple times. And some folks have been doing this for years. Okay, how do I make it simple enough for the new folks, but challenging enough for folks that have been at this for a while? So here's the format I've come up with. And I'll show it a little bit in just this first one, just so you can kind of get a handle on what I'm talking about here. So e for each of these labs, I'm going to give you a problem to solve. Find the 10 longest connections that took place within this data set, something along those lines. I'm going to give you a problem to go through and solve that is going to be a typical activity that the threat hunter is going to be expected to do. If you've been doing this for a while, use that information only and just go to it and try and do the lab. Now, if you're green at this, and you're saying, okay, the 10 longest connections, I remember you talking about that, Chris, I remember why it's important, but I don't really remember how to get it done. I know what tools I think I need to use, I'm just not sure how exactly to solve this problem. The next slide after the problem will always be hints. So I won't tell you how to do it, but I might indicate, hey, here's some important information that you may want to go out and extract. And, you know, you might want to kind of form it this way that, you know, I'll, I'll give you some general hints, but that's it. So if you, so read the problem, if you're not sure what to do, then go check the hints. If you think you're on the right track now, great, jump out and do the lab. If you read the hints and you're like, okay, Chris, I'm a little closer, I still don't know what to do. The next, lab, the next slide after that is always going to be the exact commands. So just go in, copy the commands I gave you, paste them out. Remember what I talked about, how you can take a multiple command and just kind of work backwards to figure out what it does? Play around with that. Why did we parse the data the way we did? Why, you know, what is it about these results that give it to you? If you're still not sure what's going on, the next slides after that are the solution. Here, I, you know, there I go in and I walk you through it, and this is what you want to do and in what order and why. So let's jump into our first lab and get started on this before we do our next break. Remember to get access to the VM that we gave you. T-Hunt is the login. Password is all your base that belong to us. If you set up your own VM and just ran our script, your login is going to be whatever it is you need to do. You shouldn't need to use sudo for any of the commands that we're running. Uh, all of this stuff can be executed locally, and your VM doesn't need internet access. All the labs can be run locally within the VM itself. All the labs are in your, when you log in, it'll be in that home directory under the lab something directory. And the first directory we'll be starting in is lab one. So once you log in, just CD into the lab one directory like you saw me do here. And then once you do, if you type the ls command, you should see the same set of files that I have here. Trace1.pcap is the pcap file that has all of the traffic inside of it. All of the .log files, these are Zeek logs that were created from that pcap file. All right, 
So for your first mission, Mr. Phelps, should you choose to accept it, is to go to that lab one directory. You've got PCAPs and you got Zeek log files like I just showed you. And I want you to identify the top 10 longest connections between a private IP address and a legal IP address and the top 10 cumulative communication times between a private and a legal address. So top 10 private to external. So we're looking for, you know, north south type of traffic, traffic leading our network. If it's a long connection between two private addresses, we don't care. If it's a system broadcasting a lot, <clears throat> we don't care. It has to be internal to external that we're interested in. I gave you PCAPs, I gave you Zeek logs. Part of the problem to solve, which one do you use, right? Like I said, after this is hints. So if you read the, the lab and you're not sure what to do, just go to that hint slide next. I tell you what, we are five minutes before the top of the hour. So we were gonna do a 10 minute break at the top of the hour anyway. Let's do a break now. That way, if folks don't have their VM up and running yet, they get an extra 10 minutes to jump into it. And what we'll do is we'll take a break until five minutes after the top of the hour. And once we get to five minutes after the top of the hour, we'll jump in and we'll, uh, we'll go through and we'll finish up this lab. So any questions, throw them into Discord. Um, otherwise, I am gonna go silent for the next 10 minutes because, hey, I'm sure by now you need a break from my voice. I'll talk to you in 10. And we are back. Okay, so many of you are getting way too nervous about doing labs. So uh, let, let, let's back up for a second. I'm gonna make everybody laugh. So uh, I'm actually taking some time off in a couple of weeks. I am getting married. I'm marrying a woman who is very much a Southern belle. So she's not into the geeky thing, uh, which works out kind of good because it's a nice balance between the two of us. But uh, I've been trying to pick out cake toppings that she has not, will not approve on. So this is one of them. Turn it that way, you can see it better. She didn't like that cake topping. <laughs> so I'm not allowed to go with that. Uh, let's see, I came up with this cake topping. May the force be with us. Yeah, she didn't like that cake topping either. So that one got shot down. Uh, let's see, I went for this cake topping. Achievement unlocked, got married. No, she didn't like that cake topping either. So what I've been allowed to get away with is I found some Puff links for the tux I'll be wearing, and their Captain America shields. Captain America's kind of a dude. <laughs> so I was able to get away with that. So hopefully that's given everyone a laugh, so you can take the nervous energy down a notch. These, th these are labs. You're not gonna break anything. You're not gonna hurt anything. You're working within the VM. The absolute worst case situation is you nuke the whole VM somehow. You run some command that's not part of the labs, you nuke the whole thing. In which case, so what? You delete it, you create a new one, you go back through and do the labs. All this is recorded, you can go back through it again later on if you need to, you got a copy of all the slides, you've got everything. This is not something to be nervous about. We're not working on a production system. So with that said, I'm gonna- Hey, Chris. Back off of camera, so you don't have to look at me anymore. And hey, Chris. And time to go through and do those labs. So go in, give this a shot, any questions, concerns, go ahead and throw them into the Discord channel. I will ask if you think you have the answers, please sit on them for now. Uh, that'll give other folks time to go through and work through it as well. So <laughs> a couple of folks are saying they love the cake toppings. Yeah, I thought they were cool. But, you know, Southern Belle girl, that's just not her style. Who would have thought? But <laughs> All right, folks, awesome. get to it. Hey, Chris, sorry to interrupt, but I, I would like to add also, uh, if anybody's, you know, a little, uh, has some trepidation or nervous or whatever, uh, there's no test here. Um, you're not having to, like, provide your answers publicly. Yeah, exactly. The whole mission here is for you just to learn, so. And, and you know what? We all screw up. We all yep. start somewhere. Um, you, you, you may notice that, like, one of the things we don't let happen is folks putting each other down in the channel, right? If you like ask a question, you never get the answer. Well, go read the fact, you know? Why didn't you read the fact before you answer that, ask that question? Or, oh, that's a stupid question. We don't put up with people like that. And the reason is we all go to start somewhere. So this is a community. We're here to support each other. Uh, just go into this and have fun. If you have questions, go ahead and ask them. That's what we're all here for. 
So yeah, Keith, thank you for tossing that in. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you. Totally agree. Hey, so real quick, there's a, a comment in Discord that I want to make sure I answered on air so to make sure everybody hears it. So if you installed the labs using the login script, or excuse me, using the script, meaning you didn't download the VM, you created your own VM and then just ran our script, one of the little quirks with that is you need to log out and log back in in order for it to modify your path statement. And Bill, you're much smarter with Linux than I. Maybe that's something we can tweak at some point. Um, but what, uh, the problem you may run into is trying to find like the zcut tool. It'll tell you it can't find that command. And the reason is it hasn't updated the path statement yet. So the easiest way to fix that, log out, log in, and poof, zcut will appear for you. All right, get to it. So I see a couple of folks have questions about copy pasting commands between the host system and the actual VM itself. Uh, most VM managers have tools for that, <clears throat> meaning there's tools you install within the VM and on the host system that allows you to copy paste stuff back and forth. And within the FAQ, we go through and identify how to do that between the two systems. <clears throat> we also identify uh, how to set it up to use SSH. And that may be the easiest way to go in and kind of solve that problem, because since SSH is running a local app, is a local application, you can copy paste to that, no problem. So there's a couple of different ways you could solve this. It could be install the copy paste tools for your particular VM implementation, or it could be set it up so that you can SSH into it. Uh, all of that should be covered in the FAQ for the class. So if you need steps on how to get that done with your particular version of the uh, of VM manager, uh, just go ahead and check the fact and kind of follow along with that. With that said, I'm going to give you just a couple more minutes since we had the 10-minute break as part of this, and we'll go through and we'll cover this one. I also, since it's the first lab, I don't want to leave people frustrated if they're kind of having trouble getting off to a good start. So I'll give you a couple more minutes and then we'll talk about this. All right, let's talk this one through a little bit. <clears throat> So our lab was identify the top 10 longest connections between private and legal IP addresses. So that's individual session time. And also identify the top 10 cumulative communication time between private and legal addresses. So we're basically looking for what are the longest duration connections that are taking place on our network. Now, the first thing we need to do is kind of sanity check how much data do we have to work with. You know, in other words, if we if this is like one hour's worth of data, well, finding long connections is going to kind of be useless, right? Because we said typically we're going to look for like five hours or longer. So we need to find out how much data do we have. Uh, and a, a command we didn't cover, but um, is very useful, is a command called cap infos. This is part of the T-Shock kit. And if you type in something like AUE or AEU, and then the name of that PCAP file, so that was uh, trace1.pcap. So notice I just typed in TR, enough to make the name unique, and hit tab, and tab filled out the rest of the line for me. If I run cap infos against it, actually, let me show it to you without any command line switches. So if I just say cap infos space, the name of a PCAP file, I get all this useful information. How big is the file? How much data is actually in it? How many packets are there? You know, what was the size of the packets that came in? Uh, is everything in strict time order within the PCAP file? Did the packet show up out of order? What interface was this captured on? You know, here's the hashes <laughs> that, got, that will get generated off of that PCAP file. So it gives me a lot of useful information. But for the purposes of checking long connections, the only thing I care about is how much data is in there? How long is it stored for? And notice my capture duration is 86,398.5. Okay, so that's a second and a half short of the 86,400 that we said is a full 24 hour period of time. So we got 24 hours to work with here. So anytime we see a connection approaching that 86,400, 
that's something that was running in the entire day. Also notice that my switch has printed out start and stop time. So if I'm interested in that for some reason, I can go in and I can check that information. Great, so now I know I have 24 hours worth of data to work with. Now, my next choice is, do I work with the PCAP file or do I work with the Zeek logs? My PCAP file doesn't record duration, right? It records start and stop time for each of my sessions, but then I need to figure out some way to parse that information out and it's not gonna be easy. So I'm probably better off using my Zeek logs to go through and look at that. My Zeek logs, just to remind you, my con.log is the one that records everything. And one of the things that it goes through and records is duration of connection. So here's a quick, easy way to find out how long did the connection last for. I can just go in and I can look at duration. Great, so I wanna see duration. So I'm gonna say cat con.log, and I'm gonna go through and run these commands one at a time just so you can see what the data looks like. So I'm gonna start off saying cat con.log. What does that do? Well, that just spews out all the data all over the screen, right? Great, so I, all the data is there, but I wanna find longest connections. How can I reorganize this information and make that process a little bit easier? So I'm gonna hit up arrow, and I'm gonna say, okay, now I'm gonna use the Zcut tool. Now remember I said if you installed with the script, and you can't find Zcut, just log out of your session, log back in, and Zcut will be there. <clears throat> you need to log out and log in to update the path statement. So I'm gonna say Zcut, all right, what information do I care about? I wanna look at duration time. Well, it would be helpful to know which IP address originated the session, right? So that's id.rig underscore h. What else would be helpful to know? Be nice to know what IP address it was talking to, right? ID RESP underscore H is the destination IP. What else would be interesting to know? Well, the duration, obviously. How long did that connection last? So I'm gonna say duration. If I can spell it, cause you know, duration has more than one syllable and it's a hard word. Oh God, it's been a long day. All right, let's hit enter on that. Hey, this is kind of cool. So now I'm seeing which IP address is talking to which IP address and how long that connection lasted for. That's pretty awesome, right? So my goal was to find my top 10 longest connections. So can I sort this data somehow so that rather than the duration times being all spread out like they are, wouldn't it be cool if we could get the longest durations at the top, right? That would make this a whole lot easier. Well, to get the longest durations, I can use sort for that, right? Now, if I just use sort and nothing else, well, now what I'm sorting is based on IP addresses, right? So here you can see source and destination are the same. It's sorted all that. I don't want to sort the first and second column. I want to sort the third column. So I'm going to go in and say dash K3. Sort on that third column. Hit enter on that. Well, okay, this is better, right? But I got a couple problems here. One problem is, so here's 96 seconds, and then here's nine seconds, and then there's 97. What's going on here? Remember I said that by default, sort sorts things alphanumerically. This is an alphanumeric sort. We don't want that. We want to do the sort numerically. So I'm gonna go in and say dash N, that third column, those are numbers, sorted as if they're numbers. So now if I do that, oh, hey, look, that cleaned it up. Now my longest times end up down by the bottom. But I end up with a lot of data on the screen I may not care about. So one of the other things I might wanna do is reverse the sort, dash R. So dash N R says sort it numerically, but now it's going from highest to lowest. Notice now what prints out at the bottom is all my dashes. There was no connection time. Okay, well that's fine, but that means the stuff I care about just scrolled off the top of the screen. How do I get that back? Well, I can go through and I can say, pipe it through head. And head by default will show me my first 10 lines. So here, notice I've got the same source IP address each time, but here's all the external IP addresses it talked to. 
Here's how long it communicated for. Here's the one I care about the most, right? That was running almost the full 24 hours. So from a which of my which external IP addresses is my is my host maintaining a persistent long connection with? That's the one. The other ones <clears throat> I don't really care about, right? Everything here is is well below that 20,000 second threshold that I talked about. All of these connections are like a couple of mi minutes max, and that's it. So I don't really care about those. So the first problem we needed to solve, finding the longest connection, this is it. This last command we typed, that's the way to go through and do it. Now the second part of this was the longest cumulative time. Well, we can go in and we can work off of this same command <clears throat> to figure out the same thing. We still wanna go through and we wanna work with con.log. We still wanna pull out the same fields but we're gonna to wanna to add up that duration column. And remember we said, we wanna make sure that, here, if I just hit enter, notice I've got, here's some 10, 248, 234, 238 communications, but then here's a couple of, uh, here's a 208 down here, here's a 239 here. All the IPs are mixed up together. And remember we said for data mesh to work properly, the source and destination, when they're the same, they need to be one line after another. So we need to fix that. How do we fix that? Well, the easiest way to fix that is just to go through and sort it, right? Now, oh, hey, look, all my IPs match. Here, we've got IPv6 addresses, but that's okay. They'll sort just as easily. But notice, when the addresses are the same, they end up one line after another. That's exactly what we wanted, great. Now we're gonna pump this data through data mesh. <clears throat> so one of the things we said with data mesh is that data mesh doesn't do really well when there's a dash for the duration. Remember we saw a couple instances of that and it doesn't do very well when it's got a blank line. So we need to go in and add grep statements that will go in and remove those entries from taking place. So we don't have any blanks or um, dashes on the screen right now. So if I was to go in and run this command, we're probably not gonna see any type of a difference. Um, but this command will then go through and remove all of those line entries. Great. So now I've cleaned up the data. Now I'm ready to run it through data mesh. And to run it through data mesh, this is pretty straightforward. I say dash G for group. Anytime column one and column two match, sum three, add up column three. So notice here, all of these line entries are the same source and destination with a small amount of time for each. So now let's go ahead and run this. And now notice that got summarized down to a single line. Now what shows up on the screen is all of the other unique IP combination pairs and what the duration was for each of those. So we've summarized it down to just be one line, cool. Okay, well, that's not an easy to read format, right? Because we've got two seconds, 128, 78, one. Yeah, we want that sorted, right? Same thing we did before. So we get, the rest of this ends up being very similar to what we just did. I'm gonna say sort dash K3 dash RN, and then pipe that through head. <clears throat> and here's what we get. Now, here's our top 10 lines. <clears throat> Um, no, it's not. Oh, <laughs> maybe you can see my typo. I sorted on the destination IP address, not the duration column. That's why that didn't come up right. So let me put a couple of blank lines in there. Here's my data. So here's that 86,000 I had before. Now remember before, my second one was like 250 seconds or less. Now we've got a 4,000 second in there. So by adding up the time, we ended up a little bit higher. <clears throat> now there was a little caveat to this lab, which was the top 10 communicating with the internet. Some of these, like this line entry here, that is multicast traffic. In other words, this is my local IPv6 system trying to talk to other IPv6 systems on the, on the network. 
So I wanted the top 10 from internal to external. Look at this one. This one might be a little bit easier for the folks not up on IPv6. That's a multicast address. That's not an actual uh, unique IP address for a destination. So I may need to go in and do kind of a head dash 15 here, print out a couple of extra lines, and then ignore all of my multicast traffic. Right, this brings in a couple of last line entries. To be honest, from a threat hunting perspective, the only thing I really care about though is this top line. That's the one where the connection was running for almost the entire day. Uh, let's see, typed in a command exact and still getting IPv6 multicast. Why do we type in sort twice? So, the I just kind of stepped through this. So, so the first sort is pulling source and destination IP addresses together. The second sort is what's giving us highest or lowest from a duration perspective. And if you just step through the command, like you just saw me do, that may help kind of clarify that out a little bit. Uh, and I see a lot of folks an answering that, so that is awesome. That is awesome. I love how helpful this community is. It's really cool. Makes my life easier. All right. So here were the hints for that lab. So I told you long connections is a relative term. You need to know how long it's been running for, and we use cap infos for that. Uh, PCAPs don't store connection duration. Well, if I'm trying to figure out if I need to use a PCAP or Zeek logs, that kind of helped point me in the right direction. Here's where Zeek stores its duration information. Zeek cut extracts fields. Data mesh is useful for adding value. So notice I didn't give you the answer here, but all of these are kind of hints to point you in the right direction. And then after that, I gave you the commands. And then after that, I walk through how we go about actually pulling together everything in this lab. So if this is something you end up coming back to later, you get all the information you need here to kind of work through this. So we first identified how long was the time period in the PCAP, what was our top longest connection, and then when we looked at our longest talkers, we said, okay, these times are longer now, but 20,000 is our threshold. Really, this is only that one IP address we need to worry about. Cool. So that's the first lab. Our next lab, this one should be a little bit easier for you. So remember when I said your VM doesn't need internet access? It doesn't, but your host will kind of need internet access for this next lab. So I said, let's investigate the external IP address of the two longest sessions. So this uh, 52179, it's only 4,000. We said that's way below our 20,000. So normally we wouldn't check that. But for the purposes of this lab, I'm gonna pull this one in too just because there's two different things I wanted you to be able to go in and kind of look for. So a couple of things you can go in and try. One is running the host parameter against an IP address. That may help you figure out what was there. Um, the other thing you can do is you can go search for that IP address in the dns.log to see if anybody did a lookup on that IP address and what host name was associated with that. The third thing you can do is use each of these two links to then investigate these IP addresses to see what data do they know about that host. So what we're trying to, so we established, we've got persistency of connection. Now what we're trying to establish is business need. Does it, is there a logical reason why our system should be maintaining a persistent connection with that host out on the internet? Yes or no? I'm gonna give you a little bit of time to work through this one and then we'll go through and we'll cover it. Any questions, just throw them into Discord. Hey, so one thing really quick. So Farmer Mike said, love the way this is presented. I can go back and go over it again and again to, to perfect the skills. Uh, thank you. Appreciate the compliment. It's almost like we've done this before, right? <laughs> In fact, I found out from Shelby, we hit a milestone with this class, which is we've had over 20,000 unique individuals go through this class. That's not counting. You know, we, we've got some folks who come back three, four times, and that's been awesome because they jump into Discord, they help others, and we really love that. Well, we've delivered this training to over 20,000 unique individuals. And I have to say that is something I am super proud of uh, for a couple of reasons. One, and just being able to do it this way. Uh, but the other is that 
Uh, I taught for SANS for 15 years, and this has just exceeded the number of people I taught through SANS, which I think is pretty cool too. So yeah, so uh, that that's kind of awesome from my perspective. All right, I'll let you get back into doing the lab. All right, this one was fairly straightforward. So let's go through and kind of talk about this one a bit. So we had um, two things here, right? So we had two IP addresses that we were maintaining a persistent connection with. One was all day long, the other one was only for 4,000 seconds, but we wanted to include that anyway. So now we want to identify business need, right? We want to go through and we want to see, is there a business reason why this connection might be in place? So there's a couple of techniques we can go through and we can use for doing that, even before we get into the web browser stuff. So the first one, and it's the one that I like to use, is one of the log files that Z creates is this one here, dns.log. And dns.log is like my favorite log file. Um, I know that's a weird thing to say, but hey, you already figured out I'm geeky, right? So this is going through and identifying who was talking to who and what queries they were sending. So what was actually being, well, this is all local multicast stuff in through here, but yeah, what queries were being done? Like here's someone looking up one client.sfx.ms. And what's really cool about this versus, um, versus um, excuse me, uh, logging this through your DNS log, is you also get to see what was the answer that came back? What was the answer to the question they asked? So DNS log is an awesome tool to go through and use. So the first thing I'll always go through and do is say, okay, let me try and grep for that IP address within DNS.log to see what I come up with. Now, one of the challenges with long, and I get no answer for the, no results for the first one. That's common for long connections. So we're looking at a 24 hour data set. This first IP address had connected for that full 24 hours. Well, DNS queries are done right before the connection starts, right? So that DNS query probably took place yesterday or the day before or the day before that. So I need to find out when did this connection actually start and then go look at the DNS log file for that day to maybe get this answer. We don't have that available to us here. We only have this one day to work with. So if I did this for beacons, I would for a beacon, I would expect to see an answer come back. The fact that I did this for a long connection that I saw was running for the full day, yeah, that doesn't overly surprise me. So the second IP address we wanted to look at was this 52.179.219.14. And we want to look for that in DNS.log. Oh, hey, look, the user, when they got when they got back that IP address was trying to get to array503.prod.do.mp.microsoft.com. The important portion here though is microsoft.com. So this looks like somebody trying to get to a Microsoft address. That's why this connection took place. Okay, we'll run that one down a little bit more in just a bit because this looks like it might be a potentially false positive. Actually, let's run it down now since we're in here anyway. So I'm gonna go in, I'm gonna copy that IP address, and this time I'm gonna go in and I'm gonna look for that IP address within my con.log file. Because I wanna see what type of connections were taking place. And I'm just gonna do head to show me the first, actually I only need to see like five lines. So what I'm doing is I'm grepping con.log to see what, so we see a DNS query, the user was trying to look up this name, but when they connected that IP, what service did they connect to? That might help me figure out what's going on here. So when I go in and I grep for that IP address, I can see my system was coming from an upper port number, <clears throat> excuse me, when it went to that uh, IP address, it went to port 443 TCP. That's the well-known port for HTTPS, right? Zeke said, I recognized an SSL handshake taking place over that connection. So this is SSL traffic. Great. That means I can go into SSL.log and maybe pull some helpful information out of that. So I'm going to go in, I'm going to look at SSL.log. 
We'll print out five lines. One of the things that comes back in my SSL.log file is, uh, let me find the start of it. Here's the CN. Here's who the digital certificate was issued to. Here's the organization behind them. So in other words, the user, the DNS query, was trying to get to the same thing that this digital certificate was issued to. If this digital certificate is valid, now we see a DNS query that points at Microsoft, a valid DNS uh, digital certificate associated with that system. We can be 99.5% certain this was a Windows system connecting back to a Microsoft system to check for patches, Windows notification, whatever the case may be, but there's a business need for this. So we can ignore these going forward. Um, newer versions of Zeek, you can actually turn on certificate validation. So you can go in and you can see, is this, if Zeek will tell you, is this certificate valid, yes or no? I have it off in these labs, just because I wanted to maintain the VM doesn't need access to the internet, and that VM would need to access the internet in order to check that uh, log file, excuse me, to check the validity of that digital cert. But here, you know, let's assume it does verify, that would tell us this one's okay. So that second IP address, so we have two IP addresses to investigate. This second one, the user queried a host within Microsoft. What came back was a digital certificate that's been issued to Microsoft. This one's probably okay. All right, this one's still open though, right? Because we looked in dns.log and we didn't find out anything about it. Is there anything else we can do? Yeah, one of the little tricks I like to play is I just go in and I say host and that IP address. So that's 167.71.97.235. And that's gonna do a reverse lookup on that IP address to see is there a host name associated with it. And when I do, I get back demo1.aahhosted.com. Now, that's who's associated with this IP address today. It doesn't necessarily mean that was who was associated with it at the time this data was created. So if this data was created five years ago, then eh, that may or may not be the same host associated with that same IP, especially in a cloud environment, right? But if this data was collected yesterday or an hour ago or something like that, and that's where the pointer's pointing, yeah, that's probably still the same host. So now I need to figure out who is aahhosted.com. Is that somebody that I would do business with, we might be doing business with? Well, one of the simplest ways I can go through and do that is to just go through, launch a web browser, and say, hey, who is that domain? Oh, hey, look, that's Active Countermeasures. All right, do we do business with Active Countermeasures? You know, maybe we've subscribed to a SaaS service with them and we feed them data to go through and look for C2 traffic. If so, there's a business need here. This one's okay. We can ignore this going forward. If we look at this and we say, I don't know who that is. <laughs> I don't know why we're doing this connection. What do we do? The first place I go, purchasing, right? If someone in the environment signed up for a service here, they probably got to pay for it. If they're paying for it, it's going through accounting or purchasing to uh, make sure that PO gets paid. So they should be able to tell me, are we paying active countermeasures? And if so, who internally authorized it? So let's say we come up with a PO that's getting paid to them and it's being paid out by the, someone on the IT team. Now we can go to the IT team and say, hey, so we're seeing this connection. And, you know, you authorized it. We just want to make sure this all looks legit. What's going on? Blah, blah, blah. Once we verify all that, bang, we're ready to go. The other thing you could do, and I gave you these links here to work with, is you can go out to a third-party site to see what does that site know about that IP address. And you'll get back some interesting information sometimes. So like Abuse IP comes back and tells us, oh, hey, that's Microsoft Corp. So now we go, it's, know it's going into Microsoft. Be careful with this. There was a time when you could say it's going back to Microsoft, it's okay. That stopped with Azure Cloud. And actually, specifically for me, it stopped about a year ago. 
It used to be, what was it, ASN 8075. Anything that was part of ASN 8075 was part of Microsoft's infrastructure and it's maintained by Microsoft and it's okay. And now 8075 extends into Azure and anyone can spin up a VM inside of that environment. I've seen pen testers do that. So now it looks like it's coming from a legitimate Microsoft site and it's not, it's coming out of the public cloud. So just because it's from Microsoft, don't blindly trust it. Do some level of verification. And remember what we did with this. We looked at what was the user trying to get to? Well, they were trying to get to something in Microsoft.com. Who's the digital certificate issue to? That system in Microsoft.com. Okay, that validates it. So just because Microsoft owns the address space, don't trust it anymore. Do some additional verification. Threat Crowd gives you some interesting information because it'll show you that IP address, what other uh, fully qualified domain names might be associated with it. And what's most important to me, a historical audit trail of what, um, excuse me, what is resolved to this IP address in the past. This slide was made a while ago, so you're gonna see different data in here. But what you'll see is if over a period of time, this has always been owned by Microsoft. And in this case here, it has. This was NSAC.net. Yeah, that's part of Microsoft. <laughs> that's part of their load balancing. So it's always been owned and controlled by Microsoft. So I'm going to feel that much more warmer and fuzzier that, yeah, this is probably a Microsoft system. If I came in and this was, you know, something.jp and then something.cn, and, you know, now it claims to be Microsoft.com, yeah, I'm going to be a little bit more fuzzy about that right? Because these large providers maintain these address bases for years and years and years. You shouldn't see the host name jumping around within different domains. So that's some helpful information that we can get around that. So we went through and we did this. We saw in con.log that this was SSL traffic. We went into the SSL.log file and we saw, yeah, it's using a digital certificate issued by Microsoft. And like we said, we could optionally choose to tell Zeek to validate these digital certificates. And now we would get a column that tells us, is this certificate valid, yes or no? And if we saw the certificate was valid, yeah, we know we're good to go from here. Notice it's a wild card. So anything within prod.do.dsp.mp.microsoft.com can validly use this. Ours was array.something, you know? Yeah, that's within that prod uh, subdomain. Uh, here, I just went in, there's also an X509 log. If we wanted more detailed information about that digital certificate, that gets stored within that X509.log file. Yeah, so we had two IP addresses. One went to ahhosted.com. Now we need to figure out maybe through purchasing if we have a business arrangement with them. The other one looked like it was Microsoft. So it looks like both of these are potentially false positives meaning that there's a business need behind both of them. So what we would want to do going forward is create an exception somehow. So maybe go in and filter out this data somehow so tomorrow when we go in and do our threat hunt, this data doesn't show up anymore. And that's an advanced class thing, how to go in and do that. So you know, we'll, if you come in for the advanced class, I'll talk you through how to create exceptions. All right, we're coming up on break time. So let me set this one up. And we can go through and we can kind of uh, cover this one when we come back. So we want to uh, actually, eh, you know what, I'm going to skip this one. So this one's hard. And quite honestly, it's not something you actually use in the field. Uh, in fact, I thought I had pulled this one out already and I just have not. So let me talk you through this one rather than have you do it as a lab. Because I'll be honest, this is not one that you'd actually do live. Because there's easier ways to go through and do this. So the, the, the next lab was kind of, the, this lab was kind of based around how do you find beacons on your network? And remember we said there's two ways to find them, based on session size or based on timing. And the timing one is hard because how do we figure out what's the delta time between each of the connections? We don't have a Zeek field for that. There's nothing stored in T-Shark for that. So how do we figure that out? And the answer is it's hard. <laughs> there's going to be a lot of manual work behind it. The other possibility is we could look at how much data gets sent each time the connection gets made. And if it's very consistent in the data size, that might be an indication of a beacon. Now, here's the problem. 
We've got 100,000 connections that took place yesterday. Just throwing out a round number. Let's say we had 100,000 connections. I need to do a pair analysis, source and destination I pay, to figure out if the data was sent consistently. Out of those 100,000 connections, which ones do I analyze? There's no accurate way to pick that. The only thing I can really do is say, well, if it connected more than 1,000 times in a day, I pull some magic number out of my butt, and I say, if it connected more than this times in a day, I'll go in and do my analysis. And that number is going to be a balancing act. The bigger I make the number, the fewer checks I need to do. The lower I make the number, the more checks I'm going to need to do, the longer it's going to take, the more false positives I'll run into. But the less likely I'm going to miss something. So this isn't necessarily the best way to go through and do this. I'm going to show you a reader does this for you and just makes it a whole lot simpler. But to kind of talk through what I did, I simply went into con.log and then I said, cut out the source IP address and the destination IP address, and then sort it, and then send it through Unique C. And what that does is that counts up how many times did this IP address talk to that IP address. And when I did that, I ended up with data kind of similar to this. So what this told me was my internal system talked to this IP address out on the internet 3,000 times over that 24-hour period of time. Okay, that's a lot. That's worth analyzing. My second one is multicast. I got multicast here. It isn't until I get down to here that I actually get a legitimate IP address again. But that was 297 times. Should I analyze that? 300 is kind of a lot, but it's not a lot, a lot, right? <laughs> Should I look at it? This, this is the problem with trying to do a session size analysis. I can't figure out if it's a beacon or not unless I take the time to do the analysis and figuring out where that threshold is, oh, that's hard. That is hard to go through and do. So then what I do is I said, okay, that first pair, that looked interesting. So let me go through and pull out original bytes. How many bytes of data did this system send to that host on, on the internet? And then let me go through and see how many times was that session size observed? And when I went through and ran that, I came up with all 3,011 sessions, sent 477 bytes of data each time. That sounds like a beacon. That sounds like persistency. Specifically, it sounds like a heartbeat going off, but there wasn't any actual data activation that took place. So this kind of leans me towards this maybe looking like a beacon. Now, here's my problem. If these 3,011 sessions all happened in a 10-minute period of time, and then never happen again for the rest of the day, it's not a beacon, I don't need to worry about it. But if those 3,011 sessions are evenly spread out over the course of a day, oh, that's a beacon, I need to worry about that. And we can't easily pull the timing data, that timing information out of Zeek or out of my PCAP. So this session analysis that I have in this lab, it's kind of interesting. It's not something you'd ever use real world. Real world, what you do is you'd let Rita do this work for you because it does a much better job and we're actually going to do a lab on that a little bit later. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to take a break. And when we come back, we found a suspicious pair of IP addresses communicating with each other. There's something about it that just didn't look quite right to us. And what we want to do is we want to go in and we want to analyze the payload. We want to see what payload information is going back and forth between those two systems. What can we use to go through and do that? This will be the lab when we come back. So we're two, three minutes after the top of the hour. So let's say, uh, you know, 12, 13 minutes after the top of the hour, we'll come back here and we'll pick up and keep going. So I'll catch folks then. Hey, so I'm going to come back just a little early because we get a bunch of questions. Uh, first, the <laughs> you need to whitelist all of uh, AWS. Oh, that's bad. That's bad. Um, <clears throat> another one to ask about. So I mentioned GCAT and how GCAT can use Gmail. Is the vendor whitelisting uh, Google Mail? If so, that's a problem. Because that means if somebody throws GCAT on your environment, they won't see it. What I've seen is a lot of threat hunting vendors will whitelist out all of the social media sites, even though they could easily be used as a command and control channel, because they don't know how to distinguish between legit traffic and non-legit traffic. 
that is a problem. And yeah, whitelisting out all of AWS, that is a really bad idea, as a number of folks have said. Uh, Cyber Poodle, Poodle was saying, large heavy used networks, is it necessary for threat hunters to rely on the storage analysis capabilities of systems like Splunk or, or Elastic to use some of these techniques? You may not have the data you need in one of those systems. It may require new processes. Now, if the Zeek logs are getting generated and they're getting stored into Splunk or Elastic, yeah, you could go through and you could do it that way. Now you're just talking database queries as opposed to the command line stuff, but the techniques ends up being exactly the same. So you could go through and you could work with it that way. Uh, if I have to leave early, will I still get the certificate for the class? Yeah, if you came in and attended, I don't think we look at you needed to be here the full time. I think so long as you were here for a decent period of time attending, the certs go through and get generated for you. And it is an attendance as opposed to a qualification, as that was clarified. Um, let's see. Yeah, and that's it. Chris? Yes. There's, there's one more question over on the GoToWebinar side. Uh, question for the teacher about the session size analysis for beacon behavior. Is it right to say that bytes send perspective can change depending on the size of the network? How is it possible to detect average about this value in the wild uh, for threat detection and use case? Oh, good question. Thank you, dude. So it's not that, so the network size isn't going to vary this, right? If we're talking about a real C2 session, it's about that calling home to the C2 server and saying, do you have anything for me to do? No, go back to sleep. That isn't going to change depending upon, you know, the size of the network that's been infected. That will always be consistent. What will change it is if it actually gets activated. So if I go in and I do a session size analysis, and let's say there is a thousand connections total, just to throw out a magic number, and I see 975 of them are all the same session size, that's most likely my heartbeat. If I start seeing 25 other sessions that are all different various sizes, those are indications of it being act of that C2 channel being activated. And whatever amount of data got moved is how much data got exfiltrated out of the environment. And as we said, by looking at that, I might be able to identify, were they just doing some local probing? Like, did they do a ping sweep of the environment? That isn't going to generate a whole lot of data. You know, or are they trying to actually move files off of the system? Like, if they go in and they grab all the .doc files, Right. We'll take a look at, hey, how many dot docs and Excels are on that uh, system? If there's 50 megs and you saw them move 50 megs, guess what? Yeah, they just got all of your doc files. So th that's one of the things we can glean with our uh, session size analysis. Um, like I said, that lab kind of walked through it from the perspective of figuring out if it's a beacon or not. Doing that at the command line is challenging. It's much easier to use a tool like Rita. Have Rita say, hey, I think that's a beacon. Have you run it down and say, I can't identify a business need for it. Now you go in and do your session size analysis to see if you have activation to worry about. So that's the best way to go in and kind of deal with something like that. All right. So this one is actually pretty easy, right? Because the concept was we found some suspicious activity. We want to analyze the payload. So we're going to use ngrep to go in and identify that. So really the only thing we need to figure out is how do we tell NGREP, show us the payload anytime these two IP addresses are talking to each other. And I mentioned you could use the host parameter for that. Remember the dash Q, because that'll go through and not print out those nasty pound symbols, and dash capital I tells it you want to go in and read a PCAP. So with NGREP, we need to read the PCAP file. We can't use Zeek logs for it. NGREP is designed to work with PCAPs only. But here's my command. Dash Q, don't print out those pound symbols. Dash capital I, read in this trace file. And I'm interested when the host is 192.168.99.51. Now, because I said host, this IP address could be the source or the destination. It can be in either spot, and that's OK. And I say and host this IP address here. Well, now I've defined these two IP addresses have to be source and destination, right? And they can be in either way. You know, one could be the source, the other could be the destination, but it has to be between those two IPs. 
and then I just pipe it through less. And by piping it through less, I'll get a full page worth of data. And then it'll pause and wait for me to hit the, <clears throat> excuse me, hit the space bar to see my next page worth of information after that. So here I ran the exact same command. The only difference was I popped it through head 20 instead. And the reason for that is I wanted to be able to show you the command as well as show you some of the output at the same time. When you use the less command, it takes away the command line prompt so you don't get to see what command was run when you're looking at the output. And I wanted you to be able to say both. So here, it's saying the input file is trace1.pcap. Yep, that's the one we wanted to analyze. And my filter is host this IP and that IP. Great, so now they can be either or and I'm gonna be in good shape. So the first match it pops up with is this one. So it sees my internalized system coming from an upper port number, going to port 80 at this IP address, it's a TCP packet, and this is a get request for a really long string of characters that end in .jdn. In other words, it doesn't end in like .html. It doesn't end, you know, end in a file name. It's ending at what looks like a directory specification. That's kind of odd. Some other things that are kind of odd about this, and I go into a lot more detail about this when we get into the advanced class, but things like notice the user agent string is identifying this as a Windows 7 system. Now, Windows 7 is kind of passed into life, right? So maybe I know this is a Windows 7 system, but if I know this is a Windows 10 system, but sometimes it's calling itself Windows 7, oh, that's a problem. I've got some application running on that system that's circumventing the user agent string. It's probably malicious. So this is an indication that, yes, yeah, something weird is going on. See this host parameter? This host parameter is identifying what fully qualified domain name were we trying to get to when we went to this IP address? In other words, a physical server can host multiple virtual web servers. So they all use the same IP, so that website needs some way to figure out which virtual server you're trying to get to. And the way it does that is using this host perimeter. So if it's trying to get to www.foo.com, it knows to send it to this virtual server. It's trying to get to www.boff.org, it sends it to a different virtual server. Well, here, the host parameter is an IP address. That should never happen. Your browser will, should never do that. So that's another thing that makes this kind of suspicious. So we're seeing some really suspicious act, you know, activity here that's indicative of maybe this isn't actually just a normal session. And I'm getting back a 200 OK, which tells me that the server was perfectly happy with all the data that was sent by the client, including this long string. It thinks all of this is OK. That's kind of odd to me because there's a lot here that looks really off. And the fact that the server is okay with it, yeah, that just makes it that much more suspicious to me. So what data are we sending? <clears throat> um, this was that long URI. Okay, now the question becomes, we know there was a bunch of connections. Is it the same thing all the time? Is it different strings each time? Which is it? How would we go through and work through that? Well, Zeek has all that information in the http.log file. So we can simply go through and parse that. So I'm going to say cat http.log, Zeek cut, pull out these specific strings, the source IP address and the destination IP address. That's going to allow me to focus in on just the sessions that I want to see. I don't want to see all HTTP traffic, just the HTTP traffic that was associated with these two particular systems. And then I'm saying, print out the URI. That's just gonna print out what was the URI that the user requested off of that server. I'm grepping for that external IP address. And then I'm saying, sort it and unique see it. What does that do for me? That's gonna show me how often am I seeing each unique string. Because think about the way a user normally browses a website. They'll click on different links and move around all the time, right? So they'll go in and they'll kind of navigate through the site to different places. So I would expect to see that type of activity, if this was normal for some reason, I would expect to see that type of activity taking place here. And then I'm just going through and sorting it to see how many times did I see each URI being requested. So when I ran this command, the one we just discussed, here's what came back. It's telling me that 3,011 times 
when that source IP address was talking to that destination IP address, that full URI was the only thing that was ever requested. That's kind of odd, right? Why would we ask for this long convoluted string 3,011 times? That just makes absolutely no sense at all. So based on that, this looks really suspicious to me. So what would I do? You know, do we hit the big red incident button yet? Yeah, I'd want to do a little bit more investigation work. Remember we said as threat hunters, the investigation work we do should not tip off the attackers that we're onto what's going on. So I don't want to go type anything on that desktop. What could I do? Well, one of the things I could do is look for unique patterns here. This long string looks like something encoded, maybe UU encoded or something like that. That's my actual command parameters that are going back and forth. This is, if this is actually C2, this would be my long hidden message. This directory specification though, that just because, yeah, just because it's short and it's a directory specification, that might help me figure out what malware this is. In other words, this malware may always use this directory specification when it calls home, and then this string is going to be unique to that specific compromised system. That's typically how these C2 channels work. So if I go off and Google this, that might give me some really helpful information. And if I do that, I come back with Fiesta EK malware. Oh, that's a known pattern for malware, okay. Yeah, now it's time to hit the big red incident button. And when we get everybody together, we tell them, okay, this internal system is sending out a request over and over again that's indicative of the command and control channel that is associated with this specific string of malware. What do we wanna do? First thing I would do is go back into my logs and say, who else is talking to this IP address, anybody? If so, we need to pull them in as part of scope. If not, great, we can focus in on this one system and that's it. The fact that this string never changes, that tells me this command and control channel was not activated during this 24 hour period of time. The amount of data transfer didn't change over this 24 hour period of time. So at least it, let's say this just started. We now know that system got infected. It's calling home to its C2 server, but the attacker hasn't actually activated it yet get them off the system, and we're gonna be able to clean up before any damage is actually done. Cool. All right, got another lab for you to do. So now we wanna move into the lab two directory. So we've been working in lab one, right? So now I'm just gonna say cd space dot dot forward slash lab two. So just go ahead and type that in, and when you do, you'll end up in the lab two directory. You can see that specification right here. If I ls to list out all the files that are in there, I've got uh, Zeek logs. I don't have a PCAP this time. So for this particular uh, lab, we're not actually gonna have to work with a trace file. Everything is just gonna be with the Zeek logs. And you can see we don't have a whole lot of Zeek logs here. We have conlog, which records everything. We have dns.log. We have packet underscore filter dot log. What's that? If we had set up a BP filter to ignore certain traffic patterns in Zeek, that would be listed here. That way we'd know what type of traffic we'd ignore. Weird dot log is where Zeek puts things that it just doesn't know what else to do with it. So it'll throw it in there. So it looks like we're looking at predominantly DNS traffic as part of this trace. So here's a lab. I'm gonna give you a couple of minutes to work through this one. I want you to identify is there any potential command and control taking place in this log file? And suspect, meaning it's potential command and control, we're gonna use a threshold of a thousand. So we'll say, if we're performing more than a thousand unique queries for different host names within a remote domain, that's a potential command and control server. So you need to figure out how many queries were performed, how many unique systems were queried within each domain. We did cover this. If you flip back in the slides, you might even find a command you can just copy paste. I'm gonna give you some time to go through this one and then we'll cover it. Okay, hey, so uh, we had some questions around like, why did I tag that string? Let me back this up just a little bit. We'll hit this again real quick. 
I focused in on JDEN at the end. What made that interesting versus the long string? Well, the long string is definitely interesting, right? Don't, don't get me wrong. The fact that it's uh, requesting this long string of characters, that's the first thing that definitely makes it interesting to me. But the, the other part of it that makes it interesting is we're not actually requesting a specific file. It's implying that this is a directory name. This long string is actually some directory name that's under the rmvk30g directory, that this is another subdirectory underneath it, and we're accessing the index.html file in that directory. Let me ask you this. Would you name your directory that? <laughs> Probably not, right? That directory name makes absolutely no sense at all. So it isn't that this specifically is weird. It's the fact that it doesn't end in a file extension, which implies this is a directory. And it implies that this is the long directory name that that directory was named. And that's the part that makes no sense at all. So hopefully that kind of clarifies it for you. All right, let me give you a little more time to walk through this one, this lab. So I'm going to hit this one before anybody gets too frustrated <laughs> because this is one of those ones that um, I think I mentioned this earlier that you would never do it this way live. Um, but I kind of wanted you to see like what kind of a problem we're running into. So let's take a look at, um, actually I get a better idea. Let's say uh, cat dns.log. And then we're going to pipe that through Zeek cut. And we're going to look at the query field. So I'm telling Zeek cut extract out what was the user trying to get to. And when I do that, I see this. Now, this doesn't have a lot of non malicious data in it. So you can very quickly visually spot we got a pattern here, right? We've got this really long string with an honest I'm not evil that we're, we're going after. And this looks odd, right? You know, the, there were some questions about the last one. Why did that long string look odd? Well, because the implication was it was a directory name. And who would name their directory that, right? The implication here is this is a host name with an honest I'm not evil dot com. We don't, we don't use characters like that, right? That's hexadecimal. You wouldn't use hexadecimal to name your systems. You give it a descriptive name, right? Portal, www, mail, something along those lines, something that makes sense as a reference, right? The fact that this is a hexadecimal string, yeah, it makes it look odd. And I can visually see that just because there's so many of them. Now the question becomes, I wanna see how many unique queries did I make within that domain. In other words, how many times, you know, if I queried this fully qualified domain name 10 times, I don't care. All I really care about is I queried it once and that is different versus this query. So how many unique queries did I make? And you can see trying to hack up this data is kind of hard, right? Because like once I go through and pull that information out, you know, what do I do with it? Well, I could sort it, right? But no, okay, I can see these are not ones I need to worry about, right? I've got three requests. Uh, looks like for the same fully qualified domain name within ne.jp. Probably not a big deal. It's just three in the course of a day. But I can see I got a ton of the honest I'm not evil ones here, right? How many are actually here? How do I figure that out? That's not easy. The command I used, and it's in the book, um, and I'm actually going to copy and paste it just because it's so long, is this. So I'm catting the dns.log file. I'm cutting out this query field, just like we did here. And then I'm sorting it, just like we did here. So anytime the same query was done more than once, there'll be one line after the other. And then I ran it through unique. Notice I didn't run it through unique C. I didn't count it. I just said, I don't care if a unique query was done 10 times or once. I only want to record that as one entry because I want to count the number of unique queries, not the total number of queries. 
And then I reversed the characters on the line so that everything would be typed backwards. I showed you the slide for that earlier. And then I used cut to say, make the period a column delimiter and then pull out fields one and two, which would be calm backwards and honest, I'm not evil backwards. And then reverse it back to be readable and then sort it and now count it. And when I run that whole command, I end up with something like this. So I can see 2000 entries, 2074 to be specific. I have once, notice it was three queries for the same fully qualified domain name. So that only counts as one unique resource queried within that domain. And then I did one reverse lookup on an IP address, and then I had one of my DNS queries failed. So we don't even know what they were trying to look for there. But this is the one that I care about. That's a pain. To go through all of this, that's a pain. And oh, by the way, it's error prone. What if this had been honestimnotevil.com.uk? Well, this wouldn't work very well in that type of a situation, right? So we're actually gonna use Rita to go in and do this for you. So the reason I kind of cut this lab a little short is because I gave you this just so you could see what it takes to do it manually, but see how frustrating it is and how error prone it is. So if you try to do this yourself and try to do it on the command line, it's going to be problematic. You're better off using a tool like Rita to go through and do that for you. And I should have given you all of the, yep, I gave you a description of like all the tools I used and what they do. And then I gave you the command and then I showed you the results. And like I said, there's an earlier slide that breaks down each part of this command so you can see what is happening and where. But yeah, 2000 unique queries within a domain I don't recognize, that really looks like it's being used as a command and control channel. So what, whatever system is querying for honestimnotevil.com, that's the one that I need to go pay attention to. So these queries are probably coming from my internal resolver. I now need to go to my internal resolver and say, which internal desktop system is sending you these queries? That desktop system is the one that I need to run down. Um, yeah, let me kind of just walk you through this one as well. So, th so there's a misconception that if C2 is being used for, uh, or C2 is being run over DNS, that it must be text records. And the way I see some vendors deal with this is they try and catch C2 over DNS by looking for an excessive number of text queries, whatever that magic number happens to be for them. And if they see it, they'll generate an alert for you. And again, the implication is, well, if C2 is running over DNS, it must be doing text record queries. So what I kind of walk you through here is, let's go look at what query type is being used by honestimnotevil.com to see, is that a true statement? Are they all text queries? Well, how do we extract that information? Well, there's a column, qtype underscore name within the dns.log file that will tell you what type of query was this. Was it a text query? Was it a name server query? Was it an A record query, a quad A query? What type of record was it? And this command goes through and extracts that. So we're pulling out the query name and the query itself. And the, the reason we're going after the query itself is we only want the honest I'm not evil results. So this grep command, actually, let me kind of walk you through this one. Let's go through this one one at a time because this one can be a little bit complex. So um, let's see. So we're starting with cat dns.log. Because we're looking for DNS queries, it's going to be in dns.log. And then we're going to use zcut to go through and pull out qtype underscore name and then query. Okay, what is that? Well, I have to spell it right. <laughs> so what does that give me? Well, if I hit enter on that, I can see my query type showing up here, text mx, there's a c name, mx, mx, followed by the actual query that was being done. Cool. So the next part of the command was grep honest I'm not evil. In other words, I've got other queries in here that kind of scrolled up off the top of the screen. 
I don't want to see those. I only want to see the honest I'm not evil. And I clearly spelled something wrong. Oh, evil, not evil, evil. There we go. So now I'm just getting the honest I'm not evil queries. Then what I'm going to do is I'm going to go in and I'm going to say, now that I have only the honest I'm not evil queries, I'm going to go in and I'm going to say, cut out that first field. What's that going to do? Well, that's just going to print out the query type. It's going to get rid of that pattern I used to make sure I only got honest I'm not evil before, because this is the only stuff that I care about. Now that I have that, I say unique dash C. I want to go through and, uh, well, actually, I got to sort it. I got to sort it first. Actually, there's been enough questions about that, but let's let's do this. So let's say, let me do it wrong. So I'm going to say unique C, and then I'm going to say sort. I'm going to purposely do those out of order. What happens? Notice what happens here. Unique is going to go look at line by line, and when it sees a match, it's going to add those up. Well, I don't want to see 5MX, 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 and add those all up. I want to go through and have it just print one line, and that's it. So when I do this backwards, when it gets to unique C, unique C can only count up the number of instances that show up line by line. And actually, if I do this, that might make it a little easier to see. So notice unique C saw two MX records in a row. So it added those up. Then it saw it changed to C name. So then it said, okay, let me add that. Oh, wait, it changed to text now. So I, I don't get an actual summary. So if I first sort it, we get this, and now if I unique C it, because all of my similar query types are one line after another, now it'll go through and give me the actual list. And if I want to kind of put that in some sort of an order, I can further sort that and say RN, reverse sort, highest to lowest. But the goal was to figure out, is the, is D, the C2 over DNS only using text queries? And as you can see, no, it's pretty equally using MX text and C name. I tried to get them all exactly the same by tweaking the software. I came close, it's a little bit off, but you get the idea. If the only thing, I could have just as easily have done everything over MX or everything over C name. So if your threat hunting software thinks that any C2 over DNS will only use text record queries, it's wrong and it's gonna miss stuff like this. That was really the big point on this one. Okay. So we've looked at some of these labs you went through and you did yourself. And some of them I kind of said, hey, let me kind of jump in and give you a hand with it just because it's really hard. So you can see doing a lot of this stuff on the command line, it kind of helps you understand how it should work. But some of it's kind of hard to do. So here's what I want you to do now. I want you to do the same evaluations. So I want you to look for long connections with lab one and C2 over DNS with lab two. But I want you to use Rita. Now let me show you a couple of commands before I get you started. So if I type in Rita with no other switches and just hit enter, it gives me a list of all the command line switches that are supported with it. If I say Rita space list, it'll tell me about all the different databases that it knows about. So let's say I wanted to look for beacons with lab two. I'm gonna pick one that I know there isn't any data flaw just so I don't throw beat up the labs on you. I would say, Rita, show beacons, lab two. No results found. That's how I'd go through and do my analysis. So I want you to repeat what you just did. So let me give you one, just to make life a little bit easier for you. So lab one, we had long connections and we had beacons to analyze. So I could say, Rita, show long connections. That's one of my commands. Notice the show open connections. Remember I mentioned that earlier. Normally, Zeek doesn't write out a log entry until the connection closes. This is how you see what's still actually open and running on your network. So that's another one I could go in and play with. But the one I'm going to play with just for an example to show you here is lab one, is show beacons. So when I run that, I get this data output. Notice, so before we would, remember we were talking about beacons, they're hard to tag. 
because I got to add up the number of connections that took place. And then I got to look for consistency of the session size. And it was a lot of work, right? It was a lot of work to get it done. Here's how it works with Rita. With Rita, I just said, hey, show me any beacons you found. That's all I did for lab one. And it popped up with two lines right off the top that look interesting. This first one, 104, 248, 234, 238, this is the one we found before, right? Because there was 3,000 connections. And remember I said the rest of them are only 300 in a day. Maybe they're a beacon, maybe not. Look at the second line entry. Rita tagged one of those and said, hey, this one here with only 72 connections, we're 83.5% certain this connection persistency here. In other words, we're seeing kind of an equal spread between the delta. We're seeing a pattern with the session size being transferred. That's persistency you may want to investigate as well. So we went through it manually. It was hard. And we still didn't find this, everything we wanted to look for. We only found one of the two. With Rita, Rita, show me beacons. Dang, done. So let me give you a little bit of time to play with Rita. So some other commands to play with. Rita, show long connections, lab one. Read a show exploded DNS, lab two. Go in and play around with some of that stuff. I'm going to give you a little bit of time, and then we'll go through and we'll cover it. Hey, so there's a question in Discord that uh, let me just kind of cover this with everybody. Do you first have to install, do you have to install Reader first? So in your environment, yes, you would. For the purposes of this lab, I've already installed Rita for you. I've already imported the data sets. I didn't want to like add that overhead to doing these labs. I wanted to focus more on the analysis side. So for the purposes of the lab, no, you don't need to install Rita. You don't need to do any of that stuff. It'll be there for you. So you should be able to just go in and type Rita and see that. See a list of everything that's there. Uh, one of the things that's kind of funny is that if you pipe it through less so you can see everything, Rita, looking for evil needles in big haystacks. <laughs> yeah, that's what it's designed for. This is designed to help you identify command and control. So remember we talked about our four steps. Identify connection persistency. Identify abnormal protocol activity. Analyze that external host and see if there's a business need for talking to it. And then analyze the internal system. Those were our four steps. Rita is designed to handle the first step for you. So there's some questions around like configuration and all of this. So typically what you'd want to do is you'd want to have Zeek out by your perimeter. So let's say monitoring the internal interface of your firewall and have it collect log entries all day long. And then Rita once an hour is going to grab those Zeek logs, pull it in, and then go in to look to see, is this something I need to worry about? You could do it once per hour. You could do it once per day. You know, you need to script it. So it ends up being set up any way that you want it to. But if I know I'm going to be doing, let's say I know every day when I come in, I want to do a threat hunt. Well, I could have this set up so that reader at two o'clock in the morning goes off and grabs all of the Zeek logs from midnight to midnight UTC the previous day, and then goes in and parses those. So when I come in in the morning, the first thing I need to do as part of my threat hunt is just go in and run reader commands. In fact, I could script that. So when I come in, I don't even have to run the Rita commands. That was already done for, with my script for me. I just need to go in and review the results. So for example, so let's say we want to look for long connections. We want to look for beacons. And we want to look for C2 over DNS. Those are the three that we're typically going to want to go looking for. And I want to do it with the data set that's located in lab one. Let me show you how easy this is. So I'm going to say, Rita, show long connections, lab one, pump that through head. Here's my top 10. Here's my longest connections taking place here. So I have one here that I really need to go in and pay attention to. The rest of them are smaller. So that's how easy it was to go in and find all my log connections. Now let's say I want to go in and look for beacons. Rita, show beacons with lab one and then pump that through head. And then here are my top beacons. And we said that these first two, those would be the two that are persistent. Those are worth going in and paying attention to. Rita, show exploded DNS for lab one. 
pump that through head. Okay, that's telling me the domain I sent the most unique queries to was Microsoft.com, it was 24. Okay, would that take me 20 seconds, <laughs> 30 seconds because I was talking? To look for beacons, long connections, and C2 over DNS, all, all for a day's worth of data. It read is that easy to go through and use. The only downside to it is it's command line based. You get a script it. There's some work that needs to be done around this. So if you have free time, this is a great tool to use. Um, shameless plug alert. If you have a little bit of money and you have more money than time, one of the things you can do is you can run AC Hunter, which is our commercial tool. So here's an example of what that looks like here. So one of the nice things about AC Hunter is that, remember I talked about that scoring system, AC Hunter has that built into it. So let's say we've never looked at this environment before, right? Customer calls us up, says, hey, I need you to, to do a threat assessment on my environment. Okay, which systems do you focus on first? Use the scores. The scores will tell you which ones are the ones that are most likely to be compromised. Those are the ones you're gonna to wanna to go in and focus in on first. Over on the right, it tells you where is that score coming from. So this first one got 98 points, 93.5 of that was because it's we saw some beacon-like behavior that you may wanna go in and pay attention to. We also saw uh, some instances of unexpected protocol on a well-known port, but not enough to make it worth generating a score for. And we also saw an invalid certificate being used as part of that session. So that may be something that's worth going in and taking a look at. Um, anytime I want to drill down on this data. So for example, this system scored a 94, and we're saying it's mostly because it looks like it has a beacon taking place. I can click on that, and here's all that graph information that we were talking about before. So I can go in and I can see some really useful stuff like what was the user trying to get to when they went to this IP address? Well, there's no DNS query listed here, which means no DNS query was performed prior to this connection, which means this user connected to that IP address directly. That's kind of odd, right? IT people do it sometimes, security people, but that's not a common activity. Usually we're always using a fully qualified domain name. So that makes it a little bit suspicious. If I want to learn more about this IP address, I could click on it and just drop in the drop down menu, just go in and say, hey, threat crowd, tell me what you know about this IP. And now I can easily go off and do additional research. These menus are editable, so I can add things in here if I want to. So for example, my internal IP address, I could go in and add my SIM. So if I'm using Splunk, I could add Splunk to this, and now I could quickly jump into Splunk to look at the log entries that are associated with this host. If you set up Beaker, we've got a little Beaker icon here, and we'll automatically create that link for you. So I could go in and say, gee, this looks really suspicious. Hey, Beaker, show me what's here. And with Beaker, it'll go in, and it'll automatically load up, okay, when this source IP address is talking to that destination IP address over this time frame, what application was doing that? And you can see here, oh yeah, it's no pet. Oh, wait. No pet should be making network connections. This is a problem. And like I talked about, from a finding hidden process perspective, let's say we jumped in and we saw nothing. I could come up here, remove the and statement, and just say, hey, show me everything this IP address talked to yesterday. So let's say I was investigating a persistent connection and I jumped in and Beaker told me I didn't see any application making that connection. I'd go in and do this. If I still see nothing, I know Sysmon isn't running on that box. If I now see something like this, now I got to ask myself, why am I seeing all of this network traffic, but I didn't see that persistent connection I was worried about? And the answer is that persistent connection is being maintained by a hidden process. This box is definitely compromised. We're going to have a really bad day. Um, let's see. Yeah, so long connections are in here. Uh, one of the, uh, well, when there's data, uh, one of the things we keep track of with long connections is the state of the connection. So for example, if something is still open, remember I talked about how um, Zeek doesn't do a very good job of recording things until the connection actually closes. Well, anything that's still in an open state, we'll list it as being in an open state here for you. So you get to see, yeah, that connection's there and it's still running. It's just going to get longer over time. Um, so Certificate check. So about a year and a half ago, we had some customers come to us and say, hey, 
So you know it would be cool if we could go in and validate the digital certificates that everybody's using because we have a hypothesis. Our hypothesis is that attackers aren't going to use like an EV cert for their um, command and control servers. They're going to use a free cert or a self-signed cert or something like that. So if we just track those, that'll help us find C2. So we said, great. So we went in, we added that feature in, and then we let it run for a couple of months. We went back to those customers and said, hey, how's it going? And they're like, eh, not so good. We use a lot more self-signed certificates than we thought we did. And now we're constantly having to update the data store to validate those certificates so that we don't flag them unnecessarily, and that's added maintenance. And you know what? We, that hasn't helped us find any C2 that we wouldn't have found through some other means. So we said, great, let's throw away that feature. So one of the things that's kind of unique about us is we'll actually throw features away if they're not working for folks. So this is the version of AC Hunter that's about to be released. You get a new early look at this. Notice that the digital certificate option is gone and it's been replaced by with one called Cyber Deception. What's this? This one's cool because one of our mantras is we want to detect compromises but do it in a way of minimal interference. Do it in a way that doesn't generate unnecessary alerts all the time. Like, you know, if you go in and you try and detect lateral movement, you're probably going to get a ton of false positives before you actually get a hit. It's kind of like if you go in and you say, oh, hey, I'm going to get an alert anytime someone tries to go in and run PowerShell. Well, the IT people might use PowerShell to update things on each, each person's desktop. So anytime that ends up in a login script, bang, all these alerts go off for absolutely no reason. And we don't want to do that. We don't want to generate false positives on them. So this is one of our ways to kind of get around that. And that to me, this is just really awesome. So with the cyber deception uh, option, you can go in and you can say, hey, I want to create an administrative user that no one will actually use. And we'll go in, we'll create a log, and we'll create a script for you that you can then go run on your domain controller that will um, create an administrative user that has a randomized 32 character password that'll never get cracked. We'll then further go in up and set, uh, set up alerting so that if anybody ever touches that account, if anybody tries to log in, we generate an alert off of that. So now you get an alert through AC Hunter that says, hey, this internal IP address is trying to log in as that administrative user that you said no one should ever use that account. So I've assigned 100 points to the threat of that system. Yeah, right? If no one should be logging in and someone's trying to log in, that's a problem. The other thing you can do is you can do things like create monitor, uh, files to monitor. So for example, you could create a net login script and then uh, or create a login script, uh, store that on your net login share, and then simply don't add it to anybody's profile. Well, if it's not in anybody's profile, no one should ever look at that file. Right, because when I log in, I run whatever login scripts are in my login profile. So it goes in and it reads those files. Well, if this file isn't part of anybody's profile, no one should read it. If someone does, they're probably probing around your network. Back when I used to do pen testing, that was one of my first things, right? If I could breach a system and I want to get a lay of the land, a very quick way to get a lay of the land, look at the login scripts. And where is it mapping resources to? Those are the next systems to go after after that. So this will go in, create a file that no one should ever touch, and give you an alert anytime that file is read and tell you who did it. Nice, easy way to go in and figure out if you've been compromised without generating a high false positive rate. So these are features that are coming out in the new version. I mentioned this a little bit earlier, and it was talked about a bit in the channel. Um, we're a little different from most environments in that we don't do upselling. There's no, hey, buy the base product, and now we're going to charge you a ton of money for all the features that you want to add in. That price is a site license, meaning you can do anything you want with it. We have law enforcement. We have military organizations that run it on their network and hand a copy out to each member of their blue team to be able to go out and evaluate sites when they need to, and it's all covered under the license. The only thing you can't do is give it away free to friends. Please don't do that to us. We would appreciate it. And you can't use it to sell a threat hunting service to somebody, some third party. Um, for that, you need to go through a partner program and we want to give you training for that. It is 9K the first year, 4K a year after that for updated service and support. 
Um, you can buy in bulk and get it cheaper. We have hosted solutions. Yeah, there's a bunch of different options there. So as far as like, if you have a lot of free time, but you don't have any budget, read is the way to go because you can go in and you can script a lot of this stuff to automatically generate these reports to identify connection persistency for you every morning. But if you're in a situation where, you know, you have a sock and you have, you know, <laughs> so your, your, your typical sock, if you look at the demographics, it tends to be there's one really smart person, there's one or two medium level skill people, and then there's a ton of junior analysts because they're all college students trying to earn credit, right? So how do you get a college student to be a decent threat hunter? That's what we've actually focused on with AC Hunter because it does it all based on score. So it'll kick off a sys, sys log message that'll go off to a central console within the SOC that says, hey, 192.168.50, its score used to be 40. This hour, that score has increased to 95. That might be something you want to pay attention to. Yeah, okay, that makes it pretty easy for a junior analyst to figure out they need to go in and take a look at that. And then it's just point and click to an interface to figure out, okay, what's changed? Why is this something worth paying attention to? And they can run first line of defense to decide, does the senior person need to get involved? Is there a business need or not? It's really easy to write a run book around that. We actually try and engage the tool for help desk people as opposed to actually security people, just to kind of simplify that. But yeah, Rita makes this a whole lot easier. So I talked it through AC Hunter, so one of the questions I always get is, hey, so this was fun. I want to keep learning. What do I do? Two things. Number one, you got to take home lab. Don't do this right away. There's a lab three directory we haven't even talked about yet. Wait about a week and then go do a hunt on the lab three directory. Why wait a week? Because some of, I've been talking at you for six hours. Some of that information is going to stick and some of it's not. And you want to figure out what information didn't stick so you can go back and relearn it, right? Well, if you go to do another hunt a week from now, you'll very quickly remember or figure out what stuck and what didn't. And for the stuff that didn't stick, great, go back through the content. For the stuff that did stick, great, you don't need to worry about that. Go at it from there. But this will give you a way to kind of reinforce what's there. And the answers and everything else will show up after the wrap-up slide. In other words, there's a wrap-up slide that I will stop on for the, at the end of this class. After that is where I go through and do, give you lab three, including all of the answers. Now, let's say you go through lab three and you decide, um, gee, I still want to learn more. You know, I still want to figure, I still want to continue my education and get become better at being a threat hunter. One of the things we do, if you go under education, go to blog, we do this thing called malware of the day. Here's what you do. Go to the, you can sign up to the mailing list so that you always get updated when a new blog comes out. And anytime you see it's a malware of the day, skip to the bottom real quick. Don't read it. <laughs> skip to the bottom because at the bottom is going to be a PCAP file. Jump to the bottom, download this PCAP file, now do your threat hunt. Can you find the C2? Can you figure out what's going on? You know, either, you know, jot down some notes or do something to try and identify as much about this as you can. And then once you think you got it, now roll back up to the top and read through it. And this will go through and explain everything you should have been able to see. And if you got everything, great. If you miss something, what did you miss? And what do you need to add to the process? For example, one of the common things I see people miss is they forget to check the MIME types on connections. So you may have an internal system that's connecting to a JPEG file, but the MIME type that the server is advertising for JPEG is text. Well, wait a minute, a JPEG should be an image, right? If it's advertising a MIME type of text, that means that system is actually processing that as a text file that might be a stealthy way to hide command and control, and it's used by a number of different tools. So when you read through this, that may identify for you, yeah, hey, this JPEG is being identified as a MIME type of text. Oh, hey, I missed that. Great, now go modify your process. 
you know once you think you got it right awesome now go to your next malware of the day and give that one a shot so this is a good way to go through and kind of keep yourself up to date uh, there's also i do an advanced class so if you want to take this to the next level you can jump through that next class for that is in march and if a lot of this felt like it was too high level and you want to kind of back up a little bit and build a better foundation for this threat hunting house I do a pack, uh, getting started with packet decoding class, and that one is a pay what you want. So you can pay a small amount of money. That one is uh, a 16 hour class you can go through over a course of four days. So over four days, we do four hours each day. That also makes it a little bit easier to consume. And with that said, here's my email address. I, and I'm serious, that is my actual email address. If you get out of this and you have questions, drop me a line. That's what I'm here for. You know, we've talked in the in the uh, channel a lot about, you know, we're here to support each other and we mean it. So, you know, if you go through this and you're running into challenges, feel free to go through and drop me a line. The Discord channel usually tends to stay active for at least the next couple of hours. So if you have any questions, just go ahead and toss them in there. But if like a week from now, there's something weird with your thread hunt that you got a question about, just drop me a note. And with that said, uh, Shelby et al., do we have anything else we want to toss out to folks? Can't hear you, Shelby. Shelby, you're, we're still not hearing you. <laughs> yeah, hang on a second. I will let Shelby know we can't hear her. Okay. Yeah. Just and whatever you throw at her, make sure it's not too heavy. And I don't actually have anything to add. I just turned my camera on for some random reason. Yeah, just to say bye and thanks everybody. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yes. Thank you everybody for joining us and uh well, I, I can say hopefully you got a lot out of it, but I can tell everybody did. So, um, can you and hear I don't me know now? how many times I've heard this hey, myself, and I still hear you. Hey, Sorry, awesome. You know? Yeah, I just wanted to bring up. Uh, Chris had mentioned the Malware of the Day series um, that's run by Keith and Hannah on our team. We're actually going to be doing a one-hour webcast about the Malware of the Day stuff. Um, so that'll be the first week of March. If you want to make sure you attend that, like Chris said, make sure you're signed up for our uh, mailing list. You can find the link on our website and we'll go ahead and share in Discord. Um, he also mentioned AC Hunter a few times. And um, if you are interested in AC Hunter and want to be able to play around with it a little bit more, we have a CTF on our website um, so you can get a chance to play with the tool directly. Also, if you're interested in AC Hunter, you can comment demo into the GoToWebinar chat and Casey will reach out to you to schedule a personal demo with Chris. Um, again, I just wanna mention that this class was recorded. So if you didn't catch the full six hours, that is okay. You'll receive an email tomorrow containing three things. One, the raw recording of this class. Two, your certificate of attendance from the training. And three, a short feedback form that we would really appreciate you guys filling out. Um, also, the recording will be posted on the same page where you got all of the lab download information. And please, and with, please remember the certificate comes out 24 hours from now. Not yes. 24 hours from the start of class, it's 24 hours from now. Yes, yeah, so and you'll sorry, you'll get it about the point of that, but we do get literally dozens of people. Hey, where's my cert? Hey, where's my cert? Hey, where's my cert? And now you know Shelby's gonna like talk to folks about that. So. Oh yeah. Yep. So expected at about 5:15 Eastern time tomorrow. And with that, I hope you all have a great rest of your day, and hopefully we'll see you in the next webcast. Awesome. Thank you, yep. Chris. Thank, Thank you, everybody. Everything. Thanks so much. Careful to hit people. Ha, 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 ha.